Block 6 Out of the refracting light of that bright day, two figures revealed themselves as they stood side by side with the shareholder, to the surprise of most folks from the Adventurers Guild. One of the new arrivals, a golden braided elven maiden with Earth Island Ranger garbs was instantly recognized as none other than the officially declared diseased elven princess Aliathra of the House of Lutha. The second figure was a pale-skinned young woman with an ebony mane, cabalistic tattoos and a dress as aphotic as night. Bravo Lieutenant Your plan of distracting that brat so that the squad, the centaurs and that goblin shaman could rescue the hostages worked. Agent Dessart radioed. That was pathetic. For someone who claims to be Gwen India, you are absolute atrocious of trying to become a nemesis of anyone by the way you wield your magics. I could beat you with my hands tied behind my back. Iris scoffed over Faithlen's broken body. His magical prowess if that can even be said was absolutely repugnant. His skills make first year students back at the Pavia look already like masters already. I find this child wanting in so many aspects that if I still had my old eyes, I would cry. Aliathra dismissively snickered with the infamous Selvan superiority. Do they just let anyone become knights now in the Empire? Even children? The title of Marchog must be very cheap now these days that even common rubbish join their ranks. Iris giggled. Hey. I couldn't beat him without the two of your mentorship. Thanks Ailey. Thanks Cyrus. Samantha thanked them. Princess Aliathra, the fallen princess of Ethylon. Fawn asked with a scoffing tone. Was this some sort of obscene means to mock them for their shortcomings or something much more sinister was being in play before them? It all makes sense now. The reason why you fight against us from the beginning chosen one. Mita yells out. It is because of that lowly vampire and the now demonic princess Aliathra have enthralled you to their bidding. Mita figures everything out. That means that the rebels too are under the banner of the demonic invasion too. The gall of these other worlders fawn fumed. They wish to destroy everything that makes dwarven society great. Findrim cursed. I am not a lowly vampire. I am a Kadahagan just to let you know. Iris scolds. Chosen one. You are being deceived. That woman is a disgusting vampire and that elf is an evil demon bent on taking over all of the realms. The old knight called out. No wonder, you are so powerful chosen one. Trained by vampiric and delve noble bloodline to the very epitome of your arcane might. Yet you use your gift against your own people against your fellow heroes, against all of Gleesia, may Nenith banish you from her garden forever along with all wicked such a fill for turning shareholder away from us. He exclaimed his condemnation towards the three women. I do not sense any demonic corruption within the chosen one Marchog Fawn, she must be only enthralled by those two demons. It may not be too late to save the chosen one. Petra advocates, then we are left with no other choice. Marchog Fawn unsheathed his sword. Knights, kill those demons and rescue the shareholder. The rest of the army hold back. Let my men deal with her, he ordered. The knights drew their weapons at the three girls as they charged straight towards Samantha and her friends. I am starting to get real sick of this BS. Samantha groaned over more demonic accusations being sent her way. They will try to surround us. Be careful, Aliathra warned. Remembering her training. Samantha recalled of the Imperial Army's doctrine when it comes to defeating battle mages. They would first close the distance via deceitful methods upon making their approach when in range, in order to overwhelm a battle mage's defenses. The soldiers would spread out their forces so that they can mitigate any large handed spells by the battle mage before peppering the mage at all sides with a mix of arrow bold fire and magical spells while under the screen of a specialized shield made of gyronite that resists magical spells once surrounded at all sides in a circle shaped formation fondly called the null circle formation named after the soldiers will have to properly wrangle the mage within the circle kiting the individual and cutting off any avenues of escape the next step is to throw in special anti-mage tools or use rare anti-magic spells to subdue the mage for capture or to be killed. 
the Eth Island Elves and the Spla Aegean Empires have specialized units dedicated to such a task and members of the latter were within Faithland's crusade, most of whom were performing peacekeeping duties back near camp to make up the losses inflicted by the rebels' chaos rousing. The Chosen One's entourage included seventy so combined men of knights and mages familiar with such a tactic. The rest of the army sat back by the main battle lines to witness the attack unfold as they were ordered to maintain discipline of their battle lines less. They risk themselves being fired upon in the range of Nurnkaram's defenses. As expected, the knights led by Marchog Fawn circled around their wings under the cover of their shields whilst men armed with magically enchanted weapons and spells ready to taste blood. Hit the dirt, Samantha raised her arms up before she slammed her them down to the ground. Earth in Wall is the saying goes in the spell books that Samantha casted, is an alteration spell that manipulates the ground to form said titular wall. A spell taught by Iris when she wanted to manipulate the landscape of her garden but if pushed to its logical extreme, the spell can be used to create a warrantable barrier in any formation the spellcaster willfully desires. The spell lasts a brief period of time however unless channeled continuously to maintain the fissure. For this spell, Samantha created an even smaller spheroid-shaped wall compared to the Imperials blocking off direct line of sight and line of fire for the elite knights. The wall won't last long. Aliathra reminded Samantha of magic's limits. Wait for it. Wait for it. Samantha perspired. Believing that Samantha knows what she is doing now that their plan has exited the predictable parts of the sequence, Aliathra and Iris braced down as the lieutenant bestirred her mana energies. Meanwhile, several of the hostile Imperial Knights began to scale the earthen wall she had made earlier. It was just as the doctrine of the Null Circle dictates on the most opportune time to attack the mage when she is forced on the defensive and not trying to cast her spells, take her alive. For ordered conjuring a ball of magical energy until it irradiates with lightning sparks wildly, Samantha thrusted the ball up to the air releasing a torrent of magically induced lightning rods to rain smiting thunder onto the ground. The Lightning Sphere a moderately challenging spell to cast but any intermediate mage could accomplish. The spell gives a cloud burst of lightning that thunderously echoes across a radial area of effect. For safety reasons, the spell is mostly used in open spaces rather than closed spaces, but Samantha was willing to take a risk. Taking advantage of the enclosed space of the earthen wall, the Lightning Sphere's cloud burst shattered the surrounding wall decimating the Imperial Knights, their battle mages in a storm of sonic thunder, torrid lightning and jagged rock leaving them scattering the disciplined formations. It was only through good reflexes or just dumb luck that about less than half of the initial elite force walked out unscathed. Pecha, Marchogfawn and Findrim were among the lucky ones whilst Meta the Crow broke a few bones on her body during the chaos ultimately incapacitating her greatest asset that was her roguish dexterity. It worked. Samantha huffed, the spell left her fuming for mana due to its great input needed earlier. Of course, it did. Iris applauded, they are dazed. Hit them with all you got. Samantha tells Aliathra and Iris as the lieutenant's hands glowed again with more magics. I always wanted to kill some Imperials. Iris smiled wickedly. Those Inquisitors always had an escort of knights whenever they attempt to hunt her and her fellow Socher fell down. Drawing her sorceress bloodline through her Socher fell heritage, Iris' hands mutated to a pair of deadly razor-sharp claws via a spell she had learned from her mutual shared teaching lessons of watching an entertainment play called Fist of the North Star called Blade Hand. Fulling giving into her vampiric thirst for blood, Iris let herself loose against the bewildered Imperial elites, eviscerating the lesser skilled and grievously wounding the veterans alike. The vampire witch minced her way across the opposition. Aliathra channeled the gale winds around her bow and arms, wrapping them ethereally with the spell Hurricane Bow which allows her to shoot her elven arrows at bullet speeds. And Samantha meanwhile, shot down the enemy skirmishers from range with her magic missiles spells. They managed to make a quick work of many of the remaining knights in the confusion until eventually, the Imperials regained their composure and regrouped albeit with only half of their legs in combat effectiveness. I will not go down quietly, 
meter bares her fangs as she drew her sure sword when Iris the vampire witch approached her with her razor sharp claws, her leathers were torn revealing parts of her scratched pale skin, she was not much of a face to face fighter since her profession requires subterfuge but she had a contract with the empire and she would be damned if she were to break it this day by cutting and running away. She swings the blade towards Iris but her weakened state made it effortless for the vampire witch to dodge the attack and swipe away the sword before kicking Meter back to the ground while getting a slashing wound near left eye for the trouble. The crow master coughed dust and blood as she tried to reach for her last salvation, flailing about to find it somewhere on her personal inventory. But Iris managed to subdue her hand by pressing her foot down on her hand while raising her vampiric claws to finish her off. End me swiftly vampire, Mita goaded Iris, unafraid of moving on to the other side, but as Iris raised the claws upward, she took one last look at the crow master before she cuts her down and savor seeing such a tool of her kind's destruction be brought down to the very dirt that they considered the soch air filled to be of worth off, but looking on Mita's resupine figure, a small speck caught her eye. Beneath the crow master's battle-torn clothing she spotted a peculiar emblem engraved on her right shoulder barely hidden from the blood dripping down by its side. Meter's tattoo was of a snake-like figure that Iris was all too familiar but wanted to forget for a long time. Qua Iris muttered she couldn't believe her eyes. But in the vampire witch's hesitation, Meter took the gods, given opportunity to finally reach back into her pocket and acquire her last salvation. A magical smoke bomb enchanted with the magics of a minor teleportation spell, saved for those situations that the worst case of scenario had happened. She ignited the trigger and slammed the smoke bomb to the ground, her form dissipating to an intangible form allowing Meter to escape and fight another day, leaving Iris literally grasping smoke. Iris didn't have time to think about what had just happened after realizing her quarry had fled away from her in her mind for a moment. She thought she saw a ghost, but now was not the time, they were in a battle and she needs to help her friends. Brushing off the dust from her relegant dress and resharpening her claws, Iris moved on with her blade and sorcery rampage against the Slay Aegean Empire's knights. I do not want to hurt you chosen one but I must free you from their trance. Petra challenged Samantha. Come get some. The lieutenant accepted the challenge. The faithful knight conjures six of his magical swords that he is its master of and tilted the pointed ends towards Samantha. Being a blade singer, he can in essence summon rods of energies into the shapes of swords or whatever weapon he is comfortable with and have them infused whatever kind of magical effects required to the tasks at hand with his spells, whether instead of the normal magically imbued slashes that can cut through even the toughest of mundane armors, blade singers can also make their projections strike the opponent in far more subtle ways like instead of wounding as in the default case maiming in order to weaken a target for easy capture as so was his intentions. Dodge this, Petra shouted as she unleashed his conjured projections towards Samantha. The lieutenant barely had enough time to react with a ward before she was bombarded by Petra's weaponized invocations buzzing towards her at super fast speeds. It was like a great weight fell upon her that she was trapped with no way to escape without risking exposure. Samantha knelt down and squirmed as she struggles to keep Petra at bay. If she doesn't find a way out, her energy will deplete and her ward will collapse making her easy prey for the natives to capture her alive. Stop resisting, Petra urged her. You will run out soon and tire yourself. You cannot block my attacks forever. Unless your skin is as hard as steel. Ha, Petra jovially asserted. Nothing less, Samantha grunted. Of steel? She realized she had almost forgotten one of the features of the Hecate suit, its ability to transmute itself. Originally this was meant to allow Samantha to bend magics much more efficiently yet there was still several other areas it could be tested out on. Coily. Samantha redirected whatever is left of her now slowly expending mana energies into one more spell. Slowly her body began to undergo metamorphosis, to explain in a bridgingly, a supple, micro-thin layer of highly fluidic, 
elastic and reactive actocolite titanium microfiber lattice we formed in a harmonic and wearable matrix just above the surface of the Hecate suit's epidermal layer is the foundation built upon Samantha's exclusive self-transmutation ability. After infusing with a sample size of the magical element she wants to transmute herself into, the energies become one with the Hecate suit's user. Theoretically as Dr. Malona had proposed, if one's magic were the right elemental formation of energy that matches whether conjured by Samantha or otherwise from an outside source, the mana energy's unique heat, electromagnetic and or radioactive elements within the matrix serve to dissipate damage from magically energized trauma. A secondary function of the same operation is that Samantha can turn herself into a hard-like walking shell made of carbon nanofiber tubes that are suspended in a dilatant or sheer thickening, fluid, when kinetic energy from a physical blow or a weapon discharge strikes the plating, the fluid becomes rigid, mitigating the impact shock courtesy by Aparo Industries experimental technology division named the steel form. To Petcher's astonishment and horror, he saw the previously suppressed shareholder's body perform self-transmutation within her body. A nice suicidally dangerous spell to cast on oneself as most forms of alteration normally ends up killing the user rather than transfiguring the intended beneficiary to a more efficient form. The faithful saw Samantha's body cover herself in hexagonally shaped cobalt-colored fluid that looked neither solid nor was it liquid before collapsing her protective ward. Impossible. No mage could ever survive doing a spell such as that. Petcher's eyes were suspended in disbelief. The knight's conjurations fell bluntly upon Samantha's form as she darted, steadfast as an imperial fortress knight, the juggernaut of battlefield valor, towards Petcher, her right fist raising overhead of her conjuring a tremendous amount of mana siphoned towards her suit. The strike broke through Petcher's defenses in spite of his reactive attempt to block it with his Scandonite shield as the shockwave reverberated its sonic echoes across his armored body, tearing his insides asunder incapacitating him as he clutched his ruined abdomen, while throwing up a bile mix of blood and saliva. As soon as his shield began to cave into the abuse brought forth by Samantha's steel form, Petcher yielded, knowing that he lacks the strength to best her. I must fall back shareholder. Don't think you have bested Petcher the faithful Rookdorf just yet, the knight said before he, clutching his wounds disappeared back to the oncoming wave of Imperial Knights. Seeing as she is in the clear. Samantha deactivated her suit's transmutation ability as she was rejoined by her two companions. Are you okay? Aliathra asked. Her eyes grew of worry as she saw earlier the lieutenant struggling to overcome the blade singer's attacks that she had to fight her way back to her friend to aid her but it had appeared she managed to triumph over after all. Ah! Just starting to sweat Ailey, Samantha wiped off the perspiration from her brow in relief. But as she tried to stand, her feet began to wobble complemented by a pained wince from the lieutenant. A minor bruise could be sensed by Aliathra's healing sense by Sam's right hand that the elven cleric easily healed. Warning, primary mana energies have been depleted. Isaac reported. Damn, that was pretty quick. Samantha shook her hand in disappointment to her suit already tiring out. Good thing I brought her back up from the back after that bath before I went to work. The lieutenant smiled as she picked up lone handful-sized crystal of unbenilium on her pocket and placed it on her hand. The Hecate suit's sensors instantaneously absorbed greedily the mana energies that crystal could bestow. Primary mana energies restored to 15%. Isaac adjusted for the additional power. Much better. The shareholder smiled. So did I do well on my magic Sally? Samantha asked. You have bursted a blade singer which is no trivial feat. Of course, you have done well. The elf gave her congratulations. Awesome. The lieutenant pumped her fist triumphantly. Consider today my final exam, teacher. She chuckled. No time for frivolities everyone. Among our enemy is a monster hunter. Iris pointed to a wild-haired dwarf who unlike the armored knights wore a flexible leather armor adorned with pockets trinkets and the most glaring that betray his dangerously venerated profession of a monster hunter, 
a glowing red amulet that beated to the harmonic rhythms of magic that is found in all monsterdom, Iris own vampires included. He is mine, the vampire witch, now rapturously drunk with the blood of slain knights, exclaims before charging towards a particularly wild-haired dwarven monster hunter wielding a great axe with his thick callous hands. Die vampire Findrum raised his axe in a war cry as the monster hunter charges towards Iris. Ah, the blood so exhilarating. A frenzied Iris laughed ecstatically, the bloodlust infamous to all vampires intoxicating her mind. She let loose her claws towards Findrum, imbuing them further with her magics as she unleashed in tandem with her melee attacks a barrage of magical missiles at the dwarf. Being a veteran monster slayer with several vampires under his belt, Findrum instinctively activated the special necklace he always wears on his person that allows him to cast a shield that blocks most magic attacks whilst parrying Iris' claws with his axe. Iris, thinking quickly recalls her knowledge of metallurgy and enchantments and recalled a spell that she had known upon understanding the concept from Dr. Malona when in regards to her skills of enchanting weapons and articles of clothing for everyday or combative use. Grabbing the long pole handle of a bearded axe, Iris infused her magics under the axe, causing the blade to quickly rust, deteriorating the sharp blade into dullness incapable of cutting freshly churned butter. Impressive. For an enchanter such as yourself, it is a shame you use your talents for evil instead, not that you being a vampire makes you any better. The dwarf belittled her. You know of me monster hunter? Iris asked Findrum. I know of you Iris Quidahagan, the fabled witch of the Verdon Forest. Mita told me everything she knows of you after her close encounter at Tyrian. Findrum accused her. I am going to hang your head atop of Kerfold her when I am done with you. Findrum bullied. The dwarven monster hunter drew from his pockets twin actocolite hand axes that he keeps as a backup and readied himself to continue the next phase of their fight. Come and take it. Iris Scutsily accepted his challenge. Findrum roared once again as he swung his axe ferociously at the vampire witch, his beard eyed axe much heavier on the focus of its weight compared to the nimbler of Iris' vampire claws. However, Findrum was the much more experienced close quarters fighter thanks to his many years of monster hunting compared to Iris who only uses her vampire claws as a last resort when cornered and she had only used these claws in about two other occasions and that is against intruders at her old home in the Verdon Valley Forest. The superior brute force of Findrum's axe soon whittled down Iris' defenses. Iris Aliathra shouted. She rushed towards the vampire witch and reached into her quiver to shoot out an arrow towards Findrum, hitting him at the right side of his torso causing the dwarven monster hunter to lose his battle rhythm. Taking the opportunity, Iris thrusted her claws towards the weak point that is the monster hunter's left shoulder and managed to slice in between Findrum's trapezius and deltoid muscles causing him to drop his axes as he winced over the vampire's cunning strike. As Iris was about to dig her claws further to finish the dwarf off, a sword blocked her claws way just an inch short of Findrum's heart. No demons shall prevail while I still live. Marchog Fawn rallied. Findrum, take me to and the boy out of here. I will hold them off before catching up, the knight said. I, ah. Findrum nodded before he retreated, barely holding his wounds to prevent bleed out as he flees for a cleric. He had taken much worse cheap shots throughout his career yet even then, his august age made all the pain seem to tear him more than the scars he had collected through the years, but nothing a visit to a cleric sitting back in the lines could mend. Aliathro attempted to loosen another arrow from her bow but a few near misses of bolts from several surviving imperial knights forced her to redirect her attention on the enemy skirmishers. How dare you brainwash the shareholder to do your bidding vampire? Is it for revenge once again for what we did to your people? Marchog Fawn interrogated Iris as their blades locked in mortal combat. She is not one of your people knight. She isn't from here. She is one of the other worlders. Iris responded. Other worlder? The shareholder is another worlder? Fawn questioned the vampire witch, not believing a word that this such air fill, whose people are infamous of having the motifs of conniving snakes tell of her. You are lying. 
The sacred crystal heart can never do such an impulse. Fawn repudiated the vampire's words but his words were cut short when he felt a sharp pain pierce his chest. But in his train of thoughts, Grashness left him a split second of weakness that Iris handily slashed her claws with an overarching swing from his upper right, cutting through his armor and instantly devitalizing the old knight's form. Fawn choked on his own blood as his upper body slid down to the Astorisi earth-like machine sliced cuts of ham before Iris could a hagen helped herself to the fountain of blood spurting out of his frozen body in a brazen display of vampiric brutality in front of his fellow knights who are his junior. Maestro Pecha who had just fallen back a good distance away saw his old mentor taking the fatal blow. Even Faith Len, now awakening from the discombobulating attack of Samantha, earlier took his eyes on the vampire witch, the corrupted elven princess, and the enthralled shareholder chosen one strike down the general of the coalition army to pieces. Even the coalition's regular forces were absolutely shocked that they had made mincemeat of some of their best soldiers in only a few minutes. Instead of fear, they only gathered anger over the sight of this embarrassing display. They would not be humbled by these three women. No, Faith Len reached out his hands in despair as he saw Marchog Fawn get torn apart by Iris like a wave eroding sand, his head decapitated clean off and his armor torn to ribbons by the vampire, shareholders and corrupted princess brutal ravishment of his old body. He pushed the clerics who were healing him away and looked towards the three girls and sneered his teeth. I curse your names forever in my heart, demon scum. Faith Len yelled at them. Soldiers, charge into Nankarim. Burn that corrupted city to the ground. Cut everything where they stand. Kill every last one of them, he roared. The human dwarven coalition forces followed the chosen one without hesitation, knowing that if they do not stop the rebellion here, their homes will be next on the warp path against the demon tide. They unsheathed their weapons and blew their battle horns as they charged screaming with all of their fury towards the three female mages. They took the bait. Realm in kid. Crocker radioed. You gotcha. Samantha confirmed. Cover fire. Cover fire. Cover fire. Crocker yelled the youth and dwarven defenders. This is where the fun begins. One of the silverback PMCs smiled as he readied his assault rifle. Activating turret, Kane exclaimed as he flipped a switch on his smart pad that activated a duo of automated sentry guns that he had set up to multiply the firing force of the Lavla Gates walls. A new wall was erected, a wall of bullets from fully automatic rifle fire from the otherworlders lay down suppressing fire down upon the coalition army as they made their charge towards the now lay open gates of Nankarim. Samantha Using the spell of expeditious retreat dashed back to the safety of Nurnkrum's walls as a tidal of wave of warm bodies flooded the dwarven hold, the native medieval fantasy soldiers were frightened by the gunfire but they steeled their courage and continued to charge toward Nurnkrum's open gate in pursuit of the lieutenant. Raise shields. A legionnaire sergeant ordered his men whom the disciplined troops obeyed in fruition. Get the buggers. A dwarf bondsman roared his war cry. They really want me. Samantha made light of the moment. Yeah, no time to take selfies in a T. Graf's sunshine. Get back here. Crocker commented from the radio. He turned to Corporal Clay and their dwarven allies, who looked onto the incoming flooding before him with a sense of fear upon their feet as who wouldn't be when such an army is so vast and so determined to crush every last one of them. The sergeant pulled Clay closer to him and sternly looked him at the eyes. Is she ready? Crocker asked him. Why yes. Captain Carplian is ready. The radioman nodded. Lays the target. Crocker ordered before he radioed in Samantha. LT. LT. Danger close. I. Samantha affirmed. Expeditious retreat. Aliathra declared as the three girls casted the spell and began to hastily dash back to the safety of Nurnkarim's walls whilst the rest of the youth covered their withdrawal. As the soldiers desperately rush to cross the horizon, Ken pulls out a small device from his pocket. At first the dwarves gave a dismissive pass at him over seeing such a humble little pen-sized item but little did he know that this item, a laser designator could summon dragons. This is Pegasus 3 to 5, my 825 Dragoon with Strike Package Bronco approaching targeted area. Making my pass, 
Captain Caprian declares on her radio, Bring the rain. Clay called forth, Brace everyone. This is going to get loud. Crocker ordered, LT. Danger close. The youth close support aircraft, cladded in draconic heraldry with its drum-shaped wings beating like wings across Nankaram's skylines that several of the coalition soldiers looked up towards the sky. Its span was no larger than your average griffin yet uncannily its wings cannot flap yet somehow managed to fly faster than the swiftest of eagles. Its head descended towards the encroaching army as the soldiers realized too late that they are caught at the dragon's kill zone. Samantha redoubled her sprint as the safety of the gates was just in her reach that she, Iris, and Aliathra dove down behind the walls at the skin of their teeth just as the A-25 made its pass. Firing. Carprillian radios. BBBR ra 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 t t t t. A great dispersion of fire, smoke and sparks brought ruin outside of Nankaram's gates. Men, dwarves and cavalry alike stood no chance against the bombs and heavy machine gun fire brought forth by Captain Carprian's air support. A dragon whisperer is by our side, praise be Thada. A dwarven rebel cheered, pointing out to Clay's radio set since his archaic mindset sees that whenever the radioman wielded his wand he could command the dragon to bring down scorching fire down at their enemies below the walls. They have a dragon at their stead. An imperial footman despaired. We cannot fight like this. He turned tail and began to retreat causing a chain reaction amongst his surviving compatriots to fold with him. Such power. Pecha shuddered at the devastation. The dragon that the demonic forces could summon annihilated half of their army in one move. He stared in horror at his fleeing men and their broken bodied casualties as he sees the flying beast above them turn around pointing its nose menacingly at them as if readying another infernal imbuement of its destructive breath that which results only in ashen craters and charred remains of what was once the empire's finest. Call. Cool. The retreat. He reluctantly ordered the army as he blared the horn that signals to the surviving coalition army that the battle is lost and they must fall back to lick their wounds. It was very rare to see such a sight of the Slaeijan army, finest in all of Sainagrad must pull back in shameful defeat for its bitter taste was ever the sourer as the value of victory after such a lengthy record of triumph after triumph became less taken for granted. They had underestimated their enemy and now they have been humbled, yet some of the men refuse to give up. What? No, we can still fight that monster. Let me back in. We can't let them get away killing Marchog 4. Ah. Faithland defiantly attempted to stand up from his stretcher but the injuries he had sustained from battle locked him in place. We can still win this. I know we can. Vengeful Legionnaire supported the Chosen One. We just need to have our sting eyes shoot that dragon down. A dwarven bondsman seconded. I am sorry but there is nothing more we can do here today but retreat. We need to revise our strategies. Pecha stared at Faithland's grief-stricken eyes whilst holding the hot-headed boy back. The old man sacrificed his life for all of us. We must not let his sacrifice be in vain. We must retreat back to Kerfold her at once, he reasoned. Faithlen begrudgingly conceded wholeheartedly for the first time in his adventurous quest. The army simply cannot take these casualties without any kind of gain. He swore to himself that the next time he meets this shareholder, he will avenge his master and all those who have died in the botched battle of Nankarim. Meanwhile above the skies, the A-25 Dragoon looked on to the enemies pulling back their forces in the area. Up for is tailing it. I repeat up for is falling back. They are in full retreat. The pilot reported her sightings on the radio. Checkmate. Clay cheered. Hey, we won. The day is ours. Clay relayed the great news to everyone in the city. Nankarum is free. Ludera skipped merrily. We did it everyone. The plan worked. Samantha raised her fist and cheered. I can't believe your insane plan brought down the mighty legions of the Empire. Those movies and a name may had taught you well Samantha. Aliathra congratulated. Oh, I do hope to learn more from them dearie. Say, how about we examine that tablet of yours again for more? Iris added. Yeah, we dot can. Give me a moment first. Samantha smiled. Her spirit was willing yet her body, weighed heavily by the exertion of the day forced her to retire her weary self onto the stony street. 
She was promptly carried off by the help of the elf and vampire who took her back to the Holds courthouse. Three cheers for the lieutenant, the shareholder chosen one, the hero of Nankarim. One of the freed dwarven slaves thanked their savior. Jubilation was heard in Nankarim's streets that day as men, women, children, old, young, free, slave, goblin, dwarf, centaur and human celebrated their triumph against tyranny. Eating, drinking, singing and dancing was the warmth everyone felt that day as they played the night away. While on the way, many people honored the brave otherworldly heroes with gifts and praises. Corporal Clay was fondly revered much to his aggravation Dragon Whisperer where he was showered with gifts and even the offers of companionship of several of the women. Speaking of women, Iris spirited off Cain away somewhere private for a few intimate moments whilst Crocker after having a jolly round of dwarf nail had a few steamy moments with an equally tipsy Quimera. Diaz helped Aliathro and Abedire care for the wounded hostages feeding them salvation by Neneth's holy words whilst Luthia Amirian began to discuss a few optimistic words in private of the plans for the future of the rebellion moving forward from today while sharing a meal and a round of ale to Together. As for the lieutenant, when the words had spread throughout the celebrants of her status as a chosen one, the shareholder they began to speculate. They know that these warriors were not of their world and the one named Samantha Rose was given the fabled chosen one brand of the shareholder. Was she given the brand to be able to wield magics like other mages? Mages weren't so fondly received well among the terrorist dwarves to their turbulent history yet no lo and behold Samantha today became the exemption. They wanted to ask more questions about her brand and yet the other world guards who were stationed at the courthouse where the lieutenant retired for the day politely shooed them away. As for Faithlen the Bane Chosen One. He was as every vile as his poisonous sounding name and it was only through Samantha's actions that they were able to see their kin be safe under the haven of the rebels. Again, they questioned why was he and the lieutenant fighting amongst each other when often in the old stories, when multiple chosen ones were gathered, they had worked harmoniously together. One thing is for sure among all of those rumors. Lieutenant Samantha Rose, chosen one of the brands Ranupata, the shareholder now walks this earth for a grand design unknown to all players within the destiny of this world and they had just saw the first pages of the saga be told before them and now they feel a compelling wind to tell forth this news throughout all the glee easier for they had won not another day to survive, but namely, control of their future. Some wondered, after what had transpired earlier that day behind a veil of thanksgiving prayer, had the Slaeagen Empire's legions and their whole dwarven bondsmen, once thought to be invincible fell before the might of the other worlders, was this all a sign of the gods' disfavor against the Empire and the dwarven moguls? There was always a belief that there were only two kinds of people in the feudal society of Gleesia, those born to rule and everyone else. It was the old divine right of way as said by the fabled bloodlines that once protected the world from the clutches of Allbone's reign of terror, that those lesser than the nobility are destined as the will of the gods to toil and sweat in wretched conditions forever until the day they die and see their children do it again. Many tried to rebel but none had succeeded. Until now. Will these strange other worlders known as the UFE change everything? Dash. The scene at Kerfoldha was at a tumultuous plight. The news of the humiliating defeat at Nankarim symbolizes the worst thing the Geomancer Mogul dynasties of the Astaroks feared, rebellion. News of the terrorist dwarves taking up hope and defiance against their Mogul overlords has caused the profitable mining industry and other economic sectors vital for basic civilization to a screeching halt as the casualties suffered had cost the Mogul's army to kneecap to a state where it could barely manage to repress such dissent. His position within the circles of the noble hold dwarves had also been weakened as several of their children were also killed in the Battle of Nankarim leaving them orphaned or airless. Holds consume a heavy lifestyle of opulent decadence had reverberated unthinkable changes to the city as many people became desperate to either rectify their conditions or maintain the centuries-old status quo. For their safety. Faith Lens Crusade stayed within the Slaeagen Empire's diplomatic compound within the political heart of Kerfolger, 
near Mogul Dolman's private residence where the human survivors of the ill-fated Battle of Nernkaram licked their wounds whilst they sulk upon the broken illusion of Slaagian invincibility. I cannot believe this, the shareholder, working with the invaders and Sir Fawn killed by a vampire working with the invaders, this has all gone for the worst. Ole recupped her reddened face as she despondently absorbs the horrible news from the survivors. I am afraid we know nothing of how to break the enthrallment spell the shareholder suffers under the hands of that vampire and that demon. We need to let the Emperor and the Grand Master know of this. Ah. Pecha tried to rise up from his stretcher but his injured bones crippled his rise locking him in place. You must rest Pecha. If you had stayed fighting against the shareholder any longer then your ribcage would have pierced one of your lungs or heart and you would have surely died. Carlyo addressed him. We need to find a way to take down these demons and crush this rebellion that they had caused before my country becomes like Suviel all over again. Findrum warned, right I shall cast a tweet a bird message of the news. Where has anyone seen our chosen one Faith Len? He is our best fighter, minding not his character. Carlyle nodded. If I recalled, he was personally summoned to Mogul Dolman's audience at his manse next door. Petra answered. He was very upset however I warn you Carlyle. Losing to the shareholder and losing Fawn has taken its toll on him, me included. I never seen anyone so upset before, he added, then I must take my leave. Carlyle bowed. Clerics take care of our soldiers here for now, she ordered. Carlyle dashed past the streets, passing through checkpoints and riotous crowds of the Dwarven Holds marble streets until she reaches Mogul Dolman's manse. After confirming her identity as part of Faith Len's personal circle, she walked inside the opulent residence front door and made herself inside the Mogul Dolman's private courtroom. What do you mean you cannot spare more? Faith Len's voice echoed his exclamation echoing the hollow hall of the courtroom. I have lost over half of my men and those who I can effectively levy from the other holds chosen one. I cannot risk sending more reinforcements for your idiotic plan. Besieging another hold is difficult even if it's Nurnkarim. Mobilizing troops takes time and the rebels keep harassing us to no end. Many of my advisors are now saying I should make compromise with the mining guilds before it is too late. Mogul Dolmond explained himself. Demons. They are not rebels. Demons. Like him. Why is he here? He could be waiting to strike you down this moment. Faith Len pointed to the curfold her mining guild leader who was also present in the room. Child. What is this demon patois you speak of? Dolmond asked of Faith Len's insistent terminology that he speaks about the rebellion. My men had just witnessed the leaders of the rebellion to be of the demons of old once again. He shared his slander to the courtroom causing many of the attendants to gasp in shock at the accusation. Order. Order in the court. Dolmond hammered his gavel, silencing the crowd. What is this babble? This revolt is about what we had always wanted for us miners. Better conditions and better pay. I know nothing about these demons, you speak of. All I ask her great mogul is to halt the locantira of our families once and for all, the guild leader said. You know I cannot lose a deal with the empire you know. I am no oathbreaker. Dolman leaned over the terraced dwarf with a powerful glare. Then it is my greatest delight that if you permit me to show it to you, something that can help our situation. May we take your court temporarily outside, to the Grand Mayan my associate's invention? The guild leader said. Permission granted. Mogul Dolmond allowed him. The court promptly rose up to their feet and followed the mining guild leader to the Grand Mine. The source of Kerfold has fabulous wealth which is a few kilometers march from the manse. Upon their arrival. They can see many terrace dwarves hard at work stripping every possible vein the geomancers, mostly Mogul Dolman's relatives could unveil from the rocky earth below. The Grand Mine is the largest mine in all of the Astrooks with a prosperous mining vein of almost every valuable mineral worth its weights in gold in Gleesia in this continent. It employs the use of geomancers to carve new pathways and veins whilst the normal handed terrace dwarf miners, supported by a blacksmith which is the Tinkerer's Guild's presence in the hold providing forges for refining ores into ingots, forging mining pickaxes and building support walls, 
The guild was also had a talented albeit controversial batch of terraced dwarven engineers who are known to create several controversial items that causes them conflict with the geomancers. It had recently been suffering work-related injuries and casualties ever since the enactment of the Vlokantira which forced more people, specifically families of dwarven miners to toil within the mine. Follow me over there. My associate is preparing our demonstration for you, the guild leader pointed. There was also a second crowd of spectators who surrounded a clearing of the mine. A demonstration? Of what? Faith Len asked him. Of the future. The guild leader cheerfully replied. Mogul Dolman's ever-beard bodyguards pushed aside so that he may see the curiosity. There he saw a curious contraption made of bits of refurbished mining tools and several custom-made iron parts. It had a mounted harness atop of several levers that acted as a sort of control seat for an operator to sit upon. There was also a burning furnace at the control seat's back that permeated smoked wooden dung that made several of the onlookers gag on its choking fumes. As for the contraption's means of transportation, there was a belt of finely toughened leather with bits of hardened iron to act as dreads, leaving straight slithering trail with ridged footings behind its path. Meanwhile an oil-polluted yet hard-working dwarf with circular goggles applied lubricant oil towards its jagged conical head of sorts, his dress giving him an aura of technical know-how unlike how most mages would wear their immaculate apparel to show their lofty statuses. Utamaniki again. I hope you do not waste me and my court's time again. I do not wish to see what had happened last time if you remembered how one of your inventions had done. Dolmond grumbled. He recognized that particular dwarf. The man was persistent despite his repeated failures. Ah mogul you are here to see again the fruits of the Tinkerer's Guild's progress. The technician dwarf greeted. I remember this. A steam drill as you call it. Dolmond tickled his beard. Indeed, after several setbacks I have believed that I have managed to successfully build my pride and second child. The tinkerer chuckled before gulping his voice back to a demonstrative tone. This is my steam drill, Vrorosk Van. The tinkerer smiled as he climbed atop his artificial horse and began to work the lever sticks of his contraption. What does it do? Kalaya asked, her curiosity piqued by the dwarf's invention. I am glad you asked Munleg. My steam drill allows me to dig and mine through the earth with the strength of a hundred miners, he boasted. The crowd was astonished whilst Mogul Dolmond and his geomancer looked at them with a silent stare. A hundred miners? Faith Len's heart skipped a beat. Yes, my drill can dig through the earth faster of what I dare say can compare strengths of, the tinkerer said. That is wonderful. Carlyle smiled. Who of the geomancers helped you build this device? She asked. Geomancers? Oh no. This is made from my own blood, sweat and tears. It had to go through several reimaginings through several decades. But I managed to perfect my calculations, the tinkerer said. So how does it work? Carlyle asked. I use this small black rock we used mostly for cooking called coal wrapped in goat dung as it burns longer than wood to fuel my drill as it digs through the earth. It requires no magical spells or materials of any kind as I pride myself on creating this machine from being able to run on whatever anyone can get their bare hands on. The tinkerer bowed. The onlookers of the demonstration of the strange device aroused them greatly with buoyant oigles and hopeful excitement. That is incredible. Mogul Dolman let us use this. Faith Len turned to the dwarven leader. The two adventurers were more than elated just as the miners were too. The answers to their problems laid before them like a shining bride on its wedding day. With this steam drill not requiring magic but able to multiply the work of a hundred miners would alleviate their mineral problem. But Mogul, Dolman's fists crumpled. Seeing the machine and its promising future was an insult to him. With no need of geomancers, his power would deflate in value as these upstarting entrepreneurs of this new invention were to be allowed to harness their invention's power. No, Dolman answered softly. Guards, arrest the guild leaders. E execute them. Destroy T this. This thing. The Mogul shouted. My lord, are you insane? The tinkerer pleaded. Please my lord, many families would be grateful if this machine were to sweat in their stead. Please consider. The mining guild leader begged. 
I should have known you would try to go after me one day. Dolman's grim frown chilled the hearts of the two dwarves. You are trying to usurp me and my dynasty. Was that why you were all so adamant to make your invention work? Dolman accused them. When will you terrace dwarves learn your place that as mages are above you as so divinely gifted by the gods? Bicepag. Never. We were only trying to contribute to our hold's continued prosperity. The mining guild leader said. How can there be prosperity if the people, us terrace dwarves sweat for meager takings? I built this steam drill so that my family can be spared from a cynical future mining rocks forever. The tinkerer appealed. Lies. All of you. Mogul Dolman deafened his ears to their pleas. Dominiki. You are all crazy all of you. Your pure craftsmanship can never match the arcane greatness of geomancy. Dolman scoffed. I never intend to usurp you my lord. Reconsider now. The mining guild leader defended himself. Machines break just like the last time your drill killed my eldest when he tried to test out your drill last time. Magic does not break unlike your contraption. The mogul rationalizes. Now you dare to insult his memory by taking away the one thing he dreamed to do when he become mogul by replacing geomancers with your machine? This is blasphemy to the highest degree. I wished to have you no longer stain my eyes with your presence no more. He screamed. I assure you my calculations can only be refined after every failure my lord. Please, give me one more chance to please you. The tinkerer cried. No. You dared attempt to outshine me and my family's jewels with your disgusting invention. I should have known, you would try to usurp my seat on the high table. I have tolerated you and your guild's troublesome existence for too long. From this moment forward all mining guild and tinkerer's guild leaders shall be rounded up and executed. The two dwarves' heads were placed atop twin stone building block used as an improvised execution block as the dwarven guards sharpened their axes with a menacing grind. Meanwhile, another group of Everbeards grabbed their war hammers and began to batter the steam drill to pieces with their mighty swings. The surrounding crowds of onlooking miners began to riot around Dolman's presence as the Everbeards divided themselves with one group forming protective formation around him as another group pacified the rioters with the pommel strikes of their weapons. Mogul Dolman, from all I am seeing during my visit to your realm, your geomancers, your kin, are treating their workers like slaves. I by the authority given to me by Grandmaster Rowan that you seize your actions at once. Carly intervenes, yet her cries fell again on stubborn ears. And now for a taste of things to come Kaznok, ever beards. With a flick of his finger, the guards, in two field swoops beheaded these upstart dwarves leaving a bewildered Faith Len and a shrieking Carly as they saw the dwarven heads roll. Their faces frozen with the same emotion that they were. You idiot. Now how can we get the minerals we need now? Faith Len growled towards Dolman. With the aid of my geomancers of course. Dolman defended his actions. All we need to do is increase working hours tenfold and we should be able to fulfill our contract. They are too slow. I am going out there and digging the ingots myself. The chosen one growled before storming off. If the mogul can't help him because of his intransigence then as Faith Len concluded he simply cannot rely on him no longer. To become the bane of demons, the best course of action is to do the task of mining the Actocolite, Gyronite and Scandonite ores himself. You lot. Dolmond pointed to three geomancers and seven of his everbeard guards. Help him dig what he needs out. You. Get every one of these terrace dwarves back to work. We needed those minerals yesterday. He rapidly ordered the mine's overseers. The men nodded and acted the mogul's words down the letter. Some followed the chosen one into the mine. Others conjured a lashing whip from their hands to whisk the rioting workers back to work who were now beginning to throw rocks at the geomancers and guards to display their displeasure only to be struck down by the everbeards repeatedly. You're killing us all. One of the miners raised a rebellious fist upwards to the air, his holler followed by his fellow terrace dwarves who, in solidarity with him, the executed guild leader and engineer shouted with one voice that echoed the underground holds, hollow halls, a cry for justice that was loud enough to wake their ancestors who were buried beneath the Astroxi earth that made the very mountains tremble. The College of Magi and the Emperor will hear of your impudence. Carlyle called the Dolmond out, 
Do not trouble yourself for that, you are dismissed. The Mughal indifferently expelled the distraught mage away from his presence. Kala jostled her way out of the rioting crowds for her safety as the Mughal's men rushed him away leaving the college mage to fend alone. Yet, she simply couldn't leave the boy Faithlen in such a tumultuous place like this. She could feel her instincts tell her that this riot will only escalate further and that the Chosen One was in grave danger, despite her reserved contempt for the hymn. He was still only just a young boy beneath all of his bravado and power. Climbing up a pile of discard rocks, Carlyle scoured the chaotic scene in search for Faithlen and founded him, plus the escort of dwarven warriors and geomancers making their way towards the mine. Where can I find more of what is rightfully mine? Faithlen asked one of the geomancers. There is a vein nearby that is said to be rich with actocolite. The geomancer answered, Actocolite. That is the mineral used to make the best weapons am I right? He asked. The finest for only a chosen one such as yourself. The geomancer bowed. The group further journeyed underground making past groups of miners who were oblivious to the rioting above them. Carlia sees to her horror the true extent of the draconic Vlokantira edict with her own two eyes. She saw workers, not fit and burly dwarven men but women and children working mechanically without rest at the Grand Mine's veins chained gang together with heavy ball weights to prevent escape. When one of them became dead or useless, their corpses would be thrown to a rotting pile at the center of the room as a grim reminder of their fate if their bodies would fail them whilst inside. To be disposed of like rubbish scraps in the pursuit of the hold's profits giving a grim ambience of hopelessness to the workers slaving away under the Doloman's stead. Even the atmosphere was intoxicating the Stygian with the only sources of light being the sparingly expanded out oil lamps, whose illumination radius barely lights three meters of ground that even new moon nights were brighter than what Carlyle witnessed. It was also starting to get very steamy inside the mine as several air pockets were bursting out causing heat to arise around the closed space of the mine which was answered rather begrudgingly by the whole dwarves to prevent worker attrition by installing large blocks of ice that marginally improved working conditions. When the overworked miners saw Faithlen and the Everbeard guards walking past them, several of them approached them like a swarm of beggars attracted like moths to the flame that is a well-dressed and financially secured man passing by a drudgery corner of the city. Voth goth ekled juttaga, voth chop on lari i, taruv chilgri i as de hon lari i. One of the malnourished miners grabbed Faithlen and wailed before he was swiftly cut down by one of the Everbeards. Mokan, Mokan, a woman begged but she was pummeled relentlessly by a geomancer's staff who was more annoyed by her pestering than anything else before pushing her and her children away from their path. Carlyle knew. He didn't expect Faithlen to understand the dwarven tongue but she does. They were crying out that they were prisoners in this mine and that they do not belong there for they were all mostly before being taken in by the moguls men soft-bodied shepherds, tanners and farmers. Work sets you free. One of the geomancer overseers cracked her whip at the miners. The actocolite vein is right here. The geomancer pointed towards a cobalt wall that shone with a brilliant crystalline reflection. Faithlen knew he now sees his prize before him that he did not care the boiling heat that permeated the air so thoroughly, much more than any other corner of the mine he had travelled to. But as he tried to approach the mineral vein a miner stopped him. Halt sir. This vein is being condemned. The miner said. Condemned? Why? Faithlen exclaimed. We cannot begin excavation until we properly survey what is below here, he said. Out of my way dwarf, the guards told me this is the best vein of actocolite discovered. Faithlen bared his teeth. They know nothing of mining I am afraid. Please step back and allow my... Gak. The minor dwarf tried to usher him away only for Faithlen to forcefully uppercut the dwarf knocking him away. Nobody must stand in the way of my quest for Gleesia's salvation. Faithlen huffed. Using his magics, the chosen one picked off a fragment of actocolite off of the vein. It was large enough that he can easily forge an actocolite sword out of it whilst small enough he can promptly pocket the ore at his pocket for safekeeping. See, I told you it's perfectly safe. 
He smiled before he amplified his magics to further cut the vein down for the rest of his army with one mighty blow from his hands. Faithland sliced a large piece of Actocolite off of the wall. But as he did, the very earth began to shake causing everyone to recoil and stumble upon the shock. What happened? Faithland questioned, you idiot, you struck a... The dwarf miner who had stopped him previously reprimanded him but before he could explain the chosen one's transgressions the wall behind him detonated as rock and a yellow-orange slime leapt out of the blast crater drowning the room. Several of the slower-footed miners, when they made contact with the orange Jews were immediately immolated, their screams haunting Faith Len as he drew his sword as he stared at horror of what he had just unwittingly unleashed. It's some, sort of, slime monster who can spit out fire, he said as he attempts to slash the monster down with his sword only for it to melt off of its hilt upon contact. Carlyle dashed towards the boy and grabbed his hands. Despite not truly understanding what had just happened, her instincts tell her that this endeavor cost far too much than it is worth when Faith Len brought forth this voracious creature. That is not slime chosen one. Carlia upbraided. Then what is this monster? Faith Len asked. Chosen one you cannot fight this monster we need to leave now, the mage said. But the Actocolite. Faith Len stubbornly answered but when he turned to the large Actocolite or he had just carved out of it was quickly buried by the fiery slime that grows larger the more solid matter it swallows, cutting his losses. The boy allowed himself to be whisked away by Carlyle as the mine collapsed before them. Like a tenacious predator, the slime devoured all in its path, person, rock or thing it did not discriminate. Most of the terrace dwarf and force laborers whose chains stifled their movement were quickly swallowed followed by the armored up ever beards. Only the light clothed and those who were near the grand mine's main entrance managed to escape the fire slime's glutinous path through the mine. But even then, as they arose to the surface, or of its tangerine form erupted from the ground all over Kerfold has cityscape. Grand architecture, aged for countless centuries and the pride of all dwarf and kind disintegrated alongside any sense or civilized order as the fire slime flooded the underground city. To many of the hold's denizens, it just seemed like the very mountain desires to eat them whole. Carlia and Faith Len made it back to the Imperial Embassy before hastily ordering an immediate evacuation of the diplomatic compound to the safety outside of the Dwarven Hold. Dash. Several days had passed after the aftermath of the Battle of Nankarim. Yet in those several days, it had felt like weeks for brackish dwarves of the Estal Rock Mountains. The lieutenant had just recovered from her soaring aches after the extensive usage of the Hecate suit and was now awaiting new orders from Agent Desardit. I am getting messenger birds saying that the defeat of the Coalition Army has severely weakened Dolman's grip around the Astrix. As I speak, several of my people are rising up against what remains of the Mogul's men. It won't be long before the mogul finally yield to our demands. Mirian reported the good news after he dismissed the messenger bird by allowing it to fly off away to send out his hastily written response to the other guilds. The end of the forced labor and mining activity. Ooh yes Tilda? Desart smiled. The dwarf happily nodded. It was perhaps the widest smile he had ever stretched on his small cockled cheeks. Now my people can go back to their lives in peace. Mirian cheered. You sure you can make do without the mines? Dasad asked. The mogul's edict caused great damage to our people that they will need to recover from and I don't believe you can feed people with rocks and gold can you not? He replied. But at the end of the day my people will no longer be forced to give up their future inside those deep dark mines no more and without workers. The moguls cannot give any more of those minerals to the Empire for their impending but ultimately doomed war with your nation Desardit. R. Yes of course, the farmers should be able to get back to their fields now, the agent affirmed. Additionally, command came through with the news that Prince Klovich has returned now from Earth and he is being greeted warmly back by his people. Just now, Colonel Polonsky showed him to his sister who had just woken up from her coma. Clay added. That is great to hear from him. Unlike me, a bee diamo bed as he smoked a cigarette. Soon the mountains will flip blue just as you say age, 
Samantha smiled with a sense of accomplishment but her words were cut off when she could feel the ground they all stand begin to quake. Instinctively, the youth soldiers and their native allies ducked under cover to shield themselves from the sudden disturbance as they waited for one grueling minute as Nurnkrum's buildings shivered in a frightening display of tectonics at work. By the time the earthquake was over, the entirety of the Sard's temporary office in the Nurnkrum courthouse. Christ what was that? Clay shuddered as he struggled to get back off after suddenly the earth began to shake causing everyone at the victorious Nurnkarum to lose balance and fall. The liberal use of dwarven ale contributing to the embarrassing sight. An earthquake? Samantha asked. Sipag must be working hard at his forge underground. Luther Amirian attempts to explain while rubbing his bruised head off of striking a cabinet. From the lieutenant's sociological intuition of the dwarf's answer, it was likely a folk explanation for either minor small magnitude earthquakes or geological disturbances such as landslides or sinkholes. Well I go check if everyone is okay outside, Dasad came forward. He walked outside of the Nurnkarum's courthouse to oversee the surroundings. To his relief, the dwarven stone architecture of the hold remained virtually intact outside of the dismantling of several weaker wooden structures. Most of the inhabitants waved towards him signalling their effective integrity, but as Dasat sighed another breath for relief, his nose tingled, it was like a mix of peppers had invaded itself to his nose. At first, he thought it was just dust kicked from the earthquake's wake but soon he noticed that the once blue skies above Nankaram had turned a bleak grey and larger dust particles began to slowly shower down of Nankaram. The ground he walked became littered with a sand-like texture as the intelligence agent wondered what was going on. Sipag's dirty ass. The mountain. One of the dwarves screamed. Turning around, Desat and the rest of Strider group looked towards north where the rest of the Astaroks continued from Nankarim. Sipag is angry. The mountains are erupting. Marion panicked. To their horror. They saw several of the mountain began to spew forth an orange-colored ooze as they dispersed rock and smoke from the openings that fractured out of the mountain range's slopes. It was then that everyone realizes that the peppery air they breathed and walked around was ash, and what that orange ooze was erupted magma, or lava. His worst fears have been made into reality, the Astaroks were erupting. What just happened? Abidaya asked. Agent Dasad cringed his hands towards his face to see the utter volcanic disaster fall before him. Get me a direct line to New Albany right now. The worse is happening. He orders Corporal Clay as the echoing screams of fear stricken denizens of Nankaram emerged from their hovels and scattered frightfully as the ashen clouds above them sinisterly curtained Nankaram blotting out all light both allegorical from the recent victory, and physical rays of sunlight. Chapter 46, An Angel Draped in Crimson Tell all of your people to stay in their homes and not come out until we say it is got it. Governor White ordered the Tyranny local leader his orders. The native bowed and took his immediate leave. New Albany Governor's palace was in chaos. The sight of ash clouds spewing forth and blackening the bright blue Gleesian skies from the north had caused a widespread panic in the region as the natives and youth colonists alike scrambled for safety. In contrast of what was meant to happen today, today was meant for celebrating the safe return of their dearly beloved son, Prince Klovich's return from his trip to Earth. All the formal fanfare and the groundbreaking press conferences were thrown down to the drain upon the Astorox eruption. The Aparo Corpos were busy locking down the streets of Tyrian whilst protecting their assets like any onward moving capitalist would. The Tyriani guards worked in tandem with the colonial defense forces in bringing order to the newly formed chaos across the valley whilst Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky sheltered the military assets used for the build-up for the invasion of the Imperial mainland. Prince Klovich and his entourage fled inside the safety of the governor's palace during his tour of the youth settlement when the mountains erupted. Isaac's calculative predictions were apocalyptic if any of the Astorok's volcano were to strike down upon Nankarim. There is virtually nothing stopping it from flooding downward into Tyrian and New Albany themselves as there will be little to no time evacuating the colony nor to even store much supplies to hunker down with. 
A tsunami of ash from the Astoroks would essentially wipe them all clean off the face of Gliesil if not stopped. Not only that, the ash would plunge the continent, perhaps even the whole of Gliesia in an enveloping eclipse that threatens to choke all life on the world, creating an ice age for centuries to come. The reports coming from Majent the Sarge and Nankaram were much bleaker due to their closer proximity to the Isleroks. All light coming down from Malinaries had been extinguished as a Stygian blanket covered the town. It is said that in order to walk around safely through the ashen mist of the volcano was through the use of floodlights but even then, one is still visually impaired. The operation of turning the Astoroks blue evaporated. Exploded on their faces quite literally. Lord White. This has turned for the worst. Prince Clovich dolefully came apart. Anxious sweat dropping from his brow as he nervously skittered about around White's office. Do not say that Prince Clovich. My men are working with your men as we speak to get this all under control. Jeremy reassured him. The volcano could bury us all before we can truly begin our work in modernizing Gliesia. Clovich wailed. Chushed Sobakia. A smooth voice entered the room. A brown-haired man in a sharp-pressed suit tramped haughtily inside the office. With that kind of attitude, we would have never tamed Mars and Venus. He spoke in a princely Russian accent. He smiled at the two men as he politely bowed down on their honorable presence while keeping his suit in tip-top dapper order. Yevadimian Ondov. But you can just call me Vlad. You're the senior executive of the Bena, pardon, Glesia Office of Maximov Engineering. He introduced himself. R, one of those people Emperor Shinharu speaks so highly about. The, Mega Corporations. Or Kapos as you call them. Prince Clovich recalled. Yes, yes of course. Governor White nodded with a fake smile as he quietly stared adversely at the corpo with Vadim returning the piercing beam of resentment back while the Russian maintained his diplomatic aura. I see you have a problem there? He asked. Fortunately for you, Maximoff Engineering has a solution to this. We have solved problems like this many times before. Vadim assured him. How? Some sort of massive freezing spell to stop the volcano? Clovich asked. An awkward silence followed before the Maximoff executive loose a boisterous laugh. In actuality Prince Clovich, the most dangerous part of the volcano is not the lava, but the ash clouds. It causes more damage than the lava thanks to the air being polluted. Dirty that almost no life can survive standing on it. The plan in essence is to neutralize the ash cloud from polluting too much. Vadim explained. I see. Then we might prove the doomsayers wrong. Tell me more of your plan why is one under earth? Clovich's eyes glimmered with faith. Under normal circumstance this would just been a rather slow and methodical process. But time is of the essence. Vadim explained slowly. Our first priority is the need to evacuate the people out of there before it is too late. Once that is taken care of we we can begin deploying one of Maximov in Zenaria's greatest machine to stop the volcano. Are you sure that this machine of yours can help stop the volcano from coming down on Tyrian? The prince asked. Duh. Yes, it can. Maximov in Zenaria patented mechanical marvel. The Gaia Transformer, the Russian corpor said. Oh, I heard of that. You use it right for setting up your mining interests on those worlds with little to no breathable air right? Jeremy commented. Yes, but assembling it would take time. About a week. Vadim added. A week? A week? A week? The prince yelled, his stressed voice cracking out of his composure for the two other worlders to notice. The machines is not meant rescue operations sir. It was meant for construction projects on low habitable worlds during the foundation and habitability stages only. The corpo explained. By the gods. They abandoned me. Clovich despaired. Don't fret now prince. We can still stop this but it will require well thought action. Vadim said. What kind of action? Clovich asked. This mission will require us to fight two problems at once. One for the ash cloud that is the biggest threat then lastly all of that lava flooding everywhere. We can easily be rid ourselves of the volcanic ash by the usage of some atmospheric processes and terraform gases to at the very least. Manipulate the ash full to fall somewhere harmless i.e. anywhere but here. Vadim explained. 
and your Gaia Transformer white pressed. When we deploy the Gaia Transformator into say a volcano world such as the Asterix, we would deploy a series of these special explosive device called Crotic Coolant onto the lava to allow the machine to be constructed peacefully. Think of a smaller version of the Gaia Transformator and you get the cryonic coolant. We can fit these into one of your bombers and drop them into the troublesome parts of the mountain. He explained as simple as he could. Flying one of Major Holyfield's planes would be messy at best. Plus, those bombs if I recall needs to be implanted precisely near their targets to have any effect otherwise the lava can just swim around it. I think it would be best we embed the cryonic coolants on some smart bombs and have someone laser designate the area just to be sure. Governor White mentioned laser designation, right? The magic spell of sorts that allows you to rain fire from the sky with the help of you flying contraptions by using a small handheld device that shoots an invisible bait of sorts for your planes to attack it with. That will require running around the mountain that is erupting with lava you know? Who or what could possibly survive standing against Sipag's wrath? Clovich questioned. Wait. I know someone that can help you on that. Governor White relayed as his mental light bulb illuminated. Who? Hold on. You mean La Dewey Rose? The shareholder as they call her? Clovich asked. He was given the minimum details about the sacred crystal heart having chosen several people to be its branded. He knew the stories of how the artifact would have wisely chosen and given purpose to each chosen one with gifted powers bestowed upon them awesomely. As of the moment. He knew only of one of the three chosen one, the Ranupata, the shareholder who is none other than the hero of our half-square, Lieutenant Samantha Rose. He was told that she had been bestowed the ability to be just as strong as any of the mages that Gleesia had to offer. The shareholder? That. Anomaly right? Vadim asked. Yes. The governor answered to the Russian. A nervous gulp followed silently as he confirmed the information to the corpo. He knew that they will eventually know of Lieutenant Rose's condition sooner than later. If she can be rapidly deployed to the volcano this instant then by all means I want to talk to her. I will relay her everything she needs to know. The corpo nodded. Isaac, get me a direct line with Lieutenant Samantha Rose of Strider Group right now. Governor White summoned the military AI. Anna, get me a geoprobe and some cryo coolants out of the box right now. Begat. Vadim radioed his secretary. Dash. The dwarves and humans alike were running for their lives as all of their civilization collapsed upon them at every turn. Sipag's wrath had ignited the Astorox in a fiery implosion of molten rock and trembling earth, destroying every architectural marvel the dwarves had constructed over the centuries. Even its death-stocking rampage was indiscriminate to whether one was a decadent old dwarf or a laboring terraced dwarf alike. Faith Len helped coordinated the SLA each and embassy's evacuation with the ambassador as they followed closely with Mughal Dolman's entourage as they maneuvered the lava-flooded dwarven road network of the Asterix. The Mughal's geomancers tried to divert, block or delay the flooding lava on that blocked their paths yet it was a stubborn material as the geomancers experienced great difficulty trying to get a grip on manipulating the molten rock but every attempt prematurely exhausts them with only casting their spells in collective rituals that they could momentarily manipulate the lava long enough to allow most of the important personnel of Dolmond and Faith Lens companions and courtiers. However, Several of them were simply not fleet-footed enough to escape Sipag's wrath, their agonizing screams drowned by the volcanic eruption's thunderous antagonism. The group soon arrived at the town of Guezzo where their end of the evacuations were well underway with the residents hastily grabbing onto their valuables before boarding their goat-drawn carts. In terms of the structural integrity of the town, it wouldn't be long before the very settlement sinks down upon the oncoming lava. We need more time to gather everything and everyone my lord. One of the blacksmiths said, my lord, another caravan of our people have been spotted down the road where we treaded earlier. A sting I reported. Dolmond looked over the horizon and noticed that the scout's words rang true. There was a caravan of about fifty or so dwarves fleeing away by a formation of ravine cliffs from the eruption that trailed menacingly behind them. They were tired. 
their fleeing knee capped by exhaustion and their wood bone carts beaten halfway into splintering yet the sight of the town of Gweza renewed their hope that they may survive the cataclysm of dwarven civilization. When those folks make it past the ravine, we might be able to collapse the rocks and hold the lava long enough for us to gather everything of value in this town. Ole analyzed intuitively basing her observations on the geomancer's rocks-based spellcasting. Dolmond observed closer the fleeing dwarves with anxiousness but upon closer examination of their clothing and the belongings they brought, his face scowled disappointingly when he saw that all of those dwarves he went out of his way to delay his retreat there were simple miners. No, they will not make it at that rate. Geomancers collapse the ravine immediately, Dolmond ordered. My lord, I beg your pardon? Olera asked the dwarven mogul. I must protect my blacksmiths, warriors and the whole dwarves. Dolman shouted. They are irreplaceable. But what about the farmers and the teamsters my lord? One of the mogul's own geomancers inquired. Leave them. We cannot sit idly by here no longer. Dolman answered. The geomancers nodded and with a wave of their magical implements. The dwarves collapse the earth on the ravine creating a tall barrier that can withstand momentarily the oncoming lava flow yet trapping the runaway dwarven evacuees at the wrong side of the wall. Mogul Dolman this is most unwise. You cannot just leave your people like this. Faithland protested. Who will help you with the work on rebuilding your realm? For the Alliance of the Light? You can't do everything. And what about the arms and armor you needed to build your army? The demons are coming again and now is the day we must learn to make sacrifices. How much of the Atilkalite, Gyronite and Scandonite have you managed to collect right now? The mogul said. Only a tithe of what was promised originally to Emperor Alden my lord. One of the dwarves grimly informed him. I did manage to grab this. Faithlen interjected. He pulls out from his pocket a palm-sized ore whose luster was as brilliant as the setting sun. It was the Actocolite he took from the Grand Mine back in Kerfalter. Sipag cursed this day. Dolman swore with a loud piercing well. That looks no better to be used for one sword in my experience. Findrim commented on Faith Lenzor. We barely stand any chance against these demons at this rate. Petra grimaced. All of this destruction, to bear fruit for this. Carlyle shamefully hid her face under her hood. That is enough Mogul Dolmond. This is all your fault. One whole dwarf stepped out and supported the chosen one. Judge Alone, we must continue the retreat, leave them now. If not, the lava will catch up to us in no time. Dolmond argued. We can recreate the land of the dwarven holds at the refuge of the Empire. Your callous disregard of those you deemed lower than you are what brought this disaster in the first place. Elaun argued back. Land can be established but does land mean anything when there are no people to dwell on it? They are our people Dolmond can you see that? Elaun, now is not the time to debate about the principles of the Dvaga. The mountains are erupting and we need to run now or we will all perish. Dolmond sternly reminded him of their current predicament. Dvaga? Faithlen asked. What is that? It is a political treatise that made dwarfant society what it is today. The clan holds. The terrace and hold split and the courthouses that makes all the laws of the Asterix. Olayra explained. A judge answers to nobody lesser than his mogul. Well the Dvaka just doesn't work anymore. He protests openly, leaving the gathered crowd to gasp in shock. Say again? Dolmond said. You are always lending your ears too closely to those bumpkins, Elan. Always saying the workers demand better pay and more time to reach the quota. He mocked in his raspy voice. What part of the word pause did you not understand Mogul Dolmond? This Vlokantira was your idea to make up for your deal with the Empire. The miners told you that any further reckless digging into the mines would be disastrous but no. Your profits were more important than their lives. Elaun shouted. If you want to save them so bad, then fine. Go out there and save them yourself. I never liked your previous contentions anyways. Dolmond dismissed him. His ever beard guards promptly dragged the insubordinate away from his presence. He then turned his gaze towards Faith Len's youthful blue eyes. He is mad, but he does remind me of one of the heroes of old. Selfless. Brave and not afraid to die. Faith Len lamented deep down. 
He feared the scorching kiss of the lava that made his skin crawl with fearful sweat. Chosen one, look me in the eye, boy. Dolmond asserted authorially with an imposing aura. We dwarves, as decreed by centuries living under the traditions of the Dvigga, that the Terence must always serve there for the whole dwarven master to keep society in order. It was only through our honor that we continue on with dealing with the Empire in spite of the hardship it will cost us. But are these not your people and is not a Mogular king? A just and righteous king would protect his people, fate and argued. Life is not a storybook with a happy ending boy. Mogul Dolmond called out. He paused for one moment to sigh. This chosen one was truly as naive as they come. We have sacrificed so much to be able to give you the minerals, even if it's not the promised amount for our world to survive tomorrow. Those trapped peasants below sacrificed themselves to serve you. To protect you and Gleesia so that you may be able to fulfill the prophecy and fight back against the darkness and bring about the new age. Everything, especially in war requires sacrifice. Do you understand? Do not make my sacrifices in vain. The mogul's rationalization was flavored with honey to soothe the chosen one to his side of thinking. I, I guess you are right. Faith Len bowed humbly. At least those terrorist dwarves aided on my glorious crusade. If there is nothing else we can do for them then it's only best that I, as the bane of demons avenge them when the upcoming war happens, perhaps the volcanic eruption is the god's way of helping me wipe out the rebel scum and their shareholder too. Faith Len said, how can you say that Faith Len? Carly interjected, those peasants are being enslaved into dangerous working conditions that could easily kill or maim them, not to mention that some of these miners are the elderly. The women and the children of the actual terrorist dwarven miners, they are being worked to death every day for you and the least you could do is give them your gratitude for their work. I hate to admit this but it is no wonder they desperately sought after the other worlders to liberate them from their plights. We should also not abandon the shareholder too, Faith Len. She is still under their thrall and we need to rescue her. Olayra added. Let us forget about the shareholder. I am the bane of the demons remember and she is under the other world as thumb. Don't forget who are her overlords, the vampire that killed March Hogfawn and the corrupted elven princess. We should not waste any time, she is lost now. Only I can save the realms now. Faith Len said. His defeat against the Ranuprata was a humiliating experience. All of his special attacks that he had learned from the best of the best in the Mage's College proved to no effect against the shareholder. He has to admit, that the red-headed woman sure knows her way around magics. Faith Len swore to himself that he will need to train harder if he is able to triumph over her again when the time comes. Additionally, there is still the scholar chosen one too. But the way that the shareholder told him about the Astasi Gol being her friend made him fear that he too is just as under the other worlder's thumb as the Ranuprata. He will have to tell the Emperor about this grim discovery and also see if he can get a private audience with the Sacred Crystal Heart when he returns to Herring Point. Don't say that chosen one, the Sacred Crystal Heart chose you, the shareholder and the scholar to save Glee easier. You cannot give up on them now, Olayra pleaded. We can attempt to rescue the shareholder some other time. For now, as I see things around here, it is best we leave while we still have most of our army. Retreat back to the eastern provinces and recuperate from there before marching south to Little Hill to meet up with Grand Commander Hubert Carter and the legions stationed there. Pecha suggested. He knew several contacts at the eastern provinces of the empire that he can link up with to replenish their losses from the devastating failed siege of Nankarim. About less than a third of their forces perished during the assault, most especially when the rebels summoned forth their dragon to stop their advance. The other worlders may have won that battle but the war has only just begun. Good plan Sir Eric Dorf. Faith Len acknowledged with our combined might. We can stem the demon tide at the legendary fortress. We should also link up with reinforcements from the elves too. I heard that their crown prince, one Prince Valorian is being dispatched to aid us. He says we can combine our strengths upon his arrival at Harring Point so we should head back there first before we start levying the peasantry. Mita the Crow added, how about we split our forces for now instead? Pecha suggested. 
You can have me and Findrum levy men around the eastern provinces while you, Carlia and Findrum split off with due haste to Haring Point and meet up with the elves. This sound very sound Sir Eric Dorf. I accept. The Chosen One nodded. Companions, help. Findrum pushed himself towards his fellow adventurer's presence. He was distressed, in contradiction his stoic visage. All of the Imperials knew that something was terribly wrong. My niece, Janris. She ran off. Findrum went straight to the point. Ran off? Carlyle's eyes widened. Where? According to one of her wenches, she ran off to help rescue some of the terraced dwarves before the ravine collapsed. She was supposed to make it back here earlier. By Thadar, I think she is in trouble. Findrum grumbled. Where did the wench told you where she ran off? Carlia asked. North, where we had passed off earlier. Findrum recalled. Right towards the volcano itself? That is suicide. Faith Len exclaimed. I beg thee, we can't risk losing you two like March or Grashinus. He urged. I I my knees. Findrum cracked under the pressure. He was heavily conflicted between rescuing his beloved niece and his oh so valued oath to the Adventurers Guild and Emperor Alden to be the shield brother of the Chosen One. Oaths are sacred in dwarf and society that a no earthbreaker would be a social pariah, even lower than the already dread terrorist dwarves. Yet there is a debate, brought up of such ethics about where does one draw the line between fulfilling your oath's purposes when it comes to equally important aspects of dwarf and culture such as familial honor, individualistic integrity and external perception. Dwarf and men were seen as the provider, the breadwinner in dwarf and society and being in the last living male heir to his family. Providing for them was one of the biggest motivators on why Findrum became an adventurer and pursued the career of a successful monster hunter. Yet equally important was the age-old tradition of oath-taking where he swore to both the guild and the emperor to never abandon the chosen one's side as his dwarf in honor dictates he must do. Perhaps we can find that judge fellow by the name of Elan? I saw him rally several dwarves some of whom included geomancers. Maybe they can help. Olaira reasoned. Have you seen how those geomancers cannot bend the lava? It won't matter. The monster hunter said. You are a warrior, a monster hunter, a proud dwarf of the Asluric. We need men like you to fight the demons. Faith Len appealed. But she is your family Findrum. I know her since she was still just a tyke. Wasn't generous the reason you became a monster hunter? You have to save her. I can come with you to help rescue her. Carlia volunteered. Me too, I may be a scholar but I cannot stand seeing so many people be burned alive by this volcano. Olayra stepped forward just as bravely. You good for nothing scholar. Do not drag both Le Dewey Silverdane and Findrum to run off to their doom for one girl. What is the fate of the entire world be over her? We are supposed to be fighting the demonic invasion. Faith Len stomped his foot as his nerves struck violently as he unleashed an unsettling outburst over the direness of the moment. Little fish, Olayra screamed, addressing Faith Len by his longtime childhood nickname. I had thought you are just being haughty for a newly dubbed knight and that you would learn to know how to discipline yourself when you are with Sir Ekdorf, Ludwig Carlia, and Marchog Fawn. But running off to save one girl? Who do you think you are to say that? But, the demons. Faith Len muttered. But he was interrupted by the non-magical scholar. People want to rescue their families and friends but all you care about right now is how you can best the demon lord. Olayra frowned, as her hands firmly held her hips as he looked her in the eye. We must continue our quest with due haste like the stories of, again, Olayra interrupts him. Now is not the time to read again the old stories from Evak. Olayra reminded him, the town bard, how do you know him and me being called Little Fish? Who are you exactly? Faith Len asked. Oh, I don't know. Olayra playfully jested him. I am just a girl who loved read by the shy flowers every noon. I beg your pardon. Faith Len recognizes those words. Only one person from his childhood could big ears. You were always trying to be like all the heroes in Avux songs you know little fish. Olayra explained. But I never knew you could be so selfish after all these years. She scoffed him. You know what? The Olayra is right. You do need to learn how to think about others. Faith Len Garmhaik. Findrum curled his fist. Yeah. We are all in danger because of this demon invasion. It is not just about you, but us. Carlyle said. 
I will have a good word with you later boy. Petra, keep the bane of my nerves safely. Carlia, come with me. Findrim taken command. The monster hunter and the master sorceress departed from Faithland's presence with Olayra following the former as they made their way upwards towards the eruption area of the Astrock volcano. Don't forget about me. Olayra hollered. Olayra. Are you sure you want to come with us? Carlyon knelt down and held the young girl by her hand. I know your heart is in the right place and I know we both have our differences with Faith Len, but I don't think it is best you come with us. You are not as good at climbing as Findrim or have any magic like me. I want to help. Olayra pleaded. Much fac. Carlyon motherly gave her pause. What can you do? I have this. Olayra pulled out from her long robes a satchel with a tree-shaped insignia on it, a symbol of the healing goddess Neneth, it is my lucky satchel, I keep several Nenya leaf patches and apple of ointment with me, ah, clever, all right, you can come with us, Findrim smiled softly with a warming gratitude, you may follow, but stay close to me, Carlia said, where do you think we should start looking, Carlia turned to Findrim, perhaps we can talk to that judge that mogul Dolmond kicked out, Elan wasn't it? Findrim proposed. I saw him and some of my kin go that way. That is towards the volcano. Here take this in case you get burnt. Olayra warned the dwarven monster hunter with a bottle of Elven herbal ointment. Nenith be praised. He caught the ointment and placed it in his pocket. We should split up and meet up again by the purple brawl at glow patch by the crossing between Sipag's Tears and the old brewery south in about two hours. Carlyle instructed. I will bring Olayra with me. Can you take care of yourself? She asked Findrum. I, I know these mountains since I was a wee. Of course, I can. Findrum nodded. He looked over the looming horizon of the erupting Astrox before him and gulped nervously. All of the physicality that he trained his body over decades of adventuring will test him to the limit today for this monster, is a beast he cannot slay, only survive its onslaught to escape its infernal kiss and ravenous appetite for all things material. Dash. Samantha heaved her body forward as she mountain ran the rocky gauntlet of the lava flooded Astrox ice slopes. It helps that the Hecate suit comes with a built-in exosuit that allows her to burn less calories for the more strenuous of activities. She also wore suit's helmet, given to her but not until now by Dr. Malona, that shielded her face from the volcano's heat whilst also able to breathe through a modular slot that allows an oxygen tank to flow to her mouth. Under normal circumstances wouldn't wear as he much prefers her beret or a standard-issued cap with a headset attached to it but she was on the clock from direct orders from Commander-in-Chief Governor Jeremy White to staunch the bleeding mountains flow before the lava and ash clouds devours Nankarim. The Sumos Dwarven Hold is currently undergoing a massive evacuation but the youth Air Force needed time and visibility for their super ospreys to evacuate the entire town. That is where the newly arrived mega corporation, Maximoff Engineering, timely entered the fray and offered their assistance in geographical terra formation. The main plan is to construct two separate Maximoff engineering devices that will work in tandem together. The Gaia Transformer and a device called the Atmospheric Processor. This operation would have multiple stages whose objectives revolves around neutralizing the harmful effects of the volcano by turning the wasteland it had produced back into a fertile habitable land. The first step is to mitigate the harmful geo-effects of the ash clouds frigid fumes from suffocating the nearby life around the planet to the imploding lava eruptions that threatens to bury all things civilized and constructed in the Astrox by using the atmospheric processes. It they will be deployed on field within the vicinity of Nankarim. Their function is to purify the entire surrounding atmosphere off of the volcano's choking ash clouds so that a breathable air can be maintained within the area of operation. It functions by siphoning off the ash clouds that intrude around its airspace, filter, of any contaminant before releasing the now purified air back into the atmosphere. Normally, the atmospheric processes can cover an Earth-sized planet and filter off any harmful contaminant in a 10 to 15 year process involving constant emptying off of the contaminant storage of the satellites but thankfully, according to Misty and Antoff's estimates, 
the Tyrian region and the southern Esleriks, the only two regions within CSP's interests, should be in the clear well over in between a month, six months or until the eruption subsides. However, by about a week, the atmospheric pressure would have mitigated most of the worst effects of the ash cloud within a week. After the skies are cleared, it shall be the Gaia Transformers' turn. The heavy terraforming device will release a barrage of habitability enhancing nanites that transforms any unlivable climates and hostile regions to become its antithesis and allow the habitation of life by transforming the air and soil at a molecular level. It promotes the accelerated photosynthesis of floral life and breathing air for fauna around the region. The Gaia's transformative process would take about a year or more to completely revitalize the southern Estlerx but Maximoff is hoping by less than the halfway point, they can begin cashing in on their investment in the region. The mining megacorporation as per agreement, would split a third off the found minerals harvested from the Estlerx to the colonial stockpile during the construction of the resource exploitation sites as what the youth have all hoped to do after all the time playing the Gleesian geopolitical game. But at the end of the day, the priority is to evacuate the civilians and youth personnel in Nankarim. Samantha, with the help of Harden, Iris and Aliathra and volunteers from the combined youth and Silverback PMCs would laser designate key areas around Nankarim that is in danger of being flooded over with lava, sudden ground ruptures, ash cloud buildup and earth and landslides to protect the city long enough until the hold is fully evacuated. Major Holyfield through the insistence of Colonel Polonsky, half-heartedly had to re-divert his naval aircraft to assist the evacuation which were meant to be for the aerial elements for Operation Haymaker. In addition to this tense moment, the moment he had heard of Maximoff engineering entering into the scene so suddenly had gotten the Corpo Vincent, from what the lieutenant can read, mildly annoyed over the sight of his old Kesselheim competition now moving in. And moving in quite fast they are as Maximoff entered into Gleesi a dress to impress with one of its claims to fame courting the attention of the prospective investors and customer bases that are the natives. The immediate effect of the atmospheric processes can already be apparent for the rescue effort as the choking fumes of the ash cloud was significantly decreased allowing visibility and limited movement to push through the evacuation. The machines are still not yet at its fullest operation yet High Command wants the evacuation to be good as done by the time the atmospheric processes have been fully deployed to full functionality. This allowed the rescue and disaster mitigation teams to be able to efficiently pass through the troublesome areas with relative ease. In addition, the UFIF and PMC forces on the ground were instructed to gather as many survivors who so happened to be outside of Nankaram at the time and have them board the airships. Most especially for Lieutenant Samantha Rose who ventured off with one of Cairns' drones. The lieutenant, able to see more than at least 70 meters away from her, climbed over to the top of the mountain top. She heaved herself over and peered over the horizon where a tidal wave of lava threatens to spill its content down to the slope below that leads directly to Nankaram itself. Lazing. Samantha radioed as she clicked the activation button of her laser designated towards a most troublesome pile of lava that is threatening to spill over a deep slope that is directly above Nankaram's northwest. Firing coolant. Vadim radioed back. From a high orbit, an A-25 Dragoon retrofitted to fire the cryo-coolant explosives rain and nanofluid rain to the erupting Estlerix. Its fast action properties of fatty acid capped magnetite nanoparticles, liquid nitrogen and other undisclosed components held by Maximoff Engineering's patents, can supercool lava at a molecular level. Good effect on target. Ken radioed. He was accompanying the lieutenant through his UAV drone from the safety of Nankarim. Outside of his robotic companionship. Samantha was alone as time was of the essence for this mission and it was best that every one of her friends split up to contain the volcano's wrath from flooding into the dwarven hold. Iris is with Aliathra, Diaz and Clay searching for survivors whilst Crocker, Abidia and Cain stayed behind in Nankaram to make sure the evacuation goes smoothly. Good job LT. It looks like that's the worst of it all. Crocker buoyantly cracked from the radio. 
Hope you're doing alright there. We had to medivac some people and one of the squad but Docs says we are in the clear. Shit's getting scary now. Crocker added. Spare me the details later. At least everyone got out safe and sound. Samantha nodded. Right, go haul your ass out of there and I will meet you back at New Albany. Crocker out. Her sergeant promptly cut off his connection. Stride lead. This is Shield Father. Colonel Polonsky radioed. Return back to Nankarim. You did all you can for now. Let's have the corpo take over for now. Your squad will evacuate immediately. Colonel Polonsky ordered. Roger Shield Father. Wait a minute. Her acknowledgement of the orders to return down the slope of the mountain was interrupted when she spotted a number of dwarves, at least a dozen of them trying to escape off of the steep slopes from a rogue wave of lava that creeped relentless towards them just a few inches away. They were barely trying to keep up the pace but the ash cloud fumes and their weary bodies dangerously slowed them down that they are likely to be taken away by the infernal flood in a few moments. Adrenaline pumping in, Samantha dashed towards the dwarves as she charges her hands for the magic spell earthen wall, conjuring the ground to rise up and shield the dwarves from the rogue wave of lava just in time as they were about to get caught in its infernal embrace. T thank you. The dwarf gave his gratitude. Are you one of those knights from the Empire? He pointed to Samantha's suit that gleamed upon the reflection of the lava to the Hecate suit's nano-composite skin. No, the lieutenant next. We need you all to get out of here. Follow me. Samantha gave her helping hand forward that the dwarf grabbed onto as she guided them away from the dangerous slopes to the other side of the mountain where a large ridge was formed. This is Stride Lead. I have twelve civvies in tow requesting immediate extraction over. Samantha radioed. It was advised that if any of the spotting teams found any survivors, they are to contact a Super Osprey and have them land. Strider lead this is Eagle 2, affirmative, flying over now. A pilot answered her signal. The gale winds excitedly danced around them as a large hovering figure descended upon the ridge. A jaw-like appendage opened its maw down as it grounded itself on the Astorisii floor. A dragon, it's coming to eat us. A dwarven lass panicked before she turned tail with her arms flailing. Hey, hey, hey. Samantha grabbed the woman firmly to calm her. It is not a monster. Look, she pointed back to the Super Osprey. A figure emerged from the dragon, humanoid in shape but tender in demeanor. This place isn't safe anymore come on. Eagle 2 Esco pilot urged. After a moment's hesitation, the dwarves one by one boarded the Super Osprey with the guidance of Lieutenant Rose took them to whatever empty seat was left. The aircraft was half full with other civilians and several silverback PMCs in tow. There were enough seats to fit all of the rescued dwarves plus Samantha in the aircraft and the pilot was already eager to get himself out of this mountain. The lieutenant carefully buckled down the seat belts of every dwarf and kindly reassured each and every one of them that everything will be alright and that their nightmare was over. Your lieutenant rose, aren't you? I heard of you. The co-pilot pointed out. You're a wizard, now right? He asked her. Yeah. Samantha nodded. What's the situation back in Nankarim? She asked. We're one of the last to get out of there now. Everything is all Maximoff drones now in Nankarim. Misty and Antoff told us that the worst of it is far over and it should be all just the Corpus drones left in Nankarim to do its job now. You sit tight LT, the co-pilot said. Good. I will tell the rest of the squad we will get exfiltrate separate. I am going with Captain Caprian and Desart so we can pick up the boys up before we meet back in New Albany. Ken's drone relayed. The last ones? One of the dwarves Samantha rescued raised her voice. No, that's not good. My daughter and several more of my kin are still trapped inside the tunnels. The woman began to panic as the lieutenant attempted to calm her down just as the Super Osprey was about to take off. My daughter Janris is still inside the underground passages I think I lost her when we're fleeing the lava. She informed her. Based on Samantha's experiences throughout the Black Operation, the Astoroks have a network of underground passages built by the Dwarven clans that form shortcuts to allow easy logistical transportation to and from the various holds and beyond the Astoroks. Each hold handles the daily maintenance and the toll fees during use. 
the one near Nankaram being one of the busiest of underground passages at its prime. They were carved diligently with extremely dense building materials that are meant to lassians of time carrying the weight of mountains. She knew that they also have several interlocking gate systems to control the flow of traffic throughout several intersections which should theoretically stand for a decent amount of time against lava as Lulia Amirian tells her. She still has plenty of oxygen to explore the underground passage for about less than half an hour before she has to retreat out. In addition, her enhanced powers from the Hecate suit should extend her life support and protections whilst inside the volcano should keep her safe far longer than what most ordinary of men would do. Your daughter is there? Samantha calmed her down. What exactly happened to you? How did you get out of those tunnels? She asked. Me and my kin were trapped on our way out when we got trapped by some collapsing rocks. We thought it was the end as there was nowhere out but thankfully a selfless dwarf by the name of Elaun and his companions of several geomancers and two imperials set us free. But before we could celebrate the tunnel began to be flooded by lava so we had to flee. My daughter might still be in there. The woman explained. Please, I, Joru will bring shame to Nanith the mother goddess if she perishes alongside those people. Rescue her please, O oh brave knight. I. I will try to. Samantha attempts to reassure her fears but she was interrupted when her radio pinged. Lieutenant you safe? Major Holyfield's imposing voice asked from behind her radio. I am but several of the dwarves just told me that there are more of them trapped inside the underground passage. Samantha said. We need to rescue them. Absolutely not Lieutenant. We cannot risk your life any more than we should now. The Major advocated against her course of action. But sir those people trapped. Samantha implored him. Please save my daughter. Save my kin. Joru pleaded. Samantha looked directly into the eyes of the dwarven woman with a peering gaze. The native's tears fell down her little cheeks with a prayerful plea threatened to melt Samantha's bleeding heart. She had seen so much in so little time. This dwarfine woman, this Joru, reminded her of all the widowers and orphans who lost someone they loved during the attacks, the forced laborings and the eruptions she saw during her tour of duty but the most grievous of pains of all other parents who lost their children, for there is no word in the dictionary that gives subject to this definition for that is the greatest pains of them all. After all of the death and destruction of the terrorist attack by the Grey Order to the kidnapping and subsequent trauma of April Root, and at the latest the entire heartbreaking sight of the Dwarven Chaste system, most soldiers like her would have hardened their hearts to the terrors around them. But not for Lieutenant Samantha Rose. She couldn't care less if they were the enemy an innocent civilian or a fellow youth, she would come back for them, for nobody deserved to die like this, if she can just save one life, prevent one heartache to happen to another person she would do it, not later when the volcano has subsided, not after Operation Haymaker has finished, right now, for there would have been no tomorrow for them otherwise, you are to evacuate immediately from the Astorox Lieutenant Rose that is an Major Holyfield raised his voice but Samantha instantly cut him off from her radio's communication line. The lieutenant turned over to the Super Osprey's ramp and pulled the emergency opening lever as the ashen winds blew before her. LT what are you doing? Eagle 2S pilot asked her. I am going back for them. Samantha informed them as she jumped off the ramp. She softened her landing with a quick cast of the spell featherfall to soften her landing. She peered over the Super Osprey's ramp closing its jaws before flying off. There was no turning back anymore. Her volition pushes her forward from here on out. She ascended over the Astorisi ice slopes until she finds the entrance to the underground passage leading out to Nankarim. A great cavern with an ash-buried road laying before her and several small pools of lava oozing about around the vicinity. LT, are you fucking insane? The Major just told me everything. We are moving into your position as we speak. Hold on we'll get you out. Her second-in-command Sergeant Crocker radioed in. Sergeant Crocker, I am doing the right thing. Samantha explained, when you do arrive at my coordinates, you will see a giant tunnel. I will be in there. Prep Iris and Ailey for additional work. Lieutenant rose over and out. She ended the call and took a deep breath. Before her was the heart of darkness, 
or the gates of hell itself staring in front of her. When listened in carefully she could swear she heard the pleas of those left behind souls still trapped inside the tunnel passage. With a steeled heart, the lieutenant flew inside the tunnel with no other goal but to rescue whoever she could inside or die doing the right thing. Dashing past the ashen piles and the lava-wet floors of the tunnel, Samantha shouted, A cub, a word used by dwarven alpine hospice rescuers when they attempt to call out to those who find themselves lost amongst the frigid tops of the Asterix. Her voice amplified with the slight manipulation of illusion magics. A cub. She shouts again within the hellish darkness of the tunnels, Neneth be praised, over here, her voice echoed beneath darkness. Samantha followed the noise carefully, using her flashlight to illuminate the darkness. Her light soon shone upon a small group of at least four very frightened dwarves, one laying down unresponsively whilst the rest shielded their eyes from the lieutenant's flashlight. I am here to help. Samantha softly reassured them in a comforting voice before kneeling down on the knocked out dwarf. What happened to him? Samantha asked. My father collapsed when we tried to run away from the lava that began to flood all over this tunnel. Me and my brother had to carry him over until our torches burned out. One of the survivors explained. The lieutenant examined the knockdown dwarf with her suit's built-in scanner which is connected to Isaac. It only took one brief observation to conclude that the dwarf was showing signs of body failure due to inhaling ash clouds which combined with the intense physical exertion as shown by his compatriots' disheveled appearance and said victim's venerable age that he was slowly starting to enter into the throes of death. Sam conjured with her magic a ball of immaculate air from her hand before prying the unconscious dwarf's mouth open to force itself entry into his body. This trick, a creative reinterpretation to mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation was a variant of the air bubble spell. Using a feel-and-touch approach, Samantha brushed off as much ash particles that debilitated his breathing as much as he could. Gah! The once unconscious dwarf gagged to life as Samantha yanked out the air bubble, now tainted with sooty ashes. Father, the younger dwarves rallied in delight. Can you walk? Samantha asked. Ah. No. So. Tired. He tepidly answered. His breath dry with fatigue. The lieutenant pulled from her pockets her canteen and made him take one sip of the rejuvenating water. Were there more of you? I heard there was a Janris and an Elaun with you. Samantha asked them. Elaun and Janris? I saw them holding off the lava deeper into the mine. The young dwarf informed her. I see. Samantha lowered her head. She grabbed the injured dwarf's arms over her shoulders before placing both his legs and arms around her neck and waist like a backpack. We need to leave now. Follow my lead, she told the dwarves. Using the suit's sewn are you, I heard. Samantha easily guided the dwarves out of the tunnels where just in time, Crocker's super osprey had arrived in her position. LT, Crocker shouted. He wanted to personally reprimand his green superior but upon the sight of the weary dwarves being carried over by her, his protective instincts kicked him into the task at hand. He grabbed the dwarves and boarded the super osprey carefully. Sweet relief smiled upon natives' faces as they safely sat down and finally rest under its winged safety. But as Crocker tried reach forward his hands for his commanding officer to grab, the lieutenant only backed away. LT, get back here, Crocker shouted. I am sorry, but there's more people inside. Samantha explained briefly before she returned back inside the tunnel. Crocker couldn't run out and try to grab her as he was low on oxygen to attempt a pursuit in addition that Strider's two other mage users were out of commission too one from injury the other from exhaustion. The volcano's fury becoming more apocalyptic by the hour and in the confusion, caused several of the Ufif's own men injuries too, such as Abidaya and Aliathra being the most damaged. Abidaya, only through sheer will alone being able to still remain breathing before he reached the sanctuary of Captain Carplian's Super Osprey. The old and weak were truly the most vulnerable to the volcano's hellish advanced. But even those who risk their lives for their fellow others whether through compassion, their creed or both in the case of Aliathroleth there were not spared by Sipag's wrath of whom the blacksmith god Tempus smite the elven cleric. Fortunately, her spirit remains willing in spite of her flesh being made weak. The more time, 
Samantha burns to rescue just the last few vestiges of survivors, the smaller the window of escape for Captain Carpley and Super Osprey becomes evident. Her airship, can only take so much punishment from the pelting of ashes and turbulent winds of the disaster zone. It was only a matter of time before the volcano completely devours every living thing left inside of the Asterix. Lieutenant, Dr. Malona called Samantha through the radio from his laboratory in New Albany. We cannot risk you much longer with you being out there. Get out now. He warned her. No. Just one more. Samantha tells him off. The lieutenant began to routinely cycle through more survivors, carrying them to the safety of Captain Carplian's airship with every thrust of her body. Upon chancing a survivor, lured out of the darkness from the heralding of Samantha's call of deliverance from their apocalyptic oblivion of their civilization's collapse, Samantha would allay their wounds before escorting back to the surface like a guardian angel. She saved everyone that heeded her call young and old alike to reach the heavenly steed that was Captain Carplian's airship. Despite the pleas of her second-in-command to evacuate already from the now-doomed Dwarven Mountains, Samantha declined despite exhaustion slowly creeping into her body and voice with one hauntingly feverish phrase, one more, before turning around to go descend into the Stygian Inferno once again yelling, to a cub, and then repeating the cycle once again until she is sure she had rescued everyone still worth rescuing inside the tunnel caring no cares of whatever petulant reprimanding from her superiors for something she knows in her heart would have her father, Captain Desmond Rose would do. Whilst she continued her selfless act, she continued to ask those same survivors if they had seen a young girl named Janris again. The same answer was brought forth by every last one of them that she was deeper inside the tunnel. Exhaustion began to grip her body every moment she ran through the gauntlet inside the tunnels. Her legs grew sore, her hands and arms became weary, but her determination kept her pushing more to find and rescue more trapped peoples. She said to herself again and again as she navigated the darkness, one more. Just one more. Eventually, Samantha found herself of what was once a great underground chamber that functioned as a crossroad for the underground tunnel network. The chamber was now nearly flooded with the lower tunnels deluging great amounts of ever slowly rising amounts of lava. Additionally, the anomalous spike of mana energies had also pinpointed that its presence is inside the chamber. Peering her eyes to the vicinity, Samantha spotted in the middle of a sea of lava, laying by a large rock that barely manages to float by while being shielded by the radiant heat of the aforementioned lava, gathering of twelve people. Ten dwarves and two humans from what she can discern. One of the humans was creating a small shield bubble around her to ward of the harmful radiant effects of the lava that surrounded them. To her surprise, she recognizes the two humans, one Carlia and the other Olera, two women who so happened she crossed souls with back in Gweza several days ago. Her cub, Samantha called out from the other side of the chamber. We are here. The dwarf and Judge Elown cried out. It is the shareholder, Olera cried. She recognized that voice and the strange garments that the lieutenant wore. The lieutenant descended down to the lowest possible level that was above the lava to find a way to reach them. All right let's get you all out here. Oh it's you two again. Samantha greeted the natives. We have sacrificed ourselves to allow as many people the time they needed to escape. So... If it is one more consolation before I perish, I will free you from the other world as grip. Carlia testified. Relona Maxima. She cast it from her hands, targeting the lieutenant. The spell is a powerful disenchantment spell that is designed to break through long-term spells such as enthrallment. The college mage knew she. Janris, Olera did as best as they could getting as many people trapped in these tunnels out to safety but now their time is up as they and ten other dwarves were now hopelessly surrounded by the erupting lava, but at the very least in spite of the doom sight they held a deep satisfaction of knowing that the last act they had done was the right thing, maybe then Tivna would welcome all of them gladly into her garden when they pass. Unfortunately, this shareholder, known to be an association of the otherworldly invaders had came to them to intervene for her own master's interests. 
This same spell was another form of magics that the lieutenant knew courtesy of Iris and Aliathra. It is said that if one was indeed enthralled via the enthrallment spell then they would have a feeling of waking up from a dream and regaining control of themselves. If the spell wasn't empowered enough to break the enchantment or there was no enchantment or begin with, the spell would have harmlessly passed through the lieutenant unscathed. So, she decided to end this debate once and for all and readied her disenchantment. The magical energies, as expected passed through her without so much as a light tickle, bewildering Carlyle as one of her most powerful spells was casually brushed off. H. How? Carlyle questioned. Enough of this demon crap please. I come here to save you all especially you Janris. Your mother Joru is safe with us. Samantha tells them. Mama? Mama made it out. Janris shook away from her fears upon the hearing of her mother's name. I am going to rescue all of you no matter what. Samantha vowed. What if you are deceiving us? You have been abducting people away with your dragons. Elan accused her. Look here. Samantha's nerves were struck violently by the natives' incessant accusations. Whether I am not corrupted or not does not matter now. We can talk more about this when we are safe now. I need to get you all out of here. She informed her of what is most important. How can you rescue us from here? Olayra asked the lieutenant. But then Samantha fully realizes the dire situation at hand. There was virtually no way of reaching the trapped natives without risking further the wrath of the voracious lava before her. It was too far for her air scooter to dash forward to in addition to her still relative inexperience in conjuring such an unstable spell without tripping and there were barely any rocks to work with that wouldn't risk further vexation from the lava. But how can she rescue them? The lava was not only dense but very voracious substance made of passionate fire. Fire. Samantha thought. She had the most thick-witted of gambles, activating her transmutation ability. Samantha carefully placed her hand onto the boiling lava itself. The infernal energy began to seep through her body, engulfing her in an outer shell of flames. Her suit began to drain its own energy trying to maintain her form as Sam realizes that she is still ultimately unharmed by having herself be engulfed in boiling hot lava. Without wasting a second, Samantha stepped her foot into the lava pool. Its dense state and the aforementioned transmutation she had done allowed her to safely run through the coral sea of lava unharmed. Warning, 150% energy consumption detected. Suggested action, mitigate all mana consumptive activity. Isaac warned the lieutenant. Her energy levels as Samantha monitored were being drastically depleted the longer, she fire walked atop of the lava. Alarmed by this, Samantha quickened the pace of her steps but the lava was clammy as it was gelatinous hampering the speed of movement and ergo increasing the time she spent walking dangerously above the infernal pool. She was determined despite the limitations of her suit to reach the survivors. Upon stepping on the floating rock crater that housed the last twelve survivors, Samantha went to work with her plan. She calculated based on her suit's exosuit capabilities that she has the capacity to safely carry over three people at a time to safety by having her slice off a piece of said rock crater before slowly pushing the boat-like object with survivors in total safety. It was about 50 meters between her and the rock crater in terms of distance. It would take about 30 minutes at the soonest to accomplish the task. Come on. Three at a time. Samantha ordered as she used her magics to create a boat-like platform for by slicing of the rock island's pieces off. At first, the survivors hesitated but after seeing the lava slowly starting to aggravate itself in the room, three brave souls decided to board the makeshift boat. Samantha ferried off the boat across the lava pool towards the safety of higher ground. It was grueling work but she can manage with deep breathing and meditative channeling of her arcane meridians she can reduce the amount of energy being fractioned off of her suit by about 30%. One more. Samantha muttered herself to enliven her spirit. She returned to the rock crater and repeated the process. Seeing that this stranger was clearly trying to rescue them from such an infernal fate, three more souls decided to board the rock platform. One more. Samantha again muttered to herself. Now halfway done, 
the lieutenant made her third trip back to rescue the second half of the survivors. Warning, mana energies are at 15%. Suggest recharge immediately. Isaac informed her. The AI's words did not dissuade her, nor the aching sores she began to develop on her muscles as she prompted the dwarven judge Elaun and his two sons onto her makeshift boat. Come on we have no time. Samantha yells at them. Why are you doing this? Elaun asked the lieutenant. What do you mean why? Samantha yelled. I went down here just to rescue everyone. I. Elaun was at the loss of words. Tears of disbelief fell down his eyes. Even Kalia. Olera and Janus too, they witness before them the very exhausted yet very tenacious lieutenant moving heaven and earth and braving the darkness of the volcano's wrath to save people still trapped by the voracious lava. Were the rumors false or was this some sort of clever deceit? No demons or their servants would go out of their way to do all of this, to save the people they consider as their enemies. Was Samantha really enthralled by the other worlders after all? Elaun seeing that none of the rumors of the other worlders being bloodthirsty devourers of souls promptly urged his sons to board Samantha's rock platform as the lieutenant pushed them away back to the other side of the chamber. Warning, mana energies are at 7%, depletion all suit functions are in danger of shutting down. Isaac warned her. Just. One. More. Samantha cooed. Her body was starting to finally wear and tear her mentally as she expended thousands of calories on herself to continue on this rescue attempt. There was really one more left to save. As she made her return trip, the ceiling of the chamber began to collapse as rocks fell down like rain below them. Sipag's mercy, Elaun swore. I, I, I know these tunnels. The nearest exit is the Nernkaram opening, Elaun said. Good. Go there. There is a friend that will help you there. Samantha nodded. A soft smile escaped her lips. Are you sure? Elaun asked of her. You can trust me. Samantha reassured her. Now go I will get the last survivors. The lieutenant pushed off her rock platform and proceeded to move towards the last three survivors still trapped in the lava chamber. Samantha's body began to grow heavy her limbs losing its unity and her heartbeat pace ending in vain effort to support her now drained body as she made it to Carlia's group before her Hecate suit finally gave out. Get dot in dot nnn, Samantha huffed. The toll on her body draining not only her intrinsic mana levels but also her own body calories. Her hands flailed limply, her eyes phasing in and out of cognizance. She tried to take off her helmet in a vain attempt to regain her senses but there was no difference in the feeling. She fell on her knees and collapsed before Kalia. Mana energies are at 5%. Energy saving mode activated. All unbinilium related functions are disabled. Remaining energy diverted to essential functions only. Isaac informed in a lower bass voice. Get up. Hurry. Please chosen one. Get up. Janus pleaded. Samantha's weakened form was barely responsive. Her world shrunk down to only her around her and the sounds in her immediate earshot as she neared the throes of death. But she hoped that if she could push herself hard enough for just a while longer he can make it out with the survivors. Unfortunately, she spoke too soon. A quick jolt from the quaking earth that formed the tunnel caused its rocks to collapse on the only tunnel out of the lava chamber. No, Samantha cried as she saw the last vestiges of escape closed off from her forever. S, a, w, w, go, on. Crocker's disrupted voice echoed on her radio. Despite the interference, Samantha knew what was he trying to say. I, I, can't. Samantha muttered. Sam. Crocker radioed. A quick correction of the frequency thanks to Clay straightened his communications line with the lieutenant. It took a special kind of tweaking from Strider's radium and to have their radio be able to penetrate to and from the underground. We need to dust off now. You got like 300 seconds tops to get out of there. The airship won't survive any longer here. He warned her. Fear began to grip the lieutenant as she weakly responded to her second in command. Sergeant Crocker, Strider. It so looks like that T there's no way out. Lava is coming up. And I'm trapped. It was an honor to serve each and every one of you, Abed, Ailey, Iris, Cain, Clay. 
you croc and even ds. I tried to save all I could. I did. I am sorry. I am so sorry. Samantha tearfully apologized on the radio. What? Crocker recoiled winced. No. 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 LT. LT. Sam. He cried. He cannot believe he was hearing this from the lieutenant after starting to warm up amiably with the young West Point graduate. I knew you would say that Croc. Sam smiled. The ceiling cracked above her as Malinari's gaze shone above the lava chamber allowing the partial escape of gases and radiant heat to leave the room whilst still allowing to see the star. Samantha smiled as she readied to see the angels that if she was to die, she will die seeing the sky above her one last time. This can't be Samantha. The crystal heart blessed you for great things. You can't perish today. The team cannot effort to lose you. Aliathra tearfully shouts on the radio, Neni Thulvaplik fee arthsh, she prayed to her goddess, you were my best companion this vampire ever had, you cannot die here now. Iris joined, there's still so much more we can do together. Clay added, you can't die here, not now. You have to think of something. You do. Crocker radioed, I'm sorry guys. Mana ran dry a moment ago and the lava trapped me. Get out of here and live for me, she urged them. Sergeant, we need to get everyone in this ship out of here or we are toast. The ship can't handle this much pressure. Captain Carplian yelled. Deep down, Croc knew that was the right choice, the most utilitarian choice. They have not only the rest of Strider group on board but also more than a dozen of civilians on board fearfully trusting their lives and hopes on them for salvation. But just as Crocker grievously cut off the radio to leave the lieutenant to her faith, the mick was instantly grabbed by Iris. Samantha Rose, what would your father and great ancestor Desmond and Leo Major would say? Did they ever give up despite the odds being stacked against them? You would dishonor their legacy if you perished today. Do you want me, Aliathra, Strider and your mother to cry on your empty grave because you gave up? Iris agitated the lieutenant. She is right. You are Aramar, the leader of Strider, we would all will fall apart without you. You and Iris are my friends, the only true and real friends that I never thought this princess would ever have. Don't be selfish and die here today, you must live. Live to see tomorrow, to see your home, to see your friends and family again. Aliathra added, you listen here Ed. I will be fucked if April not only loses her mother but her auntie Rose. Abidia screamed. We are here for you. Don't die on us and give up on yourself. The whole Strider team all replies in the radio. Guys, you are by far the greatest people I had ever met. Thank you. Now wait for me damn it. Samantha smiled. Her courage regained much to the pleased Strider group you three. You are all going to live. I promise. And to you Janris. I swear to God no matter what that your mother Joru doesn't bury you on an empty grave too. She pointed to the shocked Kalaya, Olera, and Janris. However, even with a newfound will to live, they still need to find a way out. The lieutenant raised herself in her mind to think of a plan to get out of this trap before it was too late. But how can we escape? We are still trapped here and without any magics we cannot do anything. Kalaya reminded her. Mana energies detected. 15 meters, 80 degrees west. Isaac informed her. The lieutenant turned her head and looked towards where the AI had pointed to her. From out of the inferno rose a geomantic node of the most brilliant of mana crystals her shareholder brand intrinsic thirst for mana can attest. It was a most unusual sight as the crystal was not the usual as your glow but gave a radiant crimson shine that sang to her. The lieutenant could see that there may be hope yet as her new energy consumptive instincts tell her that the strange variant of unvanillium can rejuvenate her fully upon consumption. She feebly stood up and using the last of her will and mana reserves, she activated the Hecate suit's transmutation functions as she walked across the lava pool hazardously towards the crystal using the very last bits of strength. Mana energies level at 5%, 4%, 3%, 2%. .2 Isaac warned her, come on red. Push. Samantha spurred herself. She knew that the moment her suit finally gave in, she would lose her protection against the lava and be killed instantly by its vehement embrace. 
She tried to reach the red unbinilium but it was just out of reach. This woman, Carly murmured, hearing the shareholder speak with what she assumes were her friends on some sort of magic message spell coaxed her greatly. The shareholder, in spite of them being enemies truly was trying to rescue them. Giving up her mana and was about to sacrifice herself to save all she could. Virtually nothing of the characteristics from the naive and brash faith Len. Where the bane would cower the shareholder would be steadfast. When the bane would gloat, the shareholder would be meek. When the bane fights for glory, the shareholder fights to protect those whom she loved and cares for. Olayra too was equally moved. The way she had talked with the voices of the people that echoed around her made the pedantic girl realize that she did not see her as a tool, weapon or a servant to their designs. But a friend, a follower, a companion. What shook her and Carlia's preconceived beliefs is that the otherworldly demons all behaved just like them not as bloodthirsty and heartless demons and their words sound truly genuine with zero lies or deception. Maybe they had severely misjudged the shareholder and to the same extent the vampire, Princess Aliathro and the otherworlders. This woman was more than the stories of the heroes of old could be and more. The Crystal Heart did not choose poorly after all. Almost there. You heroes ain't dying on my watch. Sam reassured them. Wah, I thought I was doing the right thing. But we are all about to die. I thought I could be a great hero like you chosen one. But all I did was get myself trapped with other people on this stupid rock. Olayra cried. Don't you see that you have to rescue me, Carlia and Janris? She is right. You are the only hero here. Janris added. You're not useless. Samantha turned to Janris and Olayra. By trying to save the trapped people alone already makes you all heroes even if you risk all of you getting trapped too. Pardon? Olayra asked. You think I wake up every day so I can just be the shareholder because of what? Some big crystal heart thing tells me who I am? Samantha asked them. The women responded with a denying nod. I am not measured by what that. Whatever from some fancy cathedral. The title of Chosen One is just that. A title. It's what where your heart and your actions do in its name is what makes a hero, she explained. Look at you. Despite this volcano erupting you still came back to rescue more people. That makes you a better hero than that prick you call the Bane. Ola and Janra cry heavily at the beautiful words by Sam, especially Ola as faithfully never say that to her. Carlia too shed a single jubilant tear. This shareholder truly deserved to call herself a hero. Carlia humbly lowered her head as she stood up. Her self-doubts restraining her now set free upon seeing the lieutenant's heroic actions. Samantha soon began to slowly sink into the lava as her legs start to uncontrollably twitch as her exhaustion has reached a lethal level as the very last of her mana energy is depleted. However, even if she feels she about to die she has to reach the crystal. Mana energies recharging to 5% 10% Isaac informed her. Samantha's heart skipped a beat, she wasn't siphoning the mana energies of the red crystal just yet. She turned around to see that the college mage Carlia was releasing her own reserves of mana to transfer onto Samantha to regenerate the last bits of energy she needs to reach the Unbinilium crystal. Save us chosen one, Carlia whispered to Samantha. Thanks to Carlia's exchange, Samantha finally reached the crystal. The Hecate suits arcane meridians then proceeded to hungrily consume its energies as its battery reserves recharged almost instantaneously. A surge of mana flowed through Samantha, reinvigorating as it was re-exciting her bones, muscles, mind, and spirit like a second awakening of a new dawn. This red unbinilium aroused her nothing close to what the standard blue ones were. The rather unpredictable energies made the magics unstable but much more powerful in output. Like a phoenix rising from the ashes and like the timely intervention of a guardian angel. As if by the mere thought of flying away from the danger, Samantha unknowingly behind her sprouted wings from her back, conjured by magics as her eyes glowed in blazing white as she turned to the three girls who excitedly saw her transcendent transformation. Hold on tight. 
it's gonna be a bumpy ride. Samantha grabbed the girls by the hand. The three promptly held onto her warm soft grip as the lieutenant soared above the ceiling, crashing through its barrier and making it out of the mountain with great big blast from its rooftop causing a sonic boom of dust and dirt to trail behind them. Sam, no. Crocker radioed in on despair as he saw the mountain exploded. Their Super Osprey airship forced to fly out of the danger zone just as the mountain became overrun with shattering lava. Look over there. Clay pointed to the angelic red wings that sprouted from a bubble-like ward. Upon an enhancing zoom, they could see Samantha being the source of those magical wings and powering the protective ward. LT. All of Strider cheered. Samantha made it out. We're flying. Olayra squealed. Yes. We are indeed an infant. Carlia smiled at her junior. Flying? I didn't know I can fly. Samantha confessed. But just as soon as she disbelieved, her wings suddenly dissipated and gravity, as cruel as the mistress she took over their bodies as they began to plummet below the ground. Hold on. Samantha cried as she frantically cast Featherfall on all three of the survivors before placing the enchantment on herself. They landed haphazardly close to each other by a mountain stream a good and safe distance away from Nankarim, landing upon the still blooming mountain grass and flowers. Is everybody okay? Samantha asked everyone. The calm breathing of Janris, Carlia and Olayra confirmed her optimism that they managed to survive their escape. We are saved by the gods. We are still alive. Olayra cheered. Well now I know what that bard meant by flying can be so inspiring. Janris chuckled, a bit sore. But nothing a cleric couldn't fix. Carlia nodded as she stood up and stretched her back. Are you okay too shareholder? She turned to the chosen one. She still looks as fine as newborn foal. That's for sure. Janris commented. She and Olayra collectively hugging the lieutenant in deep appreciative gratitude to her. Samantha. Call me Samantha. The lieutenant gently tells her. Just a bit of mana exhaustion. But I'm alright. Just need to rest my legs. Who are you really Sam? I finally realized that the campire and Aliathra never actually enthralled you to be a demonic servant. But who are you exactly? Carlia asked her. That I am sure you are not from the Empire. You lack the Vigorian accent. Olayra nodded. Are you from the Southern Frontier? I am not from here. Samantha said. I am not from here. This planet I come from another world. I am what you described so much about another worlder. The very same ones you are trying to fight against. Samantha explained. And those voices. It's called a radio. It allows me to talk to people from far distances. Think your Twitter bird messages but without the magic. Planet? What is a planet? Olayra asked. This was wholly different terminology she never heard before. A planet? Is well. To but it lightly. Like a world. Your planet, your entire world is all of the easier, with all the places you live. Places known and unknown. Samantha explained. As I said earlier, I come from another world, so another planet. Fascinating. Tell me more. Olay repressed her. Carlyle's eyes widened in alarm by the implications of what the lieutenant said. This woman came from another world. Someone not born into Glee easier. The crystal heart made you. Its chosen one? That's impossible. Janris reeled in astonishment, letting go of her embrace. Don't be so callow Janris. The sacred crystal heart works in mysterious ways. Carlyle reprimanded her. Yeah. You sounded just like Haleathra and Iris too. Samantha snickered. So if you are indeed another worlder, why did you come to Gleesia a weary traveler? Janris asked. We thought this place was uninhabited, safe for colonization. But our scout was deceived. Somehow, by some magics made by the Slaegean Empire, we thought we landed on some uninhabited plains but instead we touched down on what is now Tyrian. Thankfully we quickly befriended the local prince, a prince Klovich, wrote a treaty with him that we would all peacefully coexist with each other. Samantha explained. Colonize? What is that word? Janris asked. It means to occupy an unclaimed land. The empire had been doing such an endeavor at the southern frontier decades ago. Olayra explained. 
At first we wanted to just live in peace but the Slay Eaten Empire along with their Alliance of the Light and their stupid prophecy made by some old fool branding us as demons from the beginning without understanding who we really are and attacked us blindly out of irrational fear and ignorance. They forced our hands in Suvil and Tyrian and many other incidents. We have no choices but to go our ways to stop and dismantle the Slay Agents permanently to defend ourselves and other innocent people who are caught in the crossfire and killed for no good reason. Samantha explained. So that explains that steel cloud that came to Haring Point weeks ago to issue that warning? Carlyle said. That's what you call it? Sam was slightly amused by the primitive interpretations that the natives came up for their ships. But yeah, the Aurora Spa. I mean flying ship was sent by us to warn you to stand down or face the wrath of our war machine, Samantha explained. As Carlyle heard Sam's words she started to have some level of doubt about the apocalyptic prophecy since thinking back about the first arrival of the I-Demon. She actually didn't actually detect any demonic signature from that entity. Further study by the college's demonologist had been a fruitless endeavor as they themselves don't even know if it is actually a demon or not since as they described it to be a peculiar block of strange metal with weird strings. They tried all the holy magic on it and had no effect on it. Furthermore, their endeavor to deceive the demons from coming to Gleesia was not worked at all since the other worlders didn't actually behave like demons seeking souls to devour after all. But then she remembered about the previous attack's plan to relay the attempts to halt the demonic's expansion into Gleesia with the aforementioned attacks in Tyrian and Suvil. To her horror she reasoned that due to such an attack, the other worlders had the moral high ground to justify a full-blown invasion of the Empire. In their quest to stop the end of times, they had only ensured its fulfillment. Are you okay? Samantha asked Carlyle. I am fine. I just need a moment to breathe. Carlyle sighed. She beat her chest trying to release the regret filling herself on her body to feign coughing out any irritants that managed to penetrate to her lungs. The lieutenant nodded. I have to return now to New Albany right now especially with you Janris. Your mother is waiting for you there. Samantha smiled. Sarge, it's Sam. We made it. I need extraction at my position now for four people. The lieutenant radioed. Roger that LT we got a lock on your position. Let's get your blokes out of there. Crocker smiled. She attempted to stand up but the moment her feet went upright they cramped forcing her to collapse on the ground. Subject to diagnosis. Extreme muscle fatigue detected. Recommend course of action. Immediate extraction for tissue restoration therapy. Isaac informed her. Damn. Samantha meekly cursed. The AI was indeed right however. She does need some time for respite. Request if I can bring home some flowers. Yeah Crooker. I am gonna want to see something nice on my window when I get back to New Albany. She snickered. Flowers? Carlyle ticked. The college mage looked around you and noticed that there was a distinct flower bed filled with purple broad glows. A distinct flower found at the climate conditions between the hinterlands and lower altitude slopes. In the southern areas of the Isleroks, the only known area where such a flower exists would be right at the crossing between the stream Sipag's Tears and the old brewery where she would have supposed to meet Findrum and the rest of her entourage right about now. Praise be to the gods. You two have captured the shareholder and rescued my niece. I am grateful to you both. Findrum jovially laughed as he appeared before them and addressed Carla and Olera. The dwarf monster hunter was followed suit by Petra and the rest of the Imperial Crusaders. Their hands, holding nets, cuffs and other forms of restraints readying to grasp on her for capture. Samantha quietly drew her pistol as her fight or flight senses surged through her body. She was surrounded by the natives and she was under no circumstances must be captured alive. She quietly turned on a small beacon on her chest rig to alert her incoming squad mates that she was in grave danger. Oh no Findrum. It is the shareholder who rescued us. Olera corrected. What? That can be right. She is in league with the other worlders after all. No matter. We have her now. Let us bring her back to Haring Point now this instance. Petch recoiled before immediately regaining his composure. No, I cannot let you have her. Especially the ones that abandoned the people in the first place. 
Janrus stands in front of the Slaegians and spread her hands wide to protect Samantha. My dear niece, step aside. We need her to fight the demons. This woman is the key to the Alliance's salvation. Findrim gently asked her, for not the honor of the dwarves but for the safety of the clan. There are no demons. We have been wronged all this time, Janrus pleaded. No, they are. They have been herding our people into their metal dragons to be taken away for their soul-eating rituals. Pecha protested. No, they did not. They were rescuing the people that straggled behind our flight away from the volcano. The dwarf defended her statement. No, oh no. By the gods. Findrim stuttered. You are enthralled by the other worlders too, he cried. Carlia, restrain the dwarf immediately. We need to break her free from the shareholder's wiles. Petra ordered. You do not understand. You will only hear the same from me and Olera. Stand down you two. This had been all a big misunderstanding I tell you. I need to speak with the Grand Master immediately. There is something I need to discuss with him. Carlyle pleaded. We will when he capture the shareholder. Petra swore. Stand back. I am warning you. Samantha aimed down her pistol and held a grenade at one hand. Her aim was rickety at best due to her exhaustion and not helping matters is that she also knew the price of what will happen if they retrieve not only her alive but the Hecate suit intact. Sees her. Findrim told the Crusaders. He stepped forward, gripping his lasso as he is ready to toss it towards the lieutenant. Samantha took aim ready to fight to her very last breath and bullet. Uncle please. Janrus strafed suddenly in front of her uncle, shielding the lieutenant from the monster hunter. You will imprison her. She doesn't deserve to be in chains after all that she had done. The young dwarven maiden grabbed hold of him, pleading him to not take another step forward. Let go Janrus. Findrim struggled with her knees and suddenly he threw her at great force at the nearby sharp rock causing her to fall on her head on the sharp rock killing her instantly as the impact cracks snapped her neck. Janris, Findrim, Carlia, Olera and Samantha shouted. Carlia rushed towards Janris' side, using her Findrim rushes at his niece and tries to desperately to wake her up but her body remained lifeless and unresponsive. Carlia tries to use what left of her mana to heal her to no prevail, her wound to instantaneously fatal for her to be repair. The Dwarven Maiden once filled with life fell dead on her beloved uncle's stout arms as the monster hunter lay there in shock. Seeing eye to eye, her emerald eyes slowly drain away, one of the few joys he had in his venerable life being snuffed away in an instant. What have you done? Olayra screamed. What have I done? No, what have you done to my niece you demon scum? Findrim growled. With his temper boiling to a berserk. He grabbed his axe and with a vengeful drive he readied the blade upwards to the sky to cut down the lieutenant in half. You killed your own niece. You monster. Sam calls her out. Her weakened state diminishing the volume of her voice. No. You enthralled her to do your bidding. To lure more souls to feed your demonic masters. I am gonna make you pay. I will avenge my Janris. Findrim stubbornly refused to listen to reason as he rushes towards the lieutenant with his Actocolite axe. Die monster, he battle cried. Carlia and Ola rush into to stop only for him to swing the blunt side of his weapon at both of them knocking them out cold. Findrim no, we need her alive. Petra rushed at Findrim to stop him. Sam, a bee dire radioed as he fired his sniper rifle at the dwarf. The .338 Lapua bullet struck the dwarven monster hunter at his left eye causing him to reel back on the shock as he held on to his wound. The wind began to pick up as Captain Carplian Superosprey hovered above the Imperial Crusaders. Get Lieutenant out of there, Crocker ordered. Cain, Diaz and Iris jumped out of the airship and under the cover fire of Crocker and Captain Carplian converged quickly on Samantha's position. Cain quickly grabbed the lieutenant in a fireman's carry as he heaved her back to the safety of the airship. Several Imperials were killed yet the sergeant and the pilot practiced restraint as they didn't want to open fire more bullets than they had to for it was only to bewilder the natives long enough until the lieutenant was safely extracted to the super -upsary. Carlia quickly regained consciousness from the blunt strike earlier looked on in awe-inspired horror as the metal dragon escaped the legion's arrow fire, flying away south to where the other world a stronghold of Tyrion is. 
Carlia Silverdain, you have failed. Faith Len emerged from the crowd of shaken Legion heirs. Faith Len, we must return to Harring Point. I must speak with the Grand Master at once. The college mage explained herself, but she received a quick and rather impulsive left fist to her torso by the Bane Chosen One. Faith Len. That is no way to address a senior of the College of Magi. Petra restrained the boy. She failed again. Why are you still here? You are supposed to capture her. Now the shareholder will continue to harass our armies for another day in the name of her demonic master. Gods damn you Carlia. He cursed. Carlia, what is going on here? Petra asked her. He wouldn't believe that his very erudite friend would just be so easily bested nor deceived by anything in his experience working with her. As I said Petra. We must gallop due haste to the capital. There is something I need to discuss with the Grand Master. Carlyle said. What so? Mita asked. There is more to this end times prophecy than it seems. Carlyle said. I see. Take a horse and hurry ahead to the capital. Someone. Get a cleric to attend to find him and his niece at once. We shall catch up with you. Petra ordered. But what about replenishing our men? Carlyle asked. I can entrust a friend to act on my stead. This trip back to the capital better be worth it. Petra gnashed his teeth as he dragged Faith Len away to have him cool down from his outburst. I sure hope by the gods it is. We must find out some answers before if we are to avert a disaster. Carlyle acknowledged Petra's concerns. Meanwhile back at Captain Carplian's ship. Lieutenant Rose was now safely aboard the Super Osprey alongside a couple dozen of Astlerisii survivors. We did it. Today is a victory for the youth. We rescued people and saved the lieutenant. Clay cheered, yet Samantha remained despondent. She stared into her two hands blankly, imagining the innocent blood of Janra slaying wet before her hands. An innocent life, filled with everything coming along ahead of her just like her in a way, snuffed out in one instant. My daughter, my sweet daughter, where is my Janris? Jor who asked of her, the woman whom she placed her prayers to finding her child. Samantha only looked dead straight on the dwarf's sagely eyes with the same blank stare. No words were needed to relay what was being said. No, Jor who wailed, her cries reverberating the inside of the airship. Jor my dear, calm down, let me mourn with you. Elan who happened to be able to board the Super Osprey with his sons and the other nine lava chamber survivors. The kindly judge led the woman away leaving Samantha to fully swallow her failure to save her. No, no it wasn't. Samantha told Clay before burying her face beneath her two hands as she sobbed herself all the way back to New Albany. Chapter 47, The Grand Plan, Youth Perspective, Subjects, Citizens, and Fellow Nobles. I greet you all as your sovereign prince who now has safely returned from the other side of the great sky. Clovich formally greeted the great gathering of the public of the Principality of Tyrian at our half square. Today, after a few days of extra fortuitous delays was the day as clear as crystal and as blue as the ocean. At this hour for Clovich's formal return from his fruitful travels from Earth. The skies were bright albeit with shading of silver today thanks in part to the newly arrived Maximoff Engineering Corporation shielding the Principality from the worst effects of the Astorok volcano eruption that is still going strong. In the meanwhile, today is a day of jubilation. Many people from all walks of life were encouraged to gather before him from the noble peers Clovich had known since he was a child, to the intrepid merchants and craftsmen and all the way down to the humble peasantry, fresh from their crop harvests came to see their rulers face once again. All classes of men were lured into this great assembly for the same interest, a better tomorrow as the heralds ballyhooed. Even several dwarven refugees who had found the time after setting up their temporary housing outside of the citadel walls were even encouraged to attend to. Most of them had only seen great improvement with their continued friendship with the youth, the upper class having security, middle class the prospects of added prosperity, the lower class the idea that of a better life beyond their squalid selves. All seemed too good to be true under normal circumstances. Even straight up impossible to dream after the previous events that had transpired but the sky people continued to surprise them every turn in various shows of charity, unmatched leadership and resilience. 
Today on the 17th day of the fruitful moon, I declare the commencement of the first ever new Zanagrad Congress, Prince Klovich answered, a congress, you mean like the Senate in Herring Point? One of the attending nobles questioned. Indeed, the prince nodded, but let me say this right now so that I may show you that I am still one with those of my kin. My fellow people, I share your pain through these tough times as I also share the burden of rebuilding the realm back to its former glory. As you have seen many innocent lives were lost in both Tyrian and New Albany, many families were vanquished or torn apart. Many parents have to bury their children and many children are forced to live a sad life without the warmth and embrace of their mothers and fathers, he continued, his voice sinking solemnly to share in his lamentations of those perished. The culprit of all these tragedies was none other than our liege lord, whom we swore fealty to serve for centuries, the Slaegeans Empire and their elven allies the Ethylon Entente. For as long as I live I will not stop until justice has been served to all who dared ordered the warrant of our attempted destruction. My dear friends, subjects and guests, I dare say that what I saw beyond made me realize that, and although I may be hung for treason, that the Slaegean Empire, has grown fat and mired in its decadence and indolence to what heaven aspired gly easier to be. Klovich raised his voice and announced. The united uproar stirred among the crowds as they were still filled with confusion, shock, and deep rage over the previous events that seemed to cycle past them like a raging storm. Many people questioned that why the emperor and the elves could do such horrific things to the people of this, now once, loyal vessel, and for what reason? the purpose for them to commit such cowardly acts on our realm and to induce untold numbers of suffering on our people is because of the utter nonsense come from the stupid mouth of the so-called Grand Master of the College when he casted an untested spell known as clairvoyance that dictated that our great benefactor, the youth were demons who came to devour this world and corrupt and consume the souls of all living beings in it, however, does the youth ever act like demons to us? Do they try to devour our souls or raise the principality to ground like the demons of the old? He urged the crowd to answer for him. No, the attendees cried because of them. My family have never been safer. They rid of the bandits and the monsters hounded us farmers. But now even I and my neighbors can farm without an ounce of fear. Ever, a farmer declared. They built road that is smoother for our wagons and horses to move and they keep us safe for free. Unlike the adventurers, a commoner adds on. What did the Empire give us other than their protection? Nothing. A knight joined his voice with the discordant crowd. So I say, oh so I dare say, Emperor Alden and all the Slaegean Empire are nothing more but tyrants masquerading as an empire from their opulent towers they deceive, choke and destroy the realm. The mandate of heaven has abandoned them they must fall so a new phoenix may rise from its ashes to guide the realm into the next age, and I do dare say once again that a new mandate of to dictate the fate of Sanigrad, if not the whole of Gleesia has fallen to me, to the Ryans, to all of the subjects of Tyrian to carry the torch towards that new future, the crowd began to applaud in cheers over their lord's zealous words, sharing the same cheer as he speaks, for I have seen a new world beyond. One of the other world is designs free from the shackles of fear and want, that world being the nation of the UFA. Prince Klovich honored two of his most esteemed guests to stood by the prince's side, Governor White and Mr. Thomas Sight. A brief standing ovation set forth for them was given. The so-called coming of the new age as foretold by the Jeltogaz Comet is a divine intervention. A new destiny for all of Gleesia starting here in Tyrian until all of the world bows down before the new mandate of heaven. The people of Tyrian will be no more just another rock on the river, why be the rock if we have the chance to become a mountain? The people that will open forth the gate towards a new age. With my vision, the mandate of heaven on our backs, and the help of our new allies. Klovich took a deep breath. His next words once spoken publicly to his subjects, can never be taken back. His time learning and even still learning the ways of the other world as eccentrics and sciences culminated to this moment. It is all in for what he desires or forever be left in obscurity. I Prince Clovitrian, vassal sovereign of Tyrian to announce a new mandate, a new era, 
the Rai Ani amelioration, an era mandating new dawn of peace, prosperity and stability unrivaled that of Kul Dost Lai Ejak sold reign for not only Tyrian, not only for the empire but for all of Gleesia, he fervently declared. A boom of thunderous cheers echoed throughout our half-square. The speech was going perfectly for the prince. Mr. Seitz's advice on what words to say was most helpful indeed to incite his people to openly support on what is essentially a rebellion, unlike that is seen in the empire's history. For it was not a peasant's revolt, nor a dissatisfied subject's insurrection. It was a full-on mandate war where only one side will come out of the battlefield, the winner dictating the course of history for Gleesia for eras to come. For this new age to work, we must all come together hand in hand so we may draft a new decree, a treatise that will become the foundation of our new treaty. I ask all of the nobles, the trade merchants, the craftsmen, the knights and the peasantry to select at least three representatives among each group to be invited inside the UFA embassy for much needed discussions and to be seated on my new round table. He tells the crowd, choose wisely for they will be the vanguard to our new future that it is in my greatest prayers that we walk together forward to. A long silence followed as many of the said classes of people of Tyrian whispered amongst themselves who among their own would exemplify for them and their interests. The more educated among them realize that what the prince beneath his flowery words was really saying is that he is opening new office slots sharing his power amongst his subjects. The ambitious among them wish to climb the social ladder whilst others believe that they can truly do meaningful good in such a position. Before long fifteen men approached the stage and bowed down humbly to Prince Klovich. We men of Tyrian, most graciously accept your invitation. You humble us so great prince with your summons. A man dressed in a stately garb said. Klovich recognized that man's voice, Jura scion of the Gonra family, the most influential noble family in Tyrian second to the Rians themselves. Their lineage originally helped the ruling Rian family establishing the principality during its early days as a conquered territory of the empire such as building the famous walls that had protected the citadel for centuries and financing a significant portion of the local men-at-arms that garrison its fortifications. Second to him were the merchants, one such significant character being Lulia Amirian himself, the famous dwarven merchant who was already making his waves with his caravans through and about the principality, his second home. He is considered quite begrudgingly by the local humans to be the richest citizen of Tyrian, even more, well off than both the Rians and the Gonras, representing the knights. The military arm of the principality is the knight commander himself who quite frankly his armor was gleaming brightly as it reflected from the golden lady's gaze, Sir Bardimag, a former adventurer from the imperial mainland now turned native Tyranny. He was given knighthood years ago by Klovich's father, Jed Elkors when he saved his life during a massive siege versus an Orsish Khan who had ransacked the principality. Badu an adventurer hired as a Silzord back then managed to slay dozens of the Khan's best warriors with his crossbow before slaying the rapacious barbarian himself in mortal combat by decapitating him with his Bardish. For his valor, he was given a knighthood and a plot of land to call his own. Eventually, he climbed said ranks of the Tyranni hierarchy to become knight commander of the citadel. His days included organizing patrols of the guards investigating public disturbances, and accounting for the day-to-day -day operations of all the guards' physical well-being. Two characters piqued Klovich's notice for the representatives of the craftsman guilds. One is a sweet old lady by the name of Emma Travel. Nicknamed the Weaver her callous and thin hands created some of the finest folk trinkets in all of Tyrian from fabrics, baskets, and trinkets. She had held important positions in a variety of different guilds throughout her long life and Klovich was honestly surprised she still has some vigor left in her to undertake this latest endeavor. The second person was more of a new arrival that was a product of the recent dwarven diaspora coming down from the north escaping the volcano. A judge Elown if he remembered Mirian's introduction to him earlier, representing the dwarven craftsmen consisting of blacksmiths and leather workers who decided to settle down at Tyrian when Klovich reluctantly opened his arms to receive the refugees. Although many stayed, 
Tyrian was simply too small or in the case of some dwarves not dwarfen enough for several of the refugees to be accommodated fully. Yesterday about 500 Astorisii migrated south towards the Southlands, the Empire's frontiers where several Stlaeagian colonies, savage tribes, and empty lands unclaimed and untamed for those adventurous enough to make their own. It was sort of expected that their dwarf and stubbornness wouldn't fully accept the United Federation's hand in aid just yet, but he did wish them all safe travels as their caravans left the citadel gates. Speaking about meeting expectations, one of the representatives of the peasantry, the chieftain of Lily village by the name of Hatantor, a very successful Chrismillo berry farmer who is beloved throughout the local peasantry for his wisdom and philanthropy. He and his two fellow chieftains were perhaps the most humbly dressed of the representatives, wearing dirtied and slightly hand-mended clothing. No, you humble me all of you. He bowed back, for you are all of Tyrion's best and brightest. He praised them. He lead them towards the United Federation's embassy through its heavenly-like air-cooled halls and rich aesthetics to a conference room that had an encompassing view of the Tyriani cityscape complete with the youth's many-ringed flag standing co-equally with the Tyriani heraldry of a red and green windmill, a round table where each representative group had three chairs designated to them including the prince too. Friends, subjects and the most esteemed great thinkers, I welcome you to the first Sainagradic Congress. He introduced the event to the chosen representatives. From this day forth all of you are to be called the first council of the new Zanigrad. Today we are going to draft together the first constitution of Zanigrad. Clovich added, a consti, too. Juragonru attempted to pronounce that exotic sounding word in vain, a constitution. It is a treatise that will help form how our new Tyrian and the new Zanigrad will be legally governed. It contains rules of what your government can do and not do. Governor White abbreviated. Not. Do. Juro twitched his eyebrows. I am quite content with our current system as it is. He proclaimed. Gonra, you have to trust my volition on this. What I have seen on earth made me realize that the current system cannot stand as it is. It needs to be reformed or we could potentially all wither to exist. I had made my first draft of our new constitution already based on what I and my advisers learn from Earth, but I need your consultations about it before I can place my seal onto it. Can you just listen to me, for now, all of you? The prince says. Very well. This better be favorable to me and my fellow nobles. He swayed his hands ushering Clovich to continue. Clovich took a deep breath and rang a bell from his side. A servant girl passed along him a cylindrical container that he popped open the lid on top of it to bring forth a great large piece of paper that he lay on the round table's surface for all of his councillors, legislators and delegates to assess. There was a set of new rules, rights, and regulations that each social class should follow under Ryanian's new rule, general. All living intelligent beings will have the same rights as humans, elves, dwarves etc. That means that all races, regardless of origin are equal in rights, responsibility, and opportunities such as green skin, vampires or other beastmen. All races have the equal ability to work in any work or training without disbarment. Any form of discrimination will be penalized. Nobility. All nobles are now 100% accountable for all misdoings and crimes against civilians and no immunity. If they damage people properties, they compensate for damages fully and be accountable for no matter the level of damages. Any nobles or their family member violate the civilians of any kinds, murders, rape, assault or battery will be prosecuted and depend on the severity shall be sentenced with imprisonment or execution. Bureaucratic positions will no longer be limited to noble families. Non-nobles who are well-educated, trained and capable can avail for the position based on their merit of competency and knowledge they have. These positions are demarcated amongst many sectors of the new Zanagrad territories that genuinely represents the overwhelming majority of citizenry. 
This will be done through a selection process known as the three top downs and three up bottoms where prospects must rally the support of not only their supporters whom they claim they represent but also through an independent council of observers who will evaluate the basis of the comments and suggestions of all quarters where the prospective candidates will go through a thorough selection process before being approved for government duty. After the war with the empire is over. The Ryanian amelioration regime will be changed to a constitutional monarchy with youth constitution will be used as the basis to make the new Zanigad constitution. A parliament will be organized Clovich will appoint first ministers to manage the country while the royalty retreats to do ceremonial duties. Democracy will be established as the citizenry will vote for ministers to represent their interests in the parliament. Merchants. Abolishment of slavery. Anyone whether merchant or lord who is caught engaging in the act of owning like property another living and sentient being which is the definition of the act of slavery will be prosecuted. All slavers who voluntarily release all of their slaves or convert their slaves into full-time workers under payroll will be compensated by the new regime so they can invest in other form of businesses. All slaves throughout all Gleesia are henceforward shall be free and that the new Ryanian amelioration mandate including its army, navy and bureaucracy will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. Temporary banning trades with anyone from the Slaeetan Empire until they are defeated. In the meantime, the merchants will trade strictly with the youth. All merchants will be trained and educated in the art of industrialization and modern service. Knights and the men at arms guards of Tyrian. Immediate dissolution of the Knights Circle of Tyrian and the Tyriani guards to be reformed into a new army called the Luo Ed Arfagnuid Zanigrad, abbreviated as Lania. All unified under the command by Prince Clovich. Knighthood will be now an honorary title with zero privilege and it will change from sir to sir. All members of the Lania will be trained to use firearms and military vehicles and modern 23rd century warfare stratagems and tactics all funded and overseen by the United Federation's armed forces. They will be compensated greatly up to the same standards as their youth thief counterparts according to their ranks and merits. Craftsmen the blacksmiths will be advised not to make weapons anymore since youth and the megacorps will supply weaponry for Tyrion's Lania from now on. They are forbidden to illegally make any kinds of weaponry and sell outside Tyrion. They are encouraged to make trinkets and artistic stuffs to sell to youth market. Craftsmen that are mages shall be recruited to make enchantments on youth weaponry. Peasantry Compulsory education of all children. Truancy charges will be enforced with citizenry. Upon adulthood must learn to read and write. Education until high school will be free sponsored by youth. All peasants will have the same rights, freedoms to access safe and clean drinking water, sanitation and food supplies. Clovich sighed after he decreed his propositions to his subjects. He knew his reforms would be radical at best, blasphemous at worst. The Meiji Restoration, as he had studied in Japan was not an easy feat. It was a revolution from the inside that will upend the old order, and some people would not be ready to see this new future become the new normal upon their first and quite frankly upsetting collision with these radical changes. The prince looked on, unsurprisingly at the faces of Jirogon, Sabadu, Ledui Travel who lay frozen in disoriented abashment. Is dot is this some kind of sick joke? Juragon gobbled conceitedly. This new regime seeks to undermine his family and other noble families' powers. What did I do to deserve this? Have I failed you, my lord? Sir Bardu panted panickingly. His new rights sounded more like a punishment than an alleviation. I I oh, I do not understand this. The old weaver Imitravel grasped her aching head. You are asking me to cut ties with my... I mean our paying customers? For how long? What are we talking about again? Chieftain Dor meekly raised his voice. He too doesn't understand what he just read. He thought in his simple-minded brain he was getting a tax relief at best and a better system of aid for the farming folks that he represents. Not this free education whatever it is. In general, the entire room was in a state of uproar, their anger directed towards the prince. Only Luya Amirian and Judge Elaun did not comment. 
their silence showing their consent to these new rules. Order, order, order. Prince Klovich gaveled for silence. This constitution is beyond disgraceful. Nothing more but complete yielding to the other worlders. Juragonra protested. The knights will take arms against you if this becomes law. Sir Bard added. Prince Klovich said. Be quiet. Thomas Sight, in an uncharacteristic move from his calm and calculating demeanor, raised his voice which successfully and unknowingly silenced the clamorous gathering as intended. The attaché coughed his breath for a moment before tidying the tie around his neck as he stood up unwaveringly, his mask calm yet calculating at the delegates. This is only, as the prince said, a draft, a prototype, a first attempt to write something meaningful a test to show how this draft in its current incarnation would fare when shown to the representatives of its intended demographics, who are you nobles, knights commoners etc. He reminded everyone. A draft can be changed, we can compromise right here and now, or for the next few days about what can be added or removed in this paper. Sir Bardu, Lord Gonra, you are by far the most dismayed by what you have read am I correct? He asks them. Indeed. Us nobles are upset. Juro haughtily huffed. We, nobles act as the shepherds to the commoners which are sheep to keep society working orderly thanks to our superior prowess in all fields. Without us, the commoners will become blinded by lack of direction, resulting in chaos and the collapse of order. Therefore, we are the only ones who know how to maintain society intact so giving power to the commoners is absurd because they know nothing about managing a society. He argued, listen Lord Gonr listen to me. I know your family and the rest of the nobility gave invaluable support to my father and my grandfather throughout the history of our realm and I still value your sage advice when I ascended to the throne. He reassured his stance to the noble leader, but times are changing now Gonr. If we do not reform, adapt, reshape our society into a modern like that of the other worlders, we will forever be under the Empire's shadow, to be used as their toys as they please. I still do not understand. John Rushuk, let me ask you, did the Empire or even ourselves build a city on par with that of New Albany? Did such a city that provided so much abundance that no man must worry from want and fear? The Federation showed us that there is more to our lives than reaping the earth for centuries for meager gains whilst being bedeviled by those that slither in the dark like monsters and bandits. How many of such societies, states or even empires share such new designs instead of locking them behind away from our reach? The Slaegians with their imperial armories? The Ethylon and their fertilizer? The Suzerains and their Carabaer paint? Clovich appealed. If we continue to rest on our pride and close ourselves to those that is new, strange and foreign, then we will perish like parable of the two wolf cubs. The tardy one died while the heedful one became grew up to become the pack leader. I see, you are the world as Thomas have your excellence. Juro acknowledged. Yet the nobles still will not stand giving our privileges to and having the commoners gain power over us. They know nothing on how to run a society, he argued. For that I can agree but with our education and enlightenment programs, the people of Tyrian and the whole Enigad will have the knowledge and expertise to contribute to the administration of the realm. The problem is that the average people of Gleesia have far lower intellectual level than our worlds to actually understand how society works, Thomas Counter argued. Thankfully my colleagues from the Bureau of Education will gladly see to that. He is right. In their world, everyone, regardless of who they are, how old they are and how favored they are, they are all literate and all of them can do great feats of thinking that left me and my greatest advisors left in awe of. Klovich confessed. He remembered the time he lost to a Japanese child of no older than a decade in an arithmetic problem during his tour with Emperor Shinharu to a typical Japanese grade school. If I may my lord, Sir Bardu raised, but what of the knights? You plan to dismantle our circles and have us on the same standing as the guards? He asked. Sir Bardu, you have served the Rayani family for decades to protect this land until your dying breath when my father... Jedal cause knighted you. Now is the time to renew that oath you had made to my him years ago with me. Clovich reminded him, times have changed and I want you to step into the new road that is ahead with me. 
the era of chivalry and honorable combat are over. Battlefield will no longer be determined and commanded by knights and nobles, but the efficiency and lethality of weaponry, individual soldiers, and studied stratagems. I hate to say this to you, my faithful knight commander but knights are useless now, obsolete. Clovich bluntly stated. He was drawing from his learning experience in examining how youth soldiers fight in such terrifying speeds and power back at the Tahorino industrial complex. Useless? Obsolete? How are we all that? The Knights of Tyrian defended this realm and your family for many cycles. How are we now useless to you now? The Knights will mutiny if you say that to all of them. Sir Bardis squawked, his nerves pulsing out of his face to show his utter repulsion of the Prince's notions for his people. Knight Commander, believe me when I say that your Knights at least in its current aspect when they the men of the Ufif. Well, we have a thousand and one ways to demonstrate target practice if you so wish to grant us the privilege. He slyly threatened the Bardu. As the prince says, you knights better start following the line of changes or otherwise, all of Gleesia will not want you anymore. Sir Bardu could only glare at Thomas' sight bitterly, his fists clenched tumultuously shaking. He stiffs his tongue as the knight commander knows how futile it is to go against youth soldiers as a single soldier can easily kill ten of his knights with their metal staves. He couldn't shout openly in front of his peers less he is threatened again more politically towards his position for violent insubordination by the very people he is sworn to protect. Knight Commander, do you remember how they wiped out Divico and his clan of bandits? You and I couldn't find a way to unseat him as he brazenly flaunted his ill-gotten gains and influences across all of the Principality, but the Federation was able to destroy his entire league within a span of a day. Despite this you still a commander of our knights and I will appoint you as the commander of my new army but the knights must be reformed and modernized based on the reforms if you and your knights still resist, I am afraid I have to dismiss every one of you and be replaced with people far more cooperative. I know it is hard to change but if you at least give this a chance, you will see it would be not so bad as you fear. Clovich swayed. If it allures you much more to my reformation of the Lanier. The other world as soldiers are very similar to our renowned Miniogwir. At no time we will be the best fighting force in all of Gleesia. Clovich added mentioning one of the pre-existing primitive armies that the Principality has. The Miniogwir are the famous crossbow soldiers of Tyrian that guarded the citadel against invaders for centuries. With their impeccable aim, they came in the varieties of regular, pave eyes carrying, and horse-mounted formations. They were the perfect models for modernization as Clovit deduced from his observations of the youth's military doctrine and technology. Very well, I shall go along with your proposal, he assented. I had predicted that you nobles and the knights would be unhappy with your privileges being taken away but I, Thomas Sight and the Prince have designed plans to give you alternative forms of privileges in their absence that are as good even better as your old ones when we congress next time. All we need is to have you input your say on what we will compensate you all once we enact Clovich's reforms. Thomas enticed, your parley is honeyed sweetly. Very well, I will agree to go along with you my lord. Bardu nods. Lord Gonra, do you agree to the other worlders provisions? He turned to the noble leader. The noble side. He was the only one left of the group that disagreed. He has been forced to concede. At first, he wanted to make a stand with the knights and the guardsmen but after several carefully tongued words from Prince Clovich and his new other world a confidant, the noble saw the writing on the wall. With no additional hands to back up his interests he is forced as he had feared to go along the sweeping wave of reforms of Prince Clovich's Ryani amelioration, for the moment. But he schemed, with some luck and rallying his influences with his represented group he can at least retain some of the distinctive privileges that he and his fellow nobility have over the commoners. Now for you craftsmen and merchants, Mila Dewey Travel can you tell me how much money on average do the artisans would sell their products overall? He turned to the old weaver. I am no good counter. But if my memory serves me right, 
about 50 people will purchase an item from an artisan's shop every moon. Depending on the item they sell, they could go as low as 30 pieces to about 100 ducats each. Emma recollected, scratching her chin to push her memory forward. Most of the customers are from the Empire or from the Frontier. However, if trade is cut off not only me and my girls will not be able to afford a loaf of bread from the baker. She brings out her point. What is stopping you from selling to us? Thomas asks her. Selling to you? The old woman raised her eyebrows at the proposition. Of course, your products, specifically your weavings, pottery and some of your foods are handmade and one of a kind. Highly valuable amongst the Federation for the craftsmanship involved. They are willing to pay exorbitant amounts of money to get their hands on your artisanal goods. They may even pay more that you could have ever earned in a yay cycle with beforehand. Thomas said, I am not talking about the usual 50 customers that pass over your stores every month. I am talking about thousands, millions maybe even billions of people flocking to you and buying everything you made, especially the more well-off amongst us. He added, Indeed, if I recall, a representative of Ozai Corporacy is interested in not only your goods but partnering with you so that you may be able to access their customers as well. Clovich further added, Nanya be praised. I accept. I accept. Emma jumped elatedly. Her fellow craftsmen would sometimes eat the leather of their wares to prevent themselves from starving, but the prospect of dining in gold and silver was irresistible to pass up. And about us peasants. Chieftain Dor meekly raised. Just tell us what you need and I will see to it you have all the support your crops will need, Clovich added, we of the peasantry shall my lord, Dor bowed, Sir Sites and my words still stand for all of your concerns, all we need is time and your continued contributions, Clovich informed the Congress, know that your cases are being addressed, shall we rewrite this paper once again, together, you craftsmen will want to, Clovich beamed victoriously. He grabbed his quill pen and began to draft the second incarnation of the prototype constitution. Now with the licensure of the representatives, but also their perusal, he praised that in time, he will create a constitution that truly embodies why Symthus knew it, the new society he dreams of seeing. A tomorrow that scribes will record its glory and the spirit of King Emperor Meiji of the Japanese islands would be proud of how his leadership walked on the same path that forward-looking revolutionary took. Dash. Lieutenant Samantha Rose stood in her fatigues, away from her Hecate suit, nervously twitching as the eyes of her superiors, Major Holyfield and Colonel Polonsky or at least the holographic representations of them stood before her. Immediately after she was given the clear by the doctors who immediately attended to her aching muscles and bruises that she accumulated thanks to her extensive use of her powers back at the Asterix, the two high-ranking UFIF officers ordered for her immediate presence to discuss her radical previous actions. Her heart cadenced like a large drum and her breaths fell heavy at every pace as fearful drops of nervous sweat fell on her paws, soaking the surface of her skin. By the hollow faces, they each grimaced on their visages, the lieutenant can only fear the worst, reflecting on herself, Samantha's willful action of disobeying a direct order of evacuation to rescue additional survivors of what is now called the Great Asteracy eruption had nearly cost not only her life but the exemplary work of Dr. Malona's technological expertise risking the Hecate suit's destruction despite her bravery at the time. She was ashamed of herself and terrified of how she could have suffered an agonizing death by the volcanic lava. She felt characteristically stained when she gave up so easily on trying to escape with the last survivors that she wished she could have taken back those final will of words she had said to her teammates as they too were just as dishonored as she was upon hearing them. If it were not her team's encouragement and Carlyle's aid, she really would have perished inside that damn tunnel. Samantha Rose would have desecrated her father's memory and her family name forever as she would have committed the most grievous of transgressions of leaving her mother behind to cry upon her empty tombstone because her daughter simply gave up. It would also be just as worse for her if she was instead killed but captured by the hostile natives just as she was nearly hogged by their grasping hands. She knew of the horror stories of what such primitives would do to their prisoners, especially of their enemies or the women of said enemies.
The lieutenant shed one single tear that trickled down on her cheek as an agonizing moment of silence fell before the room. She had failed not only her oath to the Afif, her squad, and her father but she had also failed herself in her quest to be the intrepid hero like her lineage fell on her. She failed to save the most important person of them all, herself. She shamefully lowered her head not daring to look at her superiors as she awaited her just punishment from them. I can see it in your eye you know full well why you are brought here and also that you know full well about your actions earlier, Polonsky informs her. Yes, I had willfully committed insubordination and endangering my team by delaying evacuation as well as potentially nearly left myself being captured by the enemy. I take full responsibility for my dereliction of the chain of command Colonel Samantha bowed her head honorably confessing every breach of conduct and the consequences of said actions. Indeed, you are guilty of all infractions and honorably describe each and every one of your wrongs. Holyfield acknowledged. Have you forgotten your place lieutenant? Had the power of those mumbo jumbo magic got into your head? That you are now some sort of superhero who can do whatever? You have violated one of the verses of the enlistment oath to never betray the motherland, he added on tell me. Why? Why did you do it? Polonsky sued her. I didn't have the heart to let them all die by that volcano. Samantha answered sincerely, her voice squeamishly diminishing at each passing second under their eyes. Them? Them? You risked your life and your teammates live for what the party has now deemed our enemies? Holyfield exclaimed. When I first thought of my actions, I saw them nothing more but just people trapped by the volcano. I never expected that some of them would have been affiliated with the Slay Aegean Empire. Say Matha put her point across to her superiors. That dwarven girl and most of the people you did manage rescue from the cave, both me and Polonsky would have easily written that off as just moral fibers from you Lieutenant Rose. But those mage, you do know they are part of the empire that we are at war with. Don't you remember what they did to the hundreds of innocent people both in Tyrian and New Albany? You should know when and where you can use that heart of yours, Lieutenant. Use it for the right people and the right nation. Holyfield mocked Samantha's queasy voice. Yes, you. You are both right. Samantha yielded. I accept any form of disciplinary measures you deem appropriate for my offenses. Lieutenant Samantha Rose, take off your badges and insignia. Colonel Polonsky ordered her. The five chairman of the High Command Commission and the party deems that you will not be needing them anymore. Samantha glowered despondently as she stripped the Velcro off her badge and carefully unpinned the silver bar insignia that signified her once esteemed rank of first lieutenant. She handily placed the removed articles on a nearby table and stood in attention again to the colonel and the major. She doesn't know if she was demoted to private or was being dishonorably discharged from the armed forces at this instance. But either way, the honorable thing to do is to let go of her once lofty position gracefully. Now, I need you to report to Dr. Maloney about your suit as I still need you and your squad still for the upcoming offensive Captain Rose, Polonsky tells her, his words emphasizing the second to the last word of his sentence. Excuse me? Samantha's melancholy snapped as she turned her head towards the colonel. What did you just call me? Samantha asked. Even we were surprised by this. The HCC directly told us that you and your squad should be promoted. They had been closely monitoring Strider's actions for an unknown amount of time. When they heard of what had happened to you, they deemed punishing you would have been unfair. Holyfield said. Unfair? Promoting me is unfair. Samantha exclaimed. I disobeyed orders. I nearly died. I nearly let myself and some expensive equipment fall to the hands of the enemy. I deserved to be demoted. Discharged even. Samantha protested. Her honor taking the better of her. Do not be too hard on yourself Lou. Captain Rose. Polonsky consoled her. Your actions may have been unprofessional but your intention had the right heart. Have you ever thought about the people you saved earlier? Polonsky said. I, not really, Samantha answered. She nearly forgotten the dozens more dwarves she had rescued earlier due to the guilt of the death of that one girl named Janus who made the previous dwarves' lives feel shallow compared to hers. Again, 
Samantha's intrinsic self had become more squalid than ever of her stubbornness to let go of that one failure. From a utilitarian perspective, she had lessened the lives of the other dwarves she had saved for Janris. You had scored a major hearts and minds victory today when those same dwarves spread the word of a certain crimson angel that saved them, especially from a dwarf by the name of Elan, Holyfield said. I remember him. He was one of the first dwarves I rescued in the tunnel, Samantha answered. Indeed, he is a judge, a sort of high-ranking official that the dwarves give great respect to. A very valuable asset of influence for the long-term plans for Gleesia. Holyfield smiled softly of the development. Thanks to him, he has been spreading the word about how we are not those demon monsters the Empire thinks we are. Already, many of the local Tyranni. The dwarven refugees and even our own men are calling you the Crimson Angel. Punishing you would only lose such invaluable goodwill you have inadvertently blessed us, Polonsky said. You are, whether you like it or not a propaganda piece, one of our best magical based assets and easier to combat whatever magic comes our way. You are simply too valuable to be discarded, he added. Still, your transgressions earlier still have its weight on you. Captain Rose. Your new position will also come with further scrutiny by not only the Commission and the party but also both sides of the public as well. They will be looking into your actions, all of them. Very closely from now on. Holyfield interjected. Do not ignore our orders again. Or we will have to apply a restraining bolt on you of sorts to keep you under a leash. Polonsky crossed his arms. Do I make myself very clear Captain? He asked her. I still do not believe I deserve all of this. Samantha pushed her case. I still have at least five years to go before I can be worthy to become a captain. She mentioned. Well you have a month to prove the commission that you are worthy Captain Rose. Dr. Malona will brief you further at his lab for additional assignments. Now if you excuse me, the Major and I have several preparations we need to organize for Operation Haymaker and the Astorisii situation. Good day, and congratulations. Polonsky gave his adieu. Remember Captain. The Commission and the party will be watching your progress. Very closely. Holyfield added. The Colonel and the Major's holographic images disappeared leaving a very much confused and conflicted Lieutenant now turned Captain Rose to stand frozen at the communications room. Her mind raced around her in contrast to her body's dormancy as she processed what she had heard. The title of Captainship. A significant leap in responsibilities for the lieutenant to shoulder. She will be in charge of her native Strider group, but a company's worth of men was an intimidating premise for her. She was still unsure of herself in her leadership skills as her mind was yet to fully grasp the more onerous realities of commanding a singular squad, let alone several of them. Samantha sighed. She is going to need a drink when she gets back to the surface. She turns around and quietly enters Dr. Malona's laboratory where he sat on his desk whilst a robotics bay built into his office was busy performing repair operations on Samantha's Hecate suit. Sami my girl, you're here. David ecstatically jumped at her arrival. Hey doc. Look I just want to say that I was sorry for nearly destroying your work. I felt bad doing it, Samantha tells the scientist. Thanks, but I should be the one here to say thank you. Melona smiled. I was monitoring the data from your Hecate suit and I shared my findings to my colleagues at the Academy of Science. It was also extraordinary. It blew their minds I tell you. Even I cannot believe what I read. He excitedly tells her. That's pretty great. Samantha softly smiled. Your spell casting were on point although I do have to say. There was an anomaly I picked up from your suit's data. Like a sudden spike of energy but then suddenly it disappeared. I mean, yikes. It nearly fried the meridians. Do you know anything about it? David asked her. Actually yes. Samantha nodded. I encountered this red-colored unbinalium while I was inside the volcano. I used its power to give myself a boost so I can fly out of there, she explained. So that answers the report. Wait. Red-colored unbinalium? David's eyes widened on Samantha's statement. Yeah. Very. Excited if I have to ask. Samantha mentioned. What a waste. 
I was told that red umbinilium is more potent or bit rarer than the standard blue ones. Iris managed to give me, me a small sample of the stuff before she had to evacuate it. I gotta say, the red ones are pretty energetic. If you find yourself deep underground again keep an eye out and collect some for analysis. The scientist requested, will do. Samantha nodded. So what else did the science people say? She pressed. Oh that's where the fun begins Sammy. David winked. The party, a Paro Corp plus some private investors have funded me and my team over 10 trillion credits to Unbinilium and Gleesia related research projects with promises for more. David announced. 10 trillion? That's enough to buy a moon. Samantha exclaimed. Things are seriously turning out fast for Gleesia now I can tell you. David chuckled. What are you planning to do with all of that money? She asked him. Well for starters, your suit, the data I read plus to the additional funds will allow me to update a few tweaks and an additional feature to your suit. You know, make it stronger, faster, better. David answered. After that I got some more ideas after that. What kind of ideas? Samantha questioned. Well the minerals we acquired from the dwarves would enable us to make new kinds of armors with anti-magic features, weapons that can cut through anything at a molecular level and furthermore I have been selected for a project, god factor that involves making a brand new type of energy reactor with unbinilium. Make fusion reactors look like matchsticks. David answered a wave of intellectually driven optimism echoed on his voice. I am already fabricating the prototypes as we speak captain. You. Yeah. Thanks. Samantha quavered. She is still not so cordial to being called her new rank yet. So how is the squad? Samantha asked. Oh a lot happened actually. David groaned with some exasperation. Your Sarge brought Clay and Ken over to help with the last preps for Operation Haymaker although according to Crocker, Iris would come over and steal away Ken for a few moments before coming back smelling like roses. Diaz is currently at the Aparo office with Bianchin for some business matters, Abidia has been visiting April at Dr. Lee's and Aliathra. Oh shit. I owe her something. David shouted. Like a nutty professor of the sciences. He wobbled around his lab looking for desperately for an object, scrambling papers, boxes, and a few electronic tools until he finally came across a pair of disembodied hands of the Caucasian color. What are those? Samantha asked. Oh, a prototype I was tinkering along during the early days of building your suit. I was trying to understand installing your suit's arcane meridians better. So I made these models based off of Aparo Rapid Movement Booster hands set that Bobby donated to me for practice. Thanks to my newfound understanding of how magic works around here, I can finally give these new hands to Aliathra. He explained. Aliathra is getting new hands? What happened to her? Samantha pressed. During the volcano, she was trying to hold off a wave of lava but... How do I say this? Her hands got burnt off and we had to... Well, amputate them. Again, David sputtered. Damn it, I should have been there for her. The poor girl lost so much already. Samantha wailed. Oh, don't be so hard on yourself Samantha. The elf is taking it fairly well, quite. Eager in fact. David mentioned. Eager? Why so? Samantha questioned. She's been talking about being reborn and ascending to a superior form. Getting all proud about her augmentations going like why cannot kill me will make me stronger. I think all of her augmentations gotten into her unlike last time. David concluded. I will talk about it with her soon. Samantha nodded. So what else do I have to know? Well command told me I am to tweak your suit better so I can add a point five next to your one. Or better yet if I can figure out some computations you can replace the one part of your suit's name to a V2 if you catch my lingo can. He winked. You will get your suit back when Haymaker starts so for now. Enjoy a bit of R&R at the town. He suggested. Thanks, I hope you do figure it out. She waved goodbye to Dr. Malona. Samantha, before you go. May I say something? I think that needs to be said. About what you did. David reached out to her. A dramatic pause silenced the room as David took a deep breath. Keep doing what you believe is right can. What you and I have. These marks. We could be at the precipice of a new step for humanity. He tells her. 
Their powers were indeed awesome in scope, yet deep down they were wielded by people outside of their control by players, writers and thinkers with their own designs and interests. They were not truly free, but controlled by those around them some softly, others quite openly. I know doctor, I know. I just don't know where it would lead us to, Samantha answered. We shall cross the bridge when we get there Captain Rose. It's when will we see the bridge is the question. David meditated. Samantha exited the underground laboratory, wanting to take a long walk to the bar with her own two feet, ignoring all the cab services being now given out around the New Albany Colony now. She passed over the outer limits of the New Albany Colony where a large plain of land between Tyrian and the colony proper was being slowly urbanized. Native humans, goblins, the centaurs and dwarves were beginning to settle around those lands forging themselves a new destiny within the Principality, the vanguard of Prince Clovich's Ryani amelioration. Several of the Gleesian natives noticed her passing by and began to wave at her gladly, some thanking her for what she had done for them ranging from the elimination of the Burning Horse Clan, the Terriani incidents, and her rescues at the Astrix. Kamaru and Hodon were building their people's respective conclaves. Princess Aria with her fellow peers patronizing the new imports and Yafif and the new Zanigrada clan Iyer army working in tandem together warmed her heart that her efforts, of a single humble lieutenant were indeed bearing a fruit. A fruit that will one day grow a mighty forest. Dash. So it has begun. Don Aparo inhaled his cannabis cigar. An emergency board meeting has been called for Aparo Corporation, the subject of the day their interests and the threat to its longevity within Li easier sooner than we expected boss Byung-chin added apologetically it is only ozai maximum dhs for now but sooner than later everyone else will roll in as well klovich is expediting his reforms at a speedy pace too it won't be long before the jig is up for us diaz said relax vinny our halberd guns deal with Klovich that I back-channeled for all of us should keep us relevant in his court for now. Byung-chin reassured him. We may have first turn advantage, but we need to dig our feet if it's going to last. We need something that will keep us staying here before the other corpos beat us to the punch. Diaz pleaded. What's the current status on those three again? Don Aparo asked. The Maxis are on infrastructure officially speaking but their Gaia Transformer is the talk in Klovich's court. Ozai is moving in with the commoners through their food producing initiatives. As for HS, there are plans to have them start building a factory in Tyrian by the end of the year. Diaz answered, typical of them. Although Maximoff is unusually pushy for them to promote their Gaia Transformer so aggressively. Are they still mad at Eden? Aparo asked. Mentioning the name of Ozai Corporacy's CEO, Ednishin O. I guess so. I remembered how they left that courtroom so pissed off being forced to sell their stuff to Eden. Bobby mentions. I see. Don Aparo nods. Now what about us? What do we have? He asked the two of them. Well the office, two stores and a partnership with the Duke and a bunch of sea elf pirates. Bobby answered. Our mercs are on the ground too helping to keep the peace. Excellent work you two. Our direct partnership with the party is bearing fruit. Don Aparo smiled coyly, rubbing his hands ominously at the profits he will enjoy upon ripening. Additionally, our advantage with the research and acquirement of mana crystals should win us breathing room against the other corpos. Too bad we lost the dwarven mountains to Maximov. It could have been so beautiful. Diaz sulked. There are other chances Vinny. I will allow Maxi to have his rubble for it is nothing to Project Ambrosia. He said. Project Ambrosia? Diaz asked. Something new boss. Dr. Sforza of Aparo Pharmaceuticals. Your progress reports? Don Aparo beckoned. Gladly. A venerable yet feminine voice echoed. Across the video screen. An anonymous visage appeared, identified herself as only Dr. Sforza, looking as beautiful as ever Doc. Bobby chided her. Spare me your frivolities Roberto. Dr. Sforza reprimands her. She wasn't a very photo-confident type of woman, content to hiding herself in her lab and only showing up to meetings under her shielded visage. What is this project? Ambrosia you're speaking about Doc. Hope it's big. Diaz enthusiastically asked. 
a key to the next step in human evolution Vincente, these elves and vampires all greater than I could have ever imagined, think of all the possibilities of what we can do if we harness their powers for ourselves, Dr. Sforzo explained, and all what we could do, Don Aparo grinned excitedly, long lives, super strength, accelerated healing, the possibilities are infinite, I know it is boss, Dr. Sforza nodded, anyhow, the samples I have acquired from Asset, Agatha and Asset, Sakagoya produced many findings for me and I am working on replicating their genes as we speak, Dr. Sforza said, plus that Linda's corpse too, I almost forgot, all equally invaluable, Aliathra, and Iris Dr. Sforza, she, they have a name, Diaz gnashed his teeth, that is great to hear, so how fast can we get something ready for the markets? Don Aparo asked. At best I can give you a trial serum in about a month. Dr. Sforza bluntly confesses. Brilliant. I predict billions of profits selling Project Ambrosia into the market by the time we are done. Aparo smiles like a child who is about to get his big toy. Just imagine living for centuries and healing from any wounds, the possibilities are endless, well, I do want to take a life a little slower, Diaz chuckled, and not have to worry about my kidney too, Bobby added, I do request I obtain more materials for my research, I believe it is time I no longer shadow myself with the state any longer, it is best we run our own independent research for these so called hot items. Dr. Sforza proposed. Granted, Don Aparo approves. We can start by showering her with money for more of her time. Maybe even find more of her fellow vampire kin too. He ordered. Iris may be considered a state asset but her under the table agreement with Aparo Corporation in creating several enchanted items for several of Don Aparo's high valued clients within the grey market, and darker in exchange that her private interests are catered to, businessmen like Corpos, are masters in appealing and catering to other people's interests, and the elf, Diaz asked, her too, Aparo nodded, or any more of her kind instead as the same for the vampire, I will see to it, Diaz inhaled, closed his eyes and nodded, hey, couple of creds their way didn't hurt anybody, Bobby chuckled, tickling his wallet, although, if possible, I would love to explore more. Subjects of similar genetic material of asset, Sakagoya and Agatha, Dr. Sforza requested. Doctor, you normally can work with so little. Have you lost your touch already? Don Aparo asked her. Heavens no Domenico. This is uncharted territory for me. I seek to fully immerse myself on the strands of DNA these elves and vampires possess. Dr. Sforza denied her shortcomings to the board. I am a scientist not a miracle worker. Whatever you say doctor, we will see what we can do. Don Aparo nodded. So, is that all boss? Bobby asked. I got to prep our gunners of the upcoming offensive right after this, I believe so. Don Aparo nodded, the rest of the board approving with him that all that is needed to be discussed has been discussed. Alrighty, gotcha. Diaz acknowledged, can't wait to get back to work. He smiled. Good, keep updating me on the situation at your designated tasks. Do not engage with the other corpos unless I approve of the action. And keep an eye out for anything we can get our hands on. Don Aparo concluded the meeting. And remember, you never heard of Project Ambrosia. Project what? Diaz sarcastically questioned. That's the spirit. Don Aparo smiles as his video conference screen disconnects. Dash. Ten days had passed since the first new Zanagrad Congress, and over two months of meticulous planning was devoted to Major Holyfield Grand Project yet, the battle plans of Operation Haymaker. Today, after much delay both extra fortuitous and man-made along with a very critical new information from an unexpected source, was the day of the launch of the operation. It was the night before the big attack and the Major had lost quite a number of days of sleep obsessing over every detail, every composition and ever timing of his grand offensive. He had scouts map him the entire layout of the lands beyond the imperial border of the Cambervale Valley for every hidden path, 
terrain hazard and positions each of everything on the map to ensure his forces can move like an unimpeded flood down the imperial heartlands all in good accordance to the deep battle doctrine that he so ever so religiously studied for and enacted its philosophies for his plans there were several risk factors of that would likely produce the most troubles for this operation was Marnia's Bluff, Little Hill and Herring Point themselves, Marnia's Bluff, a swampy isthmus area filled with several canyons and cave systems that separated the northern Sioux Valley Chi from the most direct approach to Herring Point required extensive time building the causeways to allow the youth mechanized forces to push through. Marnia's Buff was a significant historical and strategic location in Gleesia where the Kuldelst La Ejac and the original Alliance of Light prevailed against Albon. According to Klovich's scholars, Kuldel knew that Albon's army while lower in numerical volume compared to the alliances were too powerful and cohesive of a force for the alliance to win in open battle without horrendous casualties as it mostly took the power of numerical superiority of the alliance to stand a chance as one single demon can take down five warriors. Therefore, in the long run the alliance would have lost. Kuldel then came up with the cleverest of schemes. He devised a plan to lure Albon and his army to Marnia's buff to deal the decisive blow to the demon horde and killed Albon once and for all by taking advantages of the sandy swamps and choking canyons of Marnia's buff to effectively slow and lock down the marauding horde as well as the surrounding forests and gulching terrain to set up ambushes. The strategy worked in the end and the Alliance of Light prevailed with all bone death and destruction of his demon horde but with the great cost for the first alliance. Although the ingenuity of the engineers was commendable, they had to work at a fraction of their full capacity due to maintaining the secrecy of the offensive. Clovich will be sent to diplomatically turn over his naive and decadent cousin Duke Thibault to the youth's side to allow Holyfield's men to occupy and deploy from Souville. The latter two locations that the Empire will defend to the last man according to King Martin, Harring Point and Little Hill will likely have a complement of fiercely tenacious obstructions ranging from a variety of traps to a large garrison of unbreakable defenders. Although he has complete faith that his combat engineers and special operations units can sap through the defenses, it will be inevitable that some loses and delays will occur one way or the other. Most of the fighting legions who according to the spy reports were hastily deployed south should still be fatigued at best from their forced marching to defend the capital and the vital defensive point blocking the one road through the Cambervale Valley mountain passes to and from Tyrian. Additionally, the information about the troop movements from their intelligence gathering as provided, more reinforcements in addition to a plethora of some of this world's most destructive weaponry from the Empire and her allies will be scheduled to arrive about three to four days later mid-offensive so they must also be ready to stop any attempts of a counter-attack before approaching Herring Point proper. Holyfield had to delay the launch of the attack for about another week due to factoring the additional logistical support needed to fuel the army's advances plus more some. He organized a dedicated set of aircraft based at the new Albany starport whose sole purpose is to perform routine delivery patterns for all airborne supply drops that will be eventually called over every day throughout the operation. But none of these problems could compare to the sudden arrival of a fourth new risk factor he has to account on his computations. Prince Klovich's newly formed Luo Ed Afaganuid Zanigrad or more vernacularly called the Lanier, insisting that he and a considerable amount of men were to accompany Army Group West to Haring Point to personally confront the Emperor. The Prince, fresh from his enlightening journey back from the motherland of Earth wasted no time enacting his new and controversial reforms throughout his domain. Most immediately radical was the armed forces he is establishing with the aid of Governor White and Prime Minister Bowski's state resources. At first, Holyfield protested on his participation for the sake of the prince's safety and his men's rather cavalier approach into this confrontation but he was persuaded, rather reluctantly, by the majority of the inner circle stating that Prince Klovich's approach to the imperial capital is the most publicly beneficial step into legitimizing the Federation's presence in Gleesia. 
it will be deemed that Clovich himself and his retinue of soldiers of the newly formed Sainagrad Lanier will participate in Operation Haymaker by contributing to the bloodless turnover of Suville for the Western Army Group to establish their forward operations base and deploy from. Additionally, he and his knights are very familiar with Imperial battle tactics and the local terrain of the Slaage and Heartlands that he can be consulted reliably for. Clovich's men were outfitted in a schizophrenic mix of their pre-existing medieval armor, their mounts and bold heraldry in contrast to the Aparo Halberdia rifles they wielded. These men, two battalions worth of the converted Tyranny crossbowmen, aka the Miniogri, of about 800s worth each. The battalions were commanded by the pre-existing military nobility of the Principality courtesy of Knight Commander Sir Bardu alongside a team of attaches from the Yafif as an advisory council. Currently the majority of them, consisting of conscripts and regular crossbowmen are still undergoing their new modernized training regimen of physical fitness and weapons handling. For the early stages of the Lanier's existence, squads will be formed into a Maziad or a mixed squad consisting of a two Ufif officers, a squad leader and a radioman followed by four Tyranni riflemen or Rayfles. Much later once the pacification of Gleesia has been fulfilled. The prince will transition to making the Lanier fully independent from the Afif with their own doctrines, officers' academy, military bases, armories etc. In terms of today however for the prince's daring expedition out of the safety of his citadel, an experimental battalion consisting of a chosen selection by a knight commander Sir Bardu best shooting many Ogui were given a crash course in rifle proficiency of the Halberdier rifle. Their objective is to escort Prince Clovich to the Imperial Palace of Haring Point so he may take the Imperial seat. At first, the crossbowmen were reluctant to transition their gear into the modern weapons that Prince Clovich had arranged the shipment of even startling them by the loud and repetitive bang they produce upon discharge and resulting recoil. Testing the rifle against their own crossbows, Sir Bardu and his peers commented, all weapons have their strengths and weaknesses. The other world a rifle may fire faster and more sharply than our own crossbow, have more fire longer range and immensely more powerful not to mention being able to reload faster than our crossbows as it can gravely endure or outright almost any man or monster in a single shot. The bolts can punch through even the greatest armors made by the best blacksmith in the continent like they are just cloths. Unfortunately, the rifle also has its weaknesses, one being that of having the bolts not being eligible for reuse and the shots themselves being less accurate than our ancestral arms. The additional moving parts of the rifle makes it complicated, even daunting for a new user to understand and learn how to properly maintain the weapon compared to the crossbow. The next flaw of the weapon, is that upon discharging its bolts, the shooter would often be left in a bewildered state by the sheer thunderous power it possesses compared to our more subtle crossbows. In a battlefield, a man who had lost his focus on the battlefield is just the in the same as a dead one. But once the other world a rifle has been loaded with its bolts, it can penetrate through any of its target in a frighteningly lethal sight. Ultimately, we must accept that indeed, the other world a rifle for all of its flaws is superior in every way possible to our crossbows, it is inevitable that men will abandon their swords, bows and spears for these foreign weapons, it will take time for the other worlders to fully integrate themselves into their new weapons but thanks to the advisors and Yafif officers plus Clovich's own encouragement, their training should be able to re-educate them proper into an admirable fighting force. Holyfield, sighed however at their persistence to accompany him. He prefers working with those whom he is familiar with and the Lanier were a blank slate. He better hoped they perform well or not perform much at all. Their deaths or any resulting injuries will be blood on his hands since Clovich and his men are vital to the good faith approach to the end game of Operation Haymaker. He will be sure to keep them safe whilst also at the same time having them score political victories in the coming battles ahead. He took one last look at his force composition to see that his units, all carefully selected for their assortments of skills were in their correctly assigned places. 
Army Group West starting point at the port of Souville will be commanded by himself through the naval carrier the Aurora along with its air wing. Under his command, he will enjoy the familiar company of the 333rd Assault Division who contained the regiments of the 119th Mechanized Airborne, 53rd Engineering, 25th Armoured in addition to the Aurora's own 7th Marine Corps. They are reinforced by Clovich's the 1st and 2nd Lanier Battalions and the Silverback PMCs to act as an auxiliary and security division. These men were selected for their speed and experience in the completion of time-bounded military maneuvers. Their objective launch a mechanized thrust from Souville to push northwards from the duchy in a swift decapitation strike of the Empire's nerve center, the Imperial capital herring point herself. Army Group East, starting from landing zone Timber, named comedically for the predominantly forested area, with Colonel Polonsky taking the helm of the attack. They will be assisted by the Tenacity Carrier and her respective air wing, most especially her dragoons. For the boots on the ground, Holyfield assigned the most in must group of men to breach through the Cambervale Valley, the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd Regiments of the New Albany Colonial Militia, 88th Mountain Brigade, 32nd Motorized Division, 44th Airborne Regiment, 4th and 9th Artillery Company, the 20th Engineering Regiment, Steel Breakers PMC Armoured Company and lastly Ravens Guards PMC Regiment. These men were excellent in not only covering ground of rough terrain to clear the way for their more mechanized brethren to push forward the advance but also for their overwhelming occupational capacity due their large size. The objective is strategic depth penetration in nature. If they can secure the transition point of Nugonia whilst eliminating the heavily fortified stronghold of Little Hill from the game board, they should be able to access the open tank country of the flat leveled terrain and soft bellied cores of the Empire beyond with impunity. When all of these two objectives are met, Holyfield's hypothesis would force the Empire to capitulate in about one week upon the launch day, with a margin of error of an additional three days. He accounted for every maneuver, every possible setback and every contingency for his great plan. Major Holyfield's adjutant appeared himself onto the room. He carried with him a steaming cup of freshly roasted coffee and his breakfast of velvety scrambled eggs, potatoes and sliced ham. A meal served when he needed to start the day on a strong foot. Has the observing teams fulfilled their tasks? Holyfield asks. Army Group Easts had recently radioed that the bombardment of landing zone timber has gone smoothly without incident. The forest has been flattened and is awaiting the engineers to clear out any remaining rubble, the officer said and that whole preservation initiative that Polonsky made me do. Holyfield pressed. The starport is carrying the flora and fauna of the Cambervale forest as we speak. And smells like it too, the officer remarked with a slight cringe on his nose. Understood. Any updates from Army Group West? Holyfield changed the subject. They are on standby and ready to deploy to Souville. Just now Prince Clovich had already convinced his cousin to turn sides to us. The adjutant informed him. Good, start making the first few miles of the roadworks at Marnia's Bluff and be ready for S and D operations around that sector. Army East should work on cutting off any reinforcements that Army West will likely deal with. Holyfield swore. Let's hope that Captain Rose's little fruit she made was right on this. The Major tensed his psyche. He had to change several of his plans in lieu with the new intelligence gathered. According to the reports, the Emperor intends to make his nation an impregnable fortress. The amount of troop numbers is staggering sir. Ten to one, we will be outnumbered sir. The adjutant said. In an era of space carriers, automated logistics, and quantum radios, impregnable fortresses do not exist. We may be be outnumbered but we are not outgunned. Holyfield passionately declared. These natives may be tenacious but he has dealt with barbarous insurgents like them before. The laborious part was assuming the mobility needed to adapt to the situation. Either way Major, the troops are now waiting for the signal. Shall we proceed? The adjutant asks him. Yes, we are a go. Holyfield nods. He grabbed his radio, connected to all commanding officers fielded out for Operation Haymaker and pressed to call. Climb Mount Deanley, 
he says the coded phrase, commencing the start of Operation Haymaker, Chapter 48, The Grand Plan, Splay each an empire perspective, the streets of Herring Point, the cosmopolitan capital of the empire, the beating heart of Zanigrad lay contrastively dormant today as a contingent of Faithland's imperial crusade, alongside a caravan of mixed dwarven and human refugees that included a mogul dolman's entourage from the eastern provinces arrived at the imperial capital on a gloomy afternoon. The complete evacuation of the Stlaegean Empire's eastern provinces had now reached the capital herself. Towns, villages were abandoned totally as the Asturisii volcano devoured all in its path. Even Mountson, the Empire's arsenal lay sixty feet under an avalanche of ash and earth whilst the surrounding lands, contributing about a third of the Empire's arable land lay buried. Consequently, the eruption came at the worst possible time to strike. The pre-autumn harvest, predicted by the Imperial Senate to be the greatest of harvests thanks in part to Emperor Alden's irrigation expansion. Many died during the journey westward mostly from starvation and the ashes choking the weakened and the young to death in an apocalyptic account of the hundred thousand. To many of them, it seems like the foretold prophecy of Jeltagar's comet was to upturn the Empire from its rightful place among Leesia's soil and Sipag. God of the Forge was to unleash his wrath, dubbed the Great Ashening by the Heralds. This event is marked with great hardship and tragedy that shook the great balance of the Empire. The Chosen One's arrival was initially cold, but as news broke out of his return the streets of Herring Point resuscitated to life once again to greet the Chosen Hero of the Sacred Crystal Heart. There was a mix of hope and despair that painted the scene from prayerful praises of salvation towards Faithland's return to questioning inquiries about what had just happened to cause such disturbance as many people were now reeling to the effects of the Astorisii's eruption. The citizenry avoided going outside except when they need to buy food and water. The refugees were given healing and warm porridge and blanket to shield themselves from the waking cold by charitable citizenry of the capital to ease their hardy journey. The ash cloud had turned the warmly awaited harvest season into a food crisis. Grain, fruit and vegetable harvests were buried, choked and ruined beyond repair by the ash clouds wake causing the people of the empire near and far to ration dried cuts of salted morsels. This resulted in the said cold reception Faithlen disappointingly received as noticed by the pale and gaunty eyes that the denizens of Herring Point can attest to the returning crusaders. Overall a depressing scene for every one of the crusaders upon their return compared to when they had left. You have arrived. Carlia nodded to Faithlen's retinue. Where is the Emperor and the Grand Master? Are they all right? Faithlen asked. They are taking refuge by the Grand Cathedral. In fact, the Emperor refused to leave the Adoration Chapel's cloister for days. Carlia mentioned. Owen has been acting with the Prime Minister to address the food shortages. But right now things are dire. The College Mage added. We must seek an audience with both of them at once. Faithlen demanded. The Crusader leaders galloped to the streets of Herring Point towards the Grand Cathedral, now turned into a fortress with guards and sentries patrolling the holy building much to the fretfulness of the cathedral's clergy and caretakers. After announcing their arrival to Alden's major domo, the senior leadership of Faithland's retinue and Mogul Dolman stand in audience with Emperor Alden's court. Grand Master Owen, how are we going to explain everything to the Emperor? Faithland asked. I will explain everything he needs to know. Carlia and Olera should set their focus on investigating more of the prophecy with the Grand Master. Mogul Dolmond answered. Agreed. Let us make this quick. We must forward in due haste for the sake of the Empire now that it is in a crisis. Carlia nodded reluctantly. For five straight days I prayed to the gods. Never leaving this chamber, never wavering in my faith. Emperor Eldin taxed to near death to a simple white-robed individual lacking any regal opulence that befitted his imperial majesty raised his voice upon seeing Carlia and the chosen one enter the same room he is in, to say that the past few days were not kind to him would have exposed the limitations of spoken vocabulary. The emperor's temporary refuge shares the same abode as the archbishop of the cathedral. Examining the room around them, it was noticeable that there were a few additions to the religious interior an archbishop is supposed to have. 
They range from a makeshift table of the map of the empire, a suit of armor and sword, and the archbishop's large desk being made room to accommodate Halden's own paperwork and an opulent closet that it was carried over from the palace that contained a selection of Alden's personal garments. Several of the imperial palace's staff and on occasion visiting imperial ministers walked around, attending to the emperor's needs and for his duties. My lord, you have already known of the news of Carlyle shifted her voice to a mellow formal tone to address the emperor but the mage was cut off. I know of the ashen cloud that just transacted my farmlands. What I have yet to know is what happened at the dwarven lands that resulted in having Mogul Dolman take refuge in my city let alone request an audience with me. He asked, his voice trembling the hallowed walls of the cathedral. Is it true that I have somehow angered Sipag the Allsmith? His voice was feeble from dehydration and constant prayer. His eyes were blackened to a reddish tint from lack of sleep and only receiving the frightfully constant distressing news as reported by his ministers, Grand Master Rowan, and General Huguet. Allow me. Mogul Dolmond intervened. He gave a polite bow with the Emperor following suit. I Mogul Dolmond of the clan Kerfold her is most humbled by being allowed to enter your presence O Lord, an honor to have you come to my abode. I wish it was in much more amiable times, he thanked him. So, tell me what had happened? He asked. Let it be known, that his imperial majesty and his court knows that the dwarven realms are indeed no more. Dolmond declared wistfully, the Estlrooks have fallen by the gods. The Archbishop of the Cathedral fainted. How have we angered the Allsmith? It is not Sipag that is enraged, but his very hearth was placed under a terrible enchantment. Dolmond answered, It was the demons of the other world. They had brazenly attacked the ingot deliveries that was meant for your Imperial Legion and the Chosen Ones. Not only that but they had corrupted my own people turned against their fellow dwarves. The mogul explained. Carlia darted her head to the dwarf. Alarmed by the truth he is explaining to the emperor. The ash cloud my lord, was created by the demons themselves. They placed a terrible curse on the dwarven mountains that caused the earth to quake and gush forth hot streams of lava and ash that devoured all of our clan holds and many of my kin. We and the chosen one tried to stop them but by the time we caught the demons it was already too late. Dolman said. My clan tried as we might to save as many as we can but the demons corralled many of my kin away in their dragons before carting them off to an unknown but likely horrible fate. It is true, I saw it with my own eyes. Faith lent shook on with Dolman's words. Why? How? March of Garmhaeg. You are supposed to be the bane of the demons? Why did you let the invaders destroy the Estlrooks so easily and take Mountain and the eastern provinces with it? Alden screamed. Your Majesty. That is because we have been betrayed. Outsmarted. Outmaneuvered by the demons. For they have captured and enthralled the shareholder to do their dark bidding. She used unending waves of demonic tricks to dishonorably humiliate me and our soldiers. Faith Len explained. The Bane Chosen One's revelation shook all of Emperor Alden's court to the core. Horrified, frozen and beyond baffled to hear of such devastating news. One of the prophesied Chosen Ones was working under the services of the great adversary, the otherworldly demons. The shareholder with the demons? But how? Owen despaired. Grasping his head with his two hands convulsively absorbing this direst of news, he had to mince a few of his words tactfully due to his still wounded pride of being bested by the shareholder. Her two masters, the vampire and the elf not only slew many of our men and the mogul's warriors, but also slew Marchog Fawn. Petra added, Gods have mercy, the Owen cried. What of the scholar? he asked. I do not know of him your majesty. But the shareholder had declared that she knows of him and where he is. I fear he is already corrupted like her or the enemy are still attempting to reach to him to enthrall him to their side. Faith Len divined. A vampire? There is still more of them? The archbishop called out. It is seen now that Auburn is moving swiftly to re-establish himself on our soil, seducing the minds of many folks to follow his lead and serve his whims. Already the vampires, especially one of the Kadahagan line and the Princess Aliathra have enthralled the shareholder to act for their nefarious plans. Faith Len answered, it will not be long before he gains himself a powerful army like his previous one again. Hugot nodded. Either way, 
This news is dangerous. Vampires may be scattered but have a tendency to enact revenge if one not outside of their bloodlines were to kill one of their own. If one vampire sided with the demons, it is likely many more will join or have joined their stead, for revenge against us no less. Owen explained to the congregation. Is there a way we can rescue the shareholder and the scholar chosen ones then? Without them we do not stand a chance against the coming storm from the south. Alden asked, My lord, if I may speak? Carly raised her voice. Alden, desperately looking for answers, quietly allowed the college mage to say her piece. The great ashening and the astral rock eruption was not made by the demons, but was instead created foolish acts of mogul dolmond and faith lend themselves. Carlyle stated. A loud gasp escaped the lungs of everyone in the room. The two men that the college mage accused turned their eyes to her adversely. Such words being said to nobility and those of high rank were not to be taken lightly by all. Carlyle Silverdane. What are you talking about? Grandmaster Owen questioned. The terrace dwarves. The dwarven miners that work under Mogul Dolmond warned him that they were mining too deeply into the earth but they did not listen. When Faithlen ventured into the mines to pluck out a few ores of Actocolite for himself, he caused the massive eruption to happen. Plunging our lands into darkness by the ash cloud, Carly explained. Lies. All lies. Mogul Dolmond reactively veered. You actually listened to those ignorant peons? What do they know about mining? My clan's geomancers had worked on the mines for countless centuries and told me that the mining was progressing greatly to meet the Empire's demands. What do my terrace dwarf miners know? Nothing I tell you about mining. Nothing, says the one who spoke with the corrupted shareholder herself. On your way out of the mountains you managed to corner the corrupt chosen one but you hesitated to capture her when she spoke with you. Then using her charms, she casted an illusion spell or a charm spell to make you think she saved you from the lava slime. Faith Len accused Carlyle with his tall tales. That is not true. Illusion spell? That is a weak argument to throw against me, a mage of the college. What sorts of evidence you have that indicts the shareholder to do all of that? Carlyle rebutted. On our way back to the capital, you and Olero had always tried to protect that woman and state that she is not corrupted or demonic. The signs of you being fooled by an illusion or being charmed by one who uses the spell. Faith then returned fire. The way you say of her magical prowess would have lulled weak-minded folks like you and Olero to her master's side. If she were to be in your presence any longer, she would have turned you against my heroic crusade. Faith Len egotistically shielded himself. You are no hero Faith Len. You are just a selfish child pretending to be a hero without understanding what it means to be a hero. Olera exclaimed, scornfully yelling to the top of her lungs. Tears streamed in her face as all the pent-up frustration was purged out of herself and directed towards the object of all of her grievances. You only care nothing but your heroic legend. The shareholder, Samantha was the real hero. She saved us and many trapped dwarves in that volcano even if she knows she could die trying. You? You ran away like a coward with Mogul Dolmond not caring at all about the people you left behind to die. The girl screamed. Shut your mouth wench. The chosen ones yelled. Faith Len hurled towards Olayra, his sword drawn in an impetuous display of wounded pride that I demanded self-retribution, only to be stopped by the combined efforts of Carlyle and several bystanding imperial knights that prevented him from laying a finger at her. The scholar girl curled herself to cry by the college mage's skirt as Faith Len was dragged away a safe distance. March or Garmhaik you have crossed the line with such temper. That is no way to act like that in my presence. Emperor Alden scolded the chosen one. Now is not the time to fight amongst ourselves. The people demands unity not division amongst those they placed their faith on to protect them. Have you not forgotten that for all of your power? It was I who is your guarantor of your weapons, titles and resources. Alden reprimanded Faith Len. The Emperor then turned to Carlyle. Ludui Silverdane, what you accused of towards Mogul Dolmond is unacceptable. Mogul Dolmond and his clan are the Empire's greatest allies second only to the Elves. What you say is a most libelous accusation that will require further investigation. He reprimanded her. What happened to you Carlyle? 
You are one of the greatest students of the college and a gold-ranked adventurer, Owen said. Please tell me we have not lost you too, he pleaded. Then test me, test my purity right now, she demanded with a challenge. If I am corrupted then strike me down, but if I am not can you, in good faith between you, the most esteemed Grand Master at the college and I your most enlightened and the most humble students have you listened to more of my accounts? Carlyle appealed. Your loyalty and faith sound unwavering. Very well. I shall perform the necessary tests, the archbishop nodded. Conjuring his sacred restoration magics, the archbishop screened both Kala and Olera off of any corruptive influences with purifying and dispelling magics. Nothing, you are indeed still a pure Ruth, the archbishop said, or being easily fooled. Faith Len insinuated. Silence March of Garmhaic. I will discipline you and your vapid gall later when we are done. Emperor Alden scolded Faith Len. He was willing to give this college mage, in spite of her recent display of non-observance to her oath to be the chosen one's retainers and valuable mentors. She was still a highly respected individual of her own repute still worthy of his considerations, that and because he was desperately looking for some form of hope that he can muster in these dire times that seemed to spell nothing but destroy all that he and his ancestors of the Empire's founder, called Elstla A.E. Jack, the first hero. Now that is all done Grand Master Owen allow me to convey my proposition. Carlyle sighed in relief. I believe the other worlders who we are fighting against are not demons nor they have any relation to the Dark Lord Allborn at all. Carlyle informs the congregation to their appalling gasps. What blasphemy do you speak of? Owen recoiled. Le Dewey Silverdane, how could you say that after what they had done to Tyrion, Suvil and now the Astrix? Emperor Alden beseech her unsure of what radical thoughts that came out of the college mage's tongue being presented to his ears. Everyone, let me explain in the beginning first. Carlyle invoked the audience's attention to her, to let go of any doubt to what her concocted hypothesis says based on everything she had learned about the crisis so far. When we first attempted back at Tyrion to fool the demon I from scouting for souls in our world, most of our mages, including I could not detect a single trace of corruptive or mana energies from creatures despite sharing similarities to the old demonologist's codex had said. All that they could deduce from their reports is that the creature is made of bits of metal scraps and colorful strings alongside its alien golden organs. The college then attempted to see how the creature would react if we inflicted several of our holy spells at it but the creature has not shown any single reaction to our magics. She calls the reports she and the college demonologists and zoologists made regarding their autopsy of the capture alien being. It could have been already dead to begin with, that is why it not have reacted to our spells. Owen hastily disproved her with a haughty scoff. I am still not convinced. Alden frowned. Then what about our crusade against them? What did they do to us? Kalia asked. What do you mean what they do to us? By tainting the land with their presence, Owen shouts. They invaded our lands. It is our right to fight back. Your Imperial Majesty, do you remember the Steel Cloud when it arrived at our city many moons ago to declare their ultimatum? Carlyle asked the Emperor. Of course. I remember every word they said. Alden nodded. As you remember, the Steel Cloud said that its purpose of visiting our city was to tell you that our attacks upon them in Tyrian and its western plain were unprovoked and they demanded immediate parley with you and your court about those events. They could have just burned Herring Point to the ground immediately the first time they arrived. Carlyle reasoned, we attacked them first, not they attacked us. Would a demon really be that? Callous? That is not how the legends where they had the strength of giants and the anger of dragons robbed off of their young. If they were demons, we would have been overrun by them right now but they didn't. May I also remind you that our, all of our previous spells, our weapons fighting against the demons, all holy and blessed by our most virtuous of priests mind you, failed wholly to harm them? Carlyle said. Then why are they here tainting the lands as they please? Are they not invading already by the way how the Astorux and Tyrion had fallen? Hugit questioned. 
I believe why they are here in such droves was because in our attempt to hide from their demon eyes we had instead deceived them to think the land is empty of any inhabitants. Like a builder, who built his house above a land shark's burrow, we made them believe the land was fully theirs for the taking. Demons would have no use of going to our world if they see no souls to devour, the college mage explained, but now, Upon their arrival these are the worlders, whomever they are now demanding parley with the leaders of the world, that is you and everyone in this room, they have every right to be angry with our actions inflicted upon them before, you say the invaders aren't demons? Ridiculous. Dolman jeered at Carlyle's statement. The prophecy still says that they will seek to end us all, the comet says so. We must steel ourselves for the coming storm. Owen rallied. Silence. Alden gaveled his arm wrist before he speaks. What if their demands to have us share a table with them is just a scheme, a ruse to lure us out of the safety of our walls so they may spring a trap? We would be in their domain where the other world's strength rests upon. Alden reasoned back, his fist pummeling the armrest of his throne. He knew much of the reality's warfare, politics and statesmanship to understand that all peoples have desires and they will do anything to achieve such pursuits. Whether selfish or altruistic, he had seen beggars scrap for the pre-masticated morsels of food thrown out by their more well-off peers, he had seen bandits cut the purses of honest folks to feed their wanton sprees, he had seen courtiers vie for favor behind his palace. And lastly, he had seen during his tours by the frontier the savages of the borders try to scurry away what fruits his people made out of their envy of what the gods favored mandate he and his bloodline received after his great ancestors saved Gleesia from all bones darkness, that is why he and his predecessors fought, provide, and built over centuries from the Vigari Peninsula's humble foundations to what the empire is now today. The line of emperors worked to allow the growth and protection for those who they love, their family, friends, homes, and people from those evil forces that wish to see it be stolen away, and Emperor Alden would be damned to see it all end through him while he drew breath. Yet in contrast, several of his own courtiers began to whisper about Carlyle's speech, her message was articulate enough within reason about the unusual acts these otherworldly invaders were behaving when cross-referencing to their previous recordings. Several of the generals, the senior magi, and the imperial servants were whispering amongst themselves about the reflection of what had transpired due in part to the audacious words of Carlyle Silverdane. These were seeds of doubt the mage had implanted in front of his very soil as Alden and the Grand Master feared. Order. Order on my court. Grand Master Owen shouted. My lord, perhaps we should discuss changing our strategies? Huguet proposed. This woman is a blasphemer. Arrest her and her little brat. The Archbishop demanded. Indeed. Mogul Dolman shook his head. This woman is lying. She is indeed deceived. Perhaps by the songs of heart. To speak so cordially of the invaders of all she could speak well of. They turned my realm into nothingness let me remind you. They will surely do the same to your lands next. The dwarf reduced. Carlyle Silverdane. Alden raised his voice. The Emperor's words silenced the room instantly upon his beckoning call. Your words have merit in spite of your daring display today. Let me say that I am intrigued, curious of what you know which is most illuminating albeit one within unstable grounds he nods, his composure diplomatic, not wanting to immediately take sides until he can get all the facts straight from the antagonistic Carlyle. May I question one thing, why do you question concordance of the prophecy? The Emperor asked. Because the shareholder is one of the other worlders. Carlyle answered, and she saved me and Olera from the volcano. Preposterous, the sacred crystal heart will never do that. Owen yelled, the gods would never choose another worlder, let alone one of the invaders to be its hero. She had likely stolen the brand from the true shareholder or is a false chosen one that lies of her status. Is it even possible to steal a brand, Grandmaster? Carlyle asked. I. Ah. Uh, may. Ah. Uh. The Grandmaster, in an uncharacteristic display of uncertainty became rooted in his own prideful intellective calculus. Perhaps she is just enthralled to think she is one of the other worlders to make her loyal to them for she thinks she is fighting for her people. He boldly conjectured, taking back his previous statement, 
He remained adamant that he, the Grand Master after decades of tireless hierarchical climbing knows everything and that is everything about magics, yet even as he stood his ground, the other people in the room had expressed several assailable doubts in regards to the mage's biting catechism, they were starting to feel the heat of the aforementioned failures that they had concocted when fighting these other worlders and they non-verbally conclude that perhaps a new angle to their current dilemma should be approached. Let us consult the sacred crystal heart for answers then. Carlyle proposed. Fine. We shall but do not think I will take your little dissension of yours lightly. Owen grumbled. This better be worth the time mage. The heart's vault lies at the deepest part of the cathedral. The archbishop gritted. The clergy, the college mages and the arcane experts within the room nods in agreement. All of these new revelations brought to them brings much confusion and the only way they can scry through this clutter of overloaded erudition is to consult the sacred crystal heart itself. They bowed their leave to the emperor as they all collectively exited the archbishop's chamber. You mages go consult the crystal heart. I need to discuss the war plans with the Chosen One right now. Emperor Alden bid them fair tidings as they descend to the underground vaults of the cathedral. The Emperor then stood up from his chair and groaned miserably as he walked towards the war table, the aesthetically contradictory accommodation to a holy see's private chambers. Faith Len my young knight you have new orders. Alden massaged his temple as he overlooks the war table's token pieces and arrow-headed drawings throughout its descriptive display. Based on previously sent orders, the Emperor had dispatched 25 legions, about 250,000 brave souls which is over four-fifths of their entire army, to be sent southwards to defend his realm from the coming invasion. A Slaegian legion would consist of 10,000 men ranging from infantry, cavalry, ranged skirmishers, the commanding officers and the auxiliary camp followers. Thanks to their extensive road system and logistical supply lines they can easily project such a massive amount of men across their territories. He had almost completely abandoned the north to the belligerent Dawson tribes through political favors to be able to muster such a force. Fifteen legions will fortify the Cambervale forests using the various strong points around the area to set up an impregnable defensive line between the unconquerable fortress of Little Hill by the Tyrian border all the way to the lumber town of Vercourt with its excellent supply of wood stocks that can be used to forge fortifications and traps when the manpower is utilized utilized effectively. Seven legions were being forcibly marched towards Marnia's Bluff, a swampy isthmus that sat between the Western Ocean and Dagraw Basin. The geographic location was important for trade as its roads were the most conveniently accessed routes between Suville and Herring Point in addition to the various salt mines and Suvali dye harvesting houses can be found. From a military perspective, the rough terrain can bog down any approaching army from the recently fallen Suvil if the demons were to use the most direct route into Herring Point again like the stories of the famous Battle of Marnia's Bluff that called Elstla A. E. Jack triumphed over the superior armed Auburn and his demon army with clever use of the watery grounds and ambush tactics to whittle down any attempts of breaking through the strategically important terrain. The last three legions will be held in reserve at the capital readying themselves to quickly react to any faltering defensive positions if they were at risk of collapsing. The Emperor deemed that Little Hill, Vercourt and Marnia's bluff must be held at all costs, and that is not to also account the promised help from the elves, the remnant dwarves with their nothing left to lose attitude and any intrepid adventurer guildsmen would raise to multiply their respective force against the demon tide. For their allies of the Eth Island on Daunt, they have sent several of their most valorous warriors led by the elven royal family's own child, Prince Valorian, known to be a maverick for daring attacks and exotic tactics. Accompanying him are a collection of all the mightiest roster of the Entente's military might, valiant rainbow helms, sword sinners, resplendent glade hearth cavalry, alluring the deadly wardances, high mages and their many arcane beasts. All accounting 80,000 of them. There was also Quite unexpectedly, a letter of promissory intent from sealed by the orchid seal from the Black Tree Pact Elves. 
They are also arriving with a fleet of soldiers of 70,000 to assist in the defense of the Stlaeijan homeland as were their honor was pre-sundering with Kul del Stlaeijak. Unlike before with the utilitarian purposes in mind to stop the first demonic invasion, the Pact Elves' interests were far more selfish in nature. In exchange for their invaluable support, they arrogantly demanded that they, to get as many unpleasant terms out of the mouth, turn over the Empire into de facto subservience to the Black Tree Pact's ruling Midnight Camarilla. Emperor Elden knew that deals with the Eth Island's estranged kin were capricious in terms often using intimidation and coercion to ensure the Pact Hells get their way. In his best foreknowledge and the suggestions of the Eth Island Sephide Liad is to play along with their designs for now and then find a way to force them to back out of the deal. Prince Valorian suggested sending the Dark Elves to the front lines of the battle and have themselves get overextended and likely slaughtered, exploiting their tones of excessively confident aptitude to show their superiority to the other race. A conniving plan, getting rid of a potential problem by turning the troublesome subject into expendable pawns for a solution. Alden can expect to hear exploits from the Black Tree Pact's warriors consisting of the graceful Sisters of the Blade, the elusive Unseen, the terrifying Dread Steeds, the harrowing Black Thorn Riders plus their levied footmen and monsters tamed under their employ. The remnant dwarves that Dolmond and the dwarven hold survivors of Tyler, Darbadi, and Merlaram had brought over can be levied by Elden's best estimates of 60,000 men. They were however mixed in composition, consisting of professional clan bondsmen and raw conscripts. The dwarves were all physically healthy despite their recent hardships, hardy and unafraid. The Emperor could sketch their desperation into a formidable force with a few carefully selected words alongside having them train together for a few days. They will be needed especially for defending key points thanks in part to the magazine-fed crossbows the dwarven sting eyes wield in the Scandinite armor the Everbeards. The Adventurers Guild were perhaps the most informal of people that the Emperor has in his disposal. Although they do share a respected hierarchy with many of their members showing a diverse set of skills and talents, they were not designed, by their small scale and individualistic roster of an estimated 10,000 adventurers to be frontline fighters. They had an unreliable estimate of combat effectiveness due to their roster composing of elite and rookie members. Their enthusiasm could be exploited. Adventurers can be used as scouts or be sent behind enemy lines to perform dangerous assignments. Keeping them motivated however will be a challenge due to their undisciplined nature. Then came the Empire's most prestigious of men and women. The College of Magi. Their vast knowledge of magics and all things arcane collected and refined over the years would prove invaluable for the coming battles ahead. He can the adepts of the college to perform a wide variety of battle-related spells such as calling forth magical storms, conjured blades, but also several of their arcane artifacts such as the Altar of Dolin. Named after the God of Magic, the wagon carried construct made from the college's understanding of mana crystals with the aid of Agtokalite. Its official function is to magnify the effects of magical spells cast when named towards altar's lenses for exponential effect. For example, a simple fireball spell can have its range and effect drastically improved or a ward meant to shield one person be capable of protecting a significantly wide radius. There may be only around 800 or so of them who have the magical proficiency to be deemed battle mages, not including those former students who are either scattered about across the world as traveling arcanists or as members of the Adventurers Guild. Overall, the defenses must be built quickly around those strong points before the demons can thrust in from the mountains for their assault. Once they tire out and an opening for a counterattack present itself, he will launch an offensive starting with the reoccupation of Suville from the demon menace until he can push them back to their stronghold of Tyrian and punish the traitorous Prince Clovich for selling his soul to all bones minions. We make our stand at Vercourt the salt mine and little hill. If any of them were to fall our sacred homeland will be it that stands before them. Alden emphasizes the importance of the three strategic locations of the Imperial defensive line. So these demons. They fight how again? Huguet questioned. Based on what reports we have of those who survived or witnessed them fighting, 
They normally prefer to fight from afar with the use of their black staves. Sir Hugot answered, as for when the demons will descend upon us, that is what I fear the most for we do not have any report of when and how large the demon army is. There were scouts who had attempted to count their numbers but none have so far reported anything. I fear the worst for them. Petra answered, ordinarily, I dislike fighting if I do not know what or how many I face. Petra added, gritting his teeth in frustration. Then if we are fighting an army that prefers to attack from a distance then we will need to use the terrain to our advantage. Blind them under the cover of the trees and bushes while trapping them in areas that we can cut them down swiftly on. Hugot answered, I say with two to three weeks worth of preparation, our battle lines should be ready to face them. You have one week. Alden pushed him. Dolman's people can see to that. He nodded to the dwarf who cooperatively gave his silent word for extending his aid to engineering matters too and not only military. Cowards they all are not to fight in honorable combat. Faith Len huffed, they seek to drown us in a torrent of their blades. You were defeated by one, in honorable combat no less, when we were at the Dwarven realms mind you Faith Len. Petra reminded him. It does not matter, we must take the fight to them and charge forth towards their stronghold of Tyrian. The Bane Chosen One proposed, don't not be so brash like what you were when we were at the Dwarven realms Faith Len. Our men were massacred when carelessly ordered them to charge at Nurnkarim only for nearly all of them. Some of the emperors and the moguls finest to perish so swiftly. Petra reminded him much to his displeasure, without at least bringing a ladder no less. He added, you ordered my men to die like that? How could you? Dolman scolded Faith Len. There was a dragon, they had a dragon at their side. It breathed its fire and destroyed the army. Faith Len said. And who gave you authority to order my men to follow you? Dolman questioned him. The gods of course. I am the chosen one, the bane of the demons. Faith Len arrogantly shouted. None of them will stand a chance against my might. Put me where the battle shall be the thickest. Silence. All of you. We will not go anywhere if we fight amongst ourselves right now. The emperor shouted. March of Garmhaic. May you please learn to humble yourself for this once. Our enemies test our abilities in every way. Alden raised, his voice remaining diplomatic but it was now boiling to the limit thanks in no part to Faith Len's naivete. I shall not soothsay, your magics is still budding in talent in spite of your prodigious nature, but the shareholder and her demonic mentors are at least master level of arcane might. If you so stubbornly refuse to accept that you have indeed lost against them you will in all prospects end up like poor Marchog Fawn and those ill-fated men who have died at the Aslrix. Petra again reminded him. Tivna have mercy on them. He prayed, are you saying I won't be sent to the front lines? Faith Len bided. Not yet, you still require training, and the men I have given you needs to be equipped. As much as they can their new weapons from the dwarves. My most humble condolences Dolmond, Alden said. You humble me more with your clemency your imperial majesty. Dolmond bowed. This is outrageous. Faith Len exclaimed. I myself must be out there, slaying demons and protecting the realm. Not here, he protested. He impatiently and childishly stomped the wood floor of the archbishop's chamber imprudently making unwise to straight up imbecilic demands from one that knows better. March of Garmhaic behave yourself. Have you forgotten you are in my presence? Alden shouted. His limits now stretched beyond his reticence that he can hold. The Emperor was now collapsing onto the pressure the crisis has lambasted him with. He was already balancing a fine line between the risks and yields his calculated decisions he has made to preserve his realm and his position and this child plucked from the masses to be the god's chosen one is starting to undermine the crystal heart's very own purpose. Faith Len was like many of the young-blooded noble children of today, hiding behind and wielding their privilege without any grace or the tact that a respectable noble would swim themselves to the rhythm of social norms of unwritten law for. He had thought that assigning Faith Len a responsibility with a few mentors to keep him in check would mature him to the ideal hero, one that is brave selfless, clever and justly preeminent. Instead, the power amplified Faith Len's worst aspects. His naivete, his childlike idealism, 
impetuousness and recalcitrance in the pursuit of surpassing heroic deeds. If this was any of his children, he would have sent them far away to a monastery to learn proper manners and not let them return until they learn how to properly behave oneself at the cruel outside world. Hello, a faint voice creaked from behind the archbishop's door. Two children, a boy and a girl, wearing their champagne manies alike peeked over the door and their eyes staring deeply at the scene before them as they made themselves inside. Who let these imps into the cathedral? Faith Len bawled. This is discussion so for the more ripened of us. He scolded the intruders. March of Garmhaik. That is no way to address the imperial science. General Huguet rebuked, revealing the identity of these two newcomers. A hundred apologies, my prince and princess. I did not know of your arrival at all. Faith Len bowed, his heart racing by the disciplinary admonishment. He didn't want to offend the emperor again with his brashness again, not whilst his imperial majesty is carrying so much burden now that he stopped to understand the full extent of the crisis. Those are your children old mogul Dolmond asked Arthurfra Estris, were you bending your ears again? The emperor asked them. Forgive us father, Estris stepped forward daringly but with a slight gist of fear shaking on her foot, but me and my brother have worried about you. And now you we had heard you shouting from the other side of the hall. Are you furious at us? Did we do something wrong? Arta from meekly asked. By the gods no. I can never be furious at you too. Alden climbed up from his chair and hugged his two twins warmly. Further is just. Working hard right now. He explained. Work? Like ruling? Commanding the legions? Oh, how lively. Estrus gleefully cantered. Who are we fighting against now? Pirates? Marauders? Bandits? She pestered. Oh, it's quite troublesome to describe. Alden blushed. He was still reluctant to expose his two children. The product of love from his late wife Aaron gave to the world before Neneth took her away. The harsh realities of ruling a dozen million strong empire. Who is that handsome fellow with Uncle Huguet? Estrus pointed to Faithlen. A hundred more apologies your highness. Faithlen bowed again. I am Marchog Faithlen Garmhaik. The bane chosen one. The hero? Estrus gasped excitedly. I am so delighted to meet your acquaintance. I am Princess Estrus Lae Jack, the first of my name and, ahem, Princess of the Imperial Throne. She bowed elegantly. Her feminine aura alongside her stylish dress raised the chosen one from the depths of his recent humiliation into a new paradigm. Estrus was beautiful beyond compare that he has seen before, only words describing princesses like her from passing bards that graced his little hometown with their songs that they captured to melodize aforesaid grace with romantic hymns. This is my brother, Arthur Forrest Lae Jack, fourth of his name and of course the crown prince of the imperial throne. If he can just stop lazing about in his room, Estrus teases, it is an honor to meet both of you. Faith Len forced himself to smile to not break his repairing rectitude. No, it is an honor to meet you. She awkwardly flattered him. Such a handsome and brave boy in armor is such an imposing presence to be in front of me. She blushed. Faith Len embarrassingly turned his neck to the emperor his eyes locking onto his master with nervous intent before turning back to Estris. How many villains have you righteously slain today? You must have bursted dozens or thousands of them right? You must show me your prowess in battle one day my brave knight. I always desire to be a mighty knight like you, but you? You are the hero of the realm, Estris innocently acclaims and my hero too dot 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 tilde she flushed as he gently grasps the chosen one's hand. At first Faithlen was lauded by the imperial princess bright words, but knowing he is under the scrutinizing eye of her father, the chosen one had to tactfully reel his hand. My children, March of Garmhaik needs to attend more time at the training yard honing his skills in combat and etiquette. Alden politely explained to them as best as he could while keeping a firm eye at Faith Len who was starting to get a little bit too close to his precious daughter for his own comfort. Oh, I can always watch dot 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 tilde she tittered, her chest beating as she effeminately hid her guffaw from the young knight. I know you would my little dragon. Alden petted her at the back, but Tad has important business to attend to. Father. 
You have been away from me and sis for a long time. Artafra rubbed his eyes with his arms as he yawned. Will you be able to spend some time with us today? The emperor sighed, he may be a calculative man who in his many years of ruling always followed the notion to shadow his next maneuver in secrecy, but he was the exact opposite when it comes to matters of family. I cannot I am afraid, he apologized to the two of them. But, let me profess to you this. I love both of you. Alden sincerely expressed. If you love us, then spend time with us. Read me a story, Estrus pleaded. Teach me how to rule like you father. Arthurfra added. Again, I cannot, at least not now. Alden stood up. Can you promise to tend to us tomorrow then? Estrus asked. And may the gods spirit me away if I break it. The emperor raised his hand and swore. The twins' personal servants rallied forth to the door timely as they had searched frantically for the two scions. They humbly bowed to his imperial majesty as they shepherded the children away from his sight. Alden sighed as he returned to his chair. He was never the perfect father for Estrus and Arthurfra. At best he was more of a sponsor for their upbringing, materially providing the best of everything a future imperial royal would need to bud into the next generation of the Slaeagian lineage, but as he thought of his children, he cursed himself and begged forgiveness to his late wife Erin, he promised her that he will carry both of them into his caring arms the same way he swept her onto his when they were first betrothed. Alden concludes that perhaps it was not prayers to the gods that would give him solace but instead the company of the few joys he had left in his drained life in the form of Princess Istris and Prince Arthurfra IV. But for now, he has a realm to protect. He needed to protect not only his people but his children as well. Sifridanol, please proceed. He prompted Hugo to continue. Dash. It was brief but nervous tour descending through the cathedrals underground. They passed by reliquaries, tombs and several shrines before the priests ordered them to kneel respectively as they find themselves before golden shrine adorned with jewelry and the statues of several ancient saints. The crystal heart itself lay inside a glass chest adorned with runic symbols and sitting itself below a velvet pillow. Complementing the display was a mosaic display both below their feet and below their heads depicting the mythology wrapped story of the sacred crystal heart. According to the legends, Called Delstla Ejak during his quest to defeat Orbon stumbled inside a mythical cave when he rested to find the sacred crystal heart when heard of a rumor of a power that can strengthen him for the coming confrontation with the Dark Lord Orbon. The crystal heart spoke to him and he asked the crystal heart to help him defeat Orbon and his army to save Glyse Year. The holy relic gave Kuldel his mythical strength to defeat the demons and he brought the crystal back to his clan's holy shrine of whose ancient grounds became the foundation for the Grand Cathedral of Herring Point. After the end of the first demonic invasion and Kuldel disappearance, the crystal heart remained in its place at the shrine, now revered as a divine boon from the gods to help Gleesia in times of need whenever dark forces or great trials befall their chosen peoples. A brief prayer was sung as the clerics and priests, the only people allowed to lay a finger on the holy relic, slowly and respectfully brought the crystalline object out on full unmitigated display atop of a pedestal. Finishing their prayers, the mages and the priestly congregation began to enchant their magics onto the relic to rouse it from its slumber. Before you continue, a young masculine voice echoed the hallowed halls of the cathedral underground spoke. It was Faith Len, who came running across the sacred grounds of the cathedral as bluntly as he was hurriedly approaching the group waved his hands. Chosen one, do you have no courtesy? You are in the presence of the divine gods. Carlia scolded him. I am sorry. But I was told by the emperor that I should see the crystal heart again. I too must consult it. He huffed beneath his breaths. Very well. But please do be more respectful for once. Carlyle hesitantly gave him amnesty. They were all down here for the same purpose after all. Shall we begin? Olera asked the archbishop. The pontiff nodded quietly as he turned about face to the crystal heart and lead the ritual. O oh, great crystal heart, whose wisdom is infinite and benevolence knows no bounds. We humbly but warily aroused you from your slumber once again to seek your guidance. The archbishop beseeched the relic. What is it? You ask of me children? 
The sacred crystal heart softly answered, its form flickering like the beating of a heart. The shareholder, one whom you and your infinite wisdom chose to lead our peoples against the coming darkness is said to have been enthralled by the demons themselves and being made to fight against us. Grandmaster Owen said, I humbly ask if there is a way, we can break the enthralling spell that befell the chosen one so that she may see the light of her error and fight alongside the bane to fulfill the prophecy for the new age. He asked the crystal, the scholar too. It is said that the demons are searching for him and we fear the worst if both the shareholder and the scholar chosen ones combine their strengths so that they may devour all that is sacred, beautiful and just through all of our realms. We humbly ask you to help us search for the scholar before all bones hordes finds him first. The archbishop asked, Crystal Heart. Faith Land piously interjects, as your champion. Can you reveal to me the most decisive means to fulfill my great destiny as the savior of Bly's year? Can you grant me more power so I can ride south to Tyrion and vanquish Auburn and his armies to save this realm like the founder king called Elstla a e. Jack before? He asked. Is that all you ask of me? The relic said as if perplexed by their so-called inquiries. Then, I have nothing more to speak of. The crystal heart declares before the light that once illuminate the holy chamber so brilliant no so dispiritedly overshadow by the gods. What is the meaning of this? Owen quickly stood up and attempted to beseech the crystal heart. Hurry, reinvigorate the relic with magics, the archbishop ordered. The mages frantically channeled their mana energies onto the sacred crystal heart, exhaustively pushing their bodies beyond their limits. One by one. They collapsed to the cathedral's floors suffering the debilitating effects of mana consumption, Carlyle included. This is pointless, Owen bellowed. He was the last mage to stop his channeling when he saw his fellow magic users collapse. He looked towards the crystal heart once again, still inert and unresponsive to external input. He panted and sweated as he leaned over a pillar to catch himself. Grandmaster, what do we do? The archbishop turned to him his desperation breathing through his mouth. I, I, I do not understand, Owen answered. You do not understand? The archbishop hesitated. How can you not know? He pleaded. The crystal heart it is. It is. I, Owen stuttered as he looked at the people who were left stunned by the relics for lack of a more suitable term revelation which was no revelation at all. Grandmaster you have to know of a way. One of the mages begged him. That same mage was followed by more of them who beseech for answers, answers that he has, for the first time in all of his long tenure, cannot provide. The Grandmaster of Magics, humbled down by a horizon he could not fathom. He had always taken pride of his vast intellectual capacity to understand every fundamental aspect of magics, rink, illusion, focal, conjuration. Lug, alteration, Nangai, restoration, and Dikawi, destruction. In all of his knowledge nothing could bring an answer to what had transpired before him. And for all of his bravado of his supremacy over all things arcane, he was left in most ungracefully scorned by this embarrassment. Grandmaster, what are we to do? Carlyle asked him. I, ah, uh, Owen stuttered. Head for the college. Look for anything related to the arts of divination magical channeling and about the chosen one branding, Owen ordered, dash. A couple of sunrises passed over since the incident at the cathedral and the college of magi were still left clueless of what had happened. The imperial powers that be were left in a frenzy of panicked storms as men and women scrambled to figure out how to revive the sacred crystal heart. It was only through the stoic leadership of Emperor Olden that prevented chaos from erupting at such an inopportune time in Herring Point, but only barely, the legionnaires working in tandem with the dwarven recruits had recently marched off to the front lines as scheduled in the same vein that both the Earth Island and Black Tree Elf reinforcements would arrive at their designated positions would too. However, although the military aspect of the defense of the Imperial Heartlands were going smoothly, the more magically inclined and logistical facets were far more troublesome. 
The harvest scheduled this week had been severely damaged causing a short supply in fresh produce as food resources that were being diverted to feed the soldiers leaving most common folks to ration or scrap by pre-masticated morsels to live through the cold nights ahead. According to the estimates by the Empire's agricultural overseers over three out of five plots of the Empire's farmlands were damaged to varying degrees with those closer to the Estlrooks bearing the heaviest strain on the Imperial food stocks to matters even more dire. There were also several reports of food-related riots sparking across the Imperial lands which further drained manpower that the Imperial Army needed for their war effort. Emperor Alden had sent forth in response not only several heavy-handed approaches but a wave of rehabilitative works to address the food shortages such as reducing taxes on the most severely affected areas farmlands and sending out restoration mages from the college to help salvage whatever still edible produce that can still be saved before the irreversible happened. Speaking about mages, the College of Magi are barely faring any better. Research related to demons were prepared and were being accelerated albeit due to the lack of any subjects to work with. It was effectively left in a standstill with only old written script from centuries past to refer by. Those mages who were most proficient in combat-related spells such as alteration and destruction were being sent off to the front lines accompanying the legionnaires marching southwards. There was also a circle of mages dedicated to training Marchog Faith Langarm Haik and research any means of reviving the sacred crystal heart so that its guidance can be used again if they were to utilize all three of the chosen ones to their advantage against the coming demon tide. Carlia Silverdane and Olera Ekroth were two such collegiates. I know that Lindis used to keep several of her letters somewhere in here. There has to be something we have missed. Carlia sputtered. She had grown a growing premonition over the Cephid Liad agent's letters who was a reliable source of first-hand information for the College of Magi on the subject of the other worlders' behavioral patterns and their characteristics. Letters that she had magical sent out were stored within the college's archive for safekeeping and thanks to a few connections within the college. The two collegiates were given access to a typically restricted floor within the college. The college mage turned gold ranked adventurer was still physically tired from her harrowing experience back at the cathedral but now just today she was able to stand upright without the help of a cane or someone else to hold her hand through. They should be somewhere here. Perhaps the elf's findings on the other worlders could somehow help figure out how we might be able to understand these invaders, most especially the shareholder, Samantha, Olera said. The girls quickly scoured about the archive, dredging through the piles of paper, searching desperately for Linda's reports. Here it is. This was her handwriting and her seal. Carlia declared as she held a handful of circular elven scrolls with Linda's elven signature written at its head. Curling the paper all around itself, Carlia begins to read out the papers that she can read intermediate levels of elven calligraphy. So far most of what Lindis had described has already been common knowledge by the learned scholars and demonologists such herself and Olera. There was however the mention of a spell called Holy Firefly that she assumed was an elven innovation she had not heard of. Her search produced no fruit to say the least. Nothing. At least we had tried. Carlia sank her head. A throw? What will happen to us? Olera asked her. What do you speak of? Carlia asked. The apprentices? The Blawidian Gantaf? She asked. There is a war going on. Will my mage friends be sent off to fight the war? Olera held the senior's hand and looked on worryingly to the gold adventurer's eyes. Gods no, you are still my Rybark. You have your whole lives ahead of you. Carla dismissed Olera's fears. Most of the first year students of the college who were sent there have not yet been reached to adulthood yet. She was always an exemplar to the younger students of the college thanks to her academic acumen. The tales of her exploits as an adventurer and compliments by her fairness coming from the prestigious and noble Silverdane family, Carlia was the latest in the line of one of the most influential familial figures in the college, her late further being a much beloved professor in the arcane arts. Let me say to you this. If things go wrong, I will make sure, with all of my might that the first years are never approached by the Keth was. She reassured her with gratitude Athro. Olera smiled. 
Let's just get these letters to the elven envoy and let us retire to our rooms for the night. The two collegiates quietly made their way out of the archive but as they were about to leave, they heard a ghostly voice tingle their ears. It is done. That troublesome guilt had been wiped off the face of Gleesia, now it is your turn for your end of the deal. A voice spoke. You ask for too much Donalmond. Another voice echoed. Did you hear that? Olera asked, careful to minimize the sound of her voice. Who is saying that? She asked. I do. Carlia nodded quietly. Their suspicions and curiosity peaked. The two tiptoed their way closer to the source of the sound. From their discernment, it had looked like it had come from Grandmaster Owen's office which is adjacent to the archive. Why is Mogul Dolman doing here in the college so late into the night? It was rather strange however, normally at this hour most students and staff would have retired for the night especially in this area of the college, the duo being the exception thanks to Carla's aforementioned influence. The adventurer placed her rear by the Grandmaster's door as she began to fully eavesdrop on the conversation being guarded behind it, Owen, my friend, we have been reciprocating collaborators for a very long time. I know what I asked of you is quite so soon but we are in a crisis here. Dolman's voice told the second participant. The Grandmaster is talking with the Dwarven Mogul at this hour. Carlyle thought, the way those words were framed strike as being that the two had some sort of deal they had made, but that was outlandish. The Dwarves typically deal with Imperial traders as middlemen to their slay agent contacts. The college, although publicly funded outside of alumni donations typically have no say and authority on how the deals for Mana Crystals, Actocolite, Scandonite and Gyronite ingots would go directly. Mogul Dolmond, this crisis is why I cannot risk moving forward with our mutual goals at this moment. The Empire needs me to lead the Arcanum during this war. As you have said I know of our deal but my powers have limits. Owen tactfully declined. I will not be a mogul for long once this war crusade skirth fully walks on its legs. My title is no longer guaranteed. The other moguls have way much more skill in leading warriors than I ever could. Now that my mine is destroyed, I barely have any power left with the other nobles. I am slowly becoming irrelevant. You have to just use your sway in the imperial court to discourage any usurpation against me. I am still the dwarven mogul after all. Dolman gravely tells him of his political situation. Why it is too much to ask Grandmaster. We both have the same goals and that is maintaining our power over our people. I had completed my end of our bargain by ridding of those nuisance tinkerers guild permanently. The demons might have destroyed the Astrox but at in their destruction benefited you now by totally removing the potential threat to the mage class by destroying the knowledge and means to enable any more of those pestering terrorist dwarves into creating that hideous steam drill. Dolmond coldly stated. If the steam drill had fully been perfected without his intervention, Mogul Dolmond and his geomancers would lose much useful value ergo political power over their ability to rule over the terraced dwarves if the commoner can drill down to the Gleesian earth just as easily as the mages. Carlia and Olaira could feel their anger slowly boiling over at how apathetic that Mogul Dolmond talked about his oppressive rule against the plebeian masses that he rules over. They remembered how he had only cared about himself and his fellow court to evacuate the East Rock Mountains but hearing his complacency of what he had done to the terraced dwarves added a new level of depth into the atrocious character that was the Kerfold Hermogul. But even worse than that, was how he was conspiring with Grandmaster Owen, the epitome of all things arcane be so complacent let alone promoting the oppressive ill-doing of the dwarven social classes made Carlyle's stomach broil. Again. I cannot at this or the next few days. At best what I compel the Emperor to do is to award you new lands that your people can resettle on. I simply buy your rivals for you without risking our alliance. He continued to decline Dolman's demands. We are in crisis now and you are attempting to eat the whole pie too quickly during super. We need the other moguls to lead the remaining dwarven warriors into battle. We can discuss getting rid of your rivals so you may have sole reign over the dwarven people after we defeat the demons. I will not last long enough to see the end of this war Grandmaster. You have to help me immediately or you will lose your allies from the mountains. 
You owe me this for I have done so much. Dolmond pleaded. I owe you only for sabotaging the steam drill for you that killed your brother whom you were so willing to sacrifice so that you can blame it all on the terrorist dwarves for their failure. Should it not be that you owe me an equal favor now? Owen replied. I ask you this fight in the front lines and donate all that is left of your wealth to the college's expedition coffers or I will sever ties with you here and now. I beg of you, just one more favor and I will repay you back tenfold. Dolmond beseeched him, but Owen stood in front of him in silence, not saying another word in the matter. It was either his way of political maneuvering or the dishonor of being dethroned. He knows what he wants and he will not continue to go on with his clandestine relationship with the Mogul until it begins to bear fruit. Then you have leave me no choice. Dolmond gritted his hands and teeth. You and I both know that if anyone else knows of what we have done, we will both be unseated from our lofty standings, he coyly hissed. Are you attempting to coerce me, Mogul Dolmond? The Grand Master asked. I can end you now if I wanted to. Your shallow words are meaningless to me, he ridiculed, do you recall the name Kima Grandmaster? Dolmond asked, at the same time, as if fate both brought Kalia and Owen together, their hearts skipped a beat upon hearing that name, they know that name so well, even if it was a long time that the mention of that name was broached for. Kima Silverdane, my old friend, one of the best professors of the college. Yes, I do. Owen nodded, do not deceive me. He was never your friend. At least, not before the last Grandmaster, his brain told all his students and all his subordinates that he was slowly dying of an incurable illness. Dolman discredit the Grandmaster's previous sentence. I do not know what are you talking about. Owen feigned ignorance. Oh, I do know what I speak of. Murderer, Dolman said. H. How? Owen stuttered. In his weakness, he exposed himself and confirmed the dwarf's suspicions. Oldsburn had two candidates to choose for his successor, two professors, you and Kima. Yet you knew that it was likely going to be Kima who will become the Grand Master and not you. Dolmond badgered, much to the Grand Master's shaken form. Oh Owen, despite his daring and fiery attitude simply could not, would not and cannot accept that he, Severin's most shining and most daring protege can be looked over to the more tranquil and reserved Kima. So, you acted swiftly. You had a forger imitate Sprint's handwriting on his will by switching the names between your friend Kima and yourself. When the Silverdane got too close to the truth you arranged him to be sent on a retrieval expedition where he suffered an unfortunate accident. Dolman said, how did you know? The Grand Master asked him. You are not the only person that uses the crows for their interests. Dolmond smirked as he saw the Grand Master cracked before him. Spirin was a fool to pass over me for Kima when choosing his successor. I am everything. I had the cunning, the wisdom and the drive and the intellect. What did Kima had that I don't? Nothing. He is the very antithesis of me. Quiet, sluggish and always content. I had a dream. I had a desire. The desire to see magics rule all of the Boar Girl. To serve us mages. Kima was and will always be a stubborn fool. He can never see what magics can truly do. Owen raised his voice. Perhaps now I understand why Sperrin originally chose Kima Silverdane over you. Dolman smugly grinned. How dare you? Carlia barged through the room, Olayra following suit. Her unexpected entrance jilted both of the old men in the room. My father was a wise and thoughtful man. He had served the college selflessly for all of his life. Carlyle cried, how dare you for not only desecrating his name but be in league with this despicable dwarf who would kill his own people at his mines for ducats and to stay on his ill-gotten throne. She denounced both of them, Grand Master. I had always thought you were the wisest of the archmages of the college. We had always looked up to you as the paragon of arcane might, but I renounce my patronage. How could you be so dishonorable? Expedition funds? Suppressing the poor terrorist dwarves who are trying to better themselves? How could you? Olay rejoined in with her senior. Do you not understand that magic is what separates us from many others? La Dewey Silverdane? Can you not see that we are all born with power? Kima Silverdane was weak to not see what magic can truly become. Like all the other so called wizards, too. The vampires. The shamans. They do not understand what is the truest and purest of magics. 
Have you seen what I have built, the monuments, the great inventions and discoveries that I, I have made? Owen defended himself. Oh, I see perfectly Grand Master. Carlyle puffed, an institution dedicated to selfish gains, the domination of those lower than themselves, the inhibition of those who learn of magic's ways differently and perverting the teachings of Talin of using magic's as a tool into a, a, Parodical doctrine of highbrowing sloth, is this what I am fighting for? Carlyle shouted. This act of villainy will be your downfall. The Emperor will know of this. Olera declared, do you honestly think that anyone will believe you about what me and Dolmond have been doing to the Dwarven people after that brazen display of you two have done back at the Cathedral, defending the other world's actions and directly questioning the prophecy I had foreseen was it not? Owen challenged her. If you truly want to be of help the Empire then get out there tomorrow and of you and the rest of the students prepare to march for battle. He ordered her. Then I have no reason to believe your stupid prophecy or the other world as being the demons of old. Sam was right about you. You are just an old fool who dabbled in magics you don't understand and try to hide your failings by quashing those who question you. Grand Master's brain was right for not choosing you. As long that we still breathe we deliver justice for all the innocents you wrong, me among them. Carlyra announced. You two are the only demons we see here. Olera backed Carlyle up. As long as you breathe. Eh? Dolman echoed ominously Carlyle's words. He twitched his eyebrows as he looked before from what he sees as vermin that needed to be squashed before his house rots with their infectious influence. I never knew I would have to do this Ledewey Silverdane. I thought I have to only deal with your father but it looks like the guad fruit does not fall far from the tree. He apologized. Owen conjured his magics from his hands as he charged his body for a spell. Look out. Carlyle shoved Olera behind her as she shielded themselves with a quickly casted ward that blocked Owen's thunderbolt. You have been a thorn at our side for long enough. Mogul Dolmond unsheathed his hammer. Time to end you. Carlyle and Olera nimbly dodged the wild swing of the angered dwarf as the two fled the Grand Master's office, quickly losing the two villains' line of sight. We have been found. Dolmond mouth frothed at Owen. All because you would not let me have what I want. No we are not. Owen quickly thinked at the skip of his feet. Guards. He yelled. Before long a squad of patrolling college guards entered the mogul's room. What has happened? There seems to be some sort of break in. One of the guards asked noting the disorderly scene that was produced in the wake of Owen's earlier thunderbolt spell. Me and Mogul Dolmond were discussing several plans for the war effort when suddenly Carlyle Silverdane attempted to assassinate me. She screamed to me, all bones shall return triumphant. I managed to protect the Mogul from her magics before she attempted to flee. Owen lied. He turned his head to the dwarf his eyes intently telling him without the need of being spoken to play along with his deceit. If you hurry you may catch her. She must be punished, the mogul said. At once Grand Master, the guards said. The guards quickly to their leave and hurriedly reported to the captain of the college's guards of the attempted treason. Before long, the bells of the college, typically used to either arouse the faculty and students from slumber or to signify important campus-related events was used to alarm all of the mages of the college of the most horrifying of developments. That Carlyle Silverdane has turned her back on her nation, her liege, her people and the gods. What do we do with her? Olera asked Carlyle. If we can reach the stables, we may be able to escape. Carlyle proposed. Escape where? The Grand Master will likely send bounty hunters and adventurers to find us no matter where we go. Olayra mentioned their abysmal odds of escape. Where else but the one place they will never march towards? Carlyle answered. There is nowhere else to go but there. You are not proposing. Olayra's eyes widened, knowing what her teacher is nominating the course of their next action. Tyrian Carlyle confirmed her radical decision. We shall gamble our lives by seeking refuge there. If we are fortunate perhaps the shareholder Sam can give us sanctuary from the Empire's wrath. What you propose is most perilous to even attempt to do. Olayra nervously gave comment. If we time our journey during the night. We can avoid most of the patrols until we reach that principality. It is our only chance of survival Olayra. Carlyle explained her plans, but what about the first year students? 
What will happen to them? You promised to protect them. Olaira reminded her. I cannot protect them if I am dead. Right now, we must leave Herring Point and ride for Tyrian. Hurry. Carlia pushed her junior forward. The two young women scampered off, avoiding the search parties and rudely awakened mages who were now frantically to varying degrees of aptitude searching for them to prevent them from escaping. Carlia's previous mana exhaustion not helping even out their chances of escape, but as if by the grace of the high wills, the pair made it to the college's stables undetected. What will happen if we do reach Tyrian? Olaira asked. Find Sam. She is the only person amongst the other worlders who can help us. Carlia answered. They mounted up to one of the steeds on the college's stables, Carlia taking the stirrup and the junior Olaira holding onto her back. With a quick kick from the adult mage, they galloped forth. Over there, one of the guards shouted as he spotted the two newly disgraced collegiates bolted out of the college. A barrage of magic missiles and arrow fire rained down upon Carlia and Olaira's steed as they raced towards the slowly closing gate that barred Haring Point from the wilderness outside. But just as the steed was about to reach the threshold, Carlia heard a soft whimpering squeal behind her. Olaira, she shouted. The young girl lay down on the ground with a bleeding wound on her back. The college mage cantered towards the girl before dismounting to tend to her docent pupil. Carlia, I am so sorry. Olaira coughed. You need to. The shareholder. Only she. Only she. Can. No. I promised to protect you. Carlia shot her down, she could not accept seeing one of her juniors fall upon the very thing that she is trying to protect them from, to be a casualty in a war. Go. Olaira's arm pushed through Carlia's breasts away as she made herself clear of what the young scholastic girl wanted her to do. With great reluctance and deep regret, Carlia remounted her steed and galloped off, leaving a slowly bleeding out Olaira to be cornered by their pursuers. Olaira, I always knew you were corrupted all along. Faith Len walked towards his former childhood friend, Little Fish. You are still that foolish little boy. After all these years, she laughed comically. You know the penalty for treachery Olaira? Faith Len asks of her. My death will bring nothing, but let me tell you this little fish. You are among more demons than you think. Olaira spat at him. You are wrong demon. I had enough of your lies and vicious mockeries. Faith Len bawled madly as he pulled out his sword and with one swift slash, cut Olaira down. Ranu Putta. Save us. As if in one final insult to his ego, Olaira's mask lay now forever frozen, a slight smile of satisfaction as the girl willingly let go of her spirit from this mortal coil. News eventually spread quickly about the attempted assassination attempt of the Grand Master in Herring Point, all of its citizens quick to condemn the cowardly attack and equally as eager to march to the nearest recruiting clerks to have them outfitted into the Slaegian Legion for their patriotic duty to defend their motherland from the otherworldly threat. Dash. Meanwhile as Herring Point was left tattled by the attempted assassination attempt, Carlia Silverdane wasted no time galloping at full speeds with her mount south of Herring Point, only pausing to consume nourishments, the closest territory she can recall that was is considered otherworldly territory was through the newly conquered Suville in which she has to pass by several of nightly patrols and hastily dispatched bounty hunters to capture her. The harrowing journey lasted her two days, before she reached Marnia's Bluff, the northernmost point of Suville, but as she began to rest easy now that she has made it towards the domain of the invaders. An arrow struck the mage's steed. Due to its exhaustive use thanks in no part to Carlia's haste, the colt collapsed to the ground as she wiggled off her crushed leg from the wounded man before clumsily pushing herself southwards. She simply cannot give up now, not while the lives of many people are at stake, not when her country aimlessly charges forth to a war that they cannot win. Not while the machinations of Grand Master Owen causes the downward spiral that will cause its collapse. Carlia Silverdane must persevere. There she is. Get her. One of the bounty hunters shouted. A relentless barrage of arrows began to rain down on her position as Carlia scampered forward. But the area around her in Marnia's bluff was desolate. It lacked any means of concealment nor cover. To make her predicament direr, 
the damp sand swamped her footing slowing her stunted attempt to escape. Only sparse green bedding, the crashing ocean waves of the Dragatoy Eyes coast and the verdant sea breeze to witnessed her plight. It would not be long now before one of her pursuer's projectiles met its mark, yet none such arrows ever did. Suddenly as it began with the thirsting cheers of her pursuers, so did they fell silent. Daring to look behind her, she saw the bodies of her five hunters, fallen into the ground, their blood daubing the grey sand with its crimson paint, as if by divine intervention she was immediately saved. Halt! A voice emerged from the silence. You approach the territory of the United Federation of Earth. Raise your hands into the air and do not move, he said. Seeing no other choice lest she be struck down as suddenly as pointlessly as her pursuers, Carlyle followed the voice's orders. Emerging as if from the very sands itself a cadre of humanoid figures appeared before Carlyle. Golems carrying upon their backs as if growing by their bodies wet grasses while complemented by the grainy texture of sands that dotted their bodies approached her slowly. All while aiming their matching colored staves at her, she Carlyle shuddered in fear, barely standing upright to maintain her non-threatening mien to these strangers. She had not recalled any monsters that dressed like those before her. They were likely the other world as soldiers, likely scouts who patrolled the swampy isthmus of Marnia's bluff. Please state your intentions for being here, one of the other worlders asked her. I come here to seek sanctuary from the Empire. Carlyle explained herself remembering to not mince her words in front of these imposing entities. You have until the count of five to leave this place or my squad will shoot you down. One, two, three. The otherworlder asserted himself, thrusting his stave forward threateningly before counting down. I wish to seek audience with one known as Sam, the shareholder. I, I, know her. Carla desperately shrieked. From the volcano. From the dwarven mountains, she added. Sam, Lieutenant Nan Rose. The otherworlder changed his tone. Stand down, he urged the rest of his companions to lower their staves. The strange being pressed his chest with his hand and leaned his head over. Was this some sort of spell or enchantation the otherworlder is enacting? Spearhead this is Al-3-2. Reporting. The otherworlder spoke. This is Spearhead, Al-3-2. Did something happen? A voice erupted from the stranger's chest. I would like to request a high-value power retrieval at Section Echo over. The otherworlder said. Sergeant, were my orders not clear? Eliminate all who approaches Marnia's bluff. The voice coldly reminded her. Carlyle's heart sank upon hearing the imposing voice of the unseen entity. Was this the otherworlder's leader? He sounded just like how a leader would through strict discipline and a little dash of fear would enact upon those under his command. Major. This ek VPU said that she knows Samantha sir. Lieutenant Rose. From the Astlrux. The other world reported. From the Astlrux. The mysterious voice questioned. A moment of tense silence filled the beaches air as Carlyle stared apprehensively at the other worlders of whom her fate rests upon. Request approved. Keep her in your custody until I can send someone over for pickup. The voice answered. The ETA 20 minutes. Carlyle's hope reinvigorated after her perilous journey that the college mage collapsed onto the other worlder's arms. Exhausted but rested assured that she was now under their sanctuary. Dash. A bright white light greeted Carlyle's silver dane as she awoke from her slumber. She found herself in a bed within a jade-colored room. She noticed that her skin and her hand were attached to several intrusive pieces of strings that connected a collection of strange gizmos that seemed to throb so alive upon being attached symbiotically or perhaps parasitically onto her. Instinctively, the college mage thought that these wires were some form of probing contraption. Don't touch that. A familiar voice entered her ears. The doctors only just want to make sure your body is okay. You have been through a lot. A familiar red-headed woman wearing a particularly exotic set of leather gamps emerged from the side of Carlyle's bed, gently holding her hand just as she was about to remove the sticky strings. The shareholder, Samantha, Carlyle addressed her. You are indeed right. She really is that woman you met at the volcano. A pale-faced woman with raven hair emerges from the other side of Carla's bed. She tastes exquisite. 
The raven-haired one bantered as she licked her lips. To Carlyle's horror it was frothed with blood-diluted saliva. Her blood. The woman was a vampire. Iris, come on, don't say that to her. You will creep her out. Samantha reprimanded the vampire. Sorry, but it was such exhilarating to taste mage blood. The vampire cupped her cheeks and blushed childishly. Captain Samantha rose, if I may. Another man followed behind Samantha, this time emerging from a nearby door. He wore a soft clothed suit with the cleanest of presses and texture who gave a polite bow as he and the shareholder faced her. Go ahead agent. The shareholder nods. You are awake now Miss Silverdane. Welcome to New Albany. The man said. We have much to discuss. Chapter 49 Climb Mount Deanley Part 1 All was quiet on the Duchy of Tefrate, the southeasternmost province of the Slae Aegean heartland that bordered the Cambervale Valley Pass. Among its landscape was the evergreen Cambervale Forest that provided the Empire one of its richest sources of iron bark timber. Although the area is considered within the heavily protected core of the Empire, the region is not without its notable dangers besetting the citizenry to fray typically but are not limited to viperous bandits, man-eating monsters and rogue mage lairs, nothing of the sorts the jackal soldiers couldn't handle, especially when the fortress of Brian Bark, known as Little Hill assisting the duchy in all manners of security, being known as the protector of the south in defense of the empire's heartland. Within Little Hill contains a stockpile of arms, supplies and men that can weather whatever storm that comes out of the southern frontier or project imperial power within or throughout the region. It had a proud history of stalwartly stemming any hostile tides of invading hordes from breaching any further past its iron buck gates. Its proud roster of veteran defenders and a corps of knights who specializes in riding the avian variety of steeds such as griffins, pegasi, and wyverns. The fortress was originally built to centuries before the conquest of Tyrian as a castle fort that guarded the Cambervale mountain pass from intruders. Over time, the fortress rose quite literally from its humble beginnings, expanding the facilities within the fortress to include a courtroom, a prison, an aviary stables, an adventurer's guild office, larger warehouses and even an arcanium for college magi to convene within. Even though Tyrian eventually took over in terms of functionality as the protector of the south, Little Hill's long history of defending the realms was cemented with legendary repute. The only other fort of its grandiosity would have been its sister, Garner's Wall, colloquially called the Northern Aegis situated at the northern provinces that guards against the roaming Dos and Beastmen tribes that marauded the area. The fortress today was brimming with activity as the fortress knight captain, Sir Dalormas spoke down with authority from the emperor himself, the construction of the empire's defensive perimeter dubbed the Dragon Wall around the Duchy of Suville and the Duchy of Tefrate to give said dragon its formidable teeth, barricades, traps, magical wards, and all sorts of impediments to deter any prospective would-be invader from breaking through were being erected and still being with an overall of estimate of a third of the planned defences already have been constructed, stretched across the Cambervale forest. Redundant, but a precautionary redundancy. The Legion took every precaution could by placing evenly dividing his forces across the province with a reserve force coming in from New Orgonia in the event any part of the Dragon Wall was at risk of falling in addition of sapping through any usable shepherd passes and underground tunnels they could find to control the flow of troop movement for the invaders to force them to fight on grounds that the Legion shall dictate, which is the tight Cambervale Valley Pass. The plan for the Legion as it stands, Hold the invaders at Cambervale Valley until reinforcements from additional elements of the Slae Aegean Legion and the Elves were to arrive. Then once the attackers tire themselves out attempting to breach the walls, counterattack with a headstrong march to Tyrian. At his immediate disposal, Sir Dor Lormas has the strength of fifteen legions, exactly 150,000 of his own countrymen supplemented with an additional 45,000 dwarven warriors to man and construct the Dragon Wall's defenses. Supplementing the core infantry were regular fighters from the adventurers' guilds and mages from the college to perform special tasks exploiting their unique abilities to the fullest. It was morning. Greeted with a red dawn from Laesolus Sir Dilormas awoke for his daily pattern, 
for it was all just a repeat of many dozens or so tasks until the other worlders finally pour over from Tyrian into the legions awaiting battle lines. It had been over a month or less of the construction of the Dragon Wall, another day of drills, supplies accounting and routine inspections for the fortress night captain as he made out of his quarters, suited up in his resplendent armor and marched off with his retinue to inspect the construction of the defenses. He was a man who demanded perfection in all things yet contrastingly calm and cool-headed despite this, always looking to observe his surroundings before he engages his plan of attack. He wasn't much of a frontline fighter however, instead relying on his vast knowledge of defensive formations to win himself the illustrious position as the fortress knight captain of the legendary Little Hill. He arrived several miles away from Vercourt greeting the lumberjacks and the legionnaires stationed there of their progression so far. My lord, we are going as fast as we can to supply the wood we would need as always, the ducal sergeant in charge of overseeing the timber harvests reported. Yes, we have only cut down half of the iron buck that my people are expected to harvest for this year. The lumberjack foreman added. I am afraid you are all not going fast enough. The night captain sternly told them. By the rate we are moving with our wood, the demons would have run over us by then. May I remind you that this dragon wall was meant to be built yesterday? He reminded them. But my lord, iron buck is notoriously tedious to cut down. We need another month to not only cut the tree down but turn it into lumber at our mills too. The foreman protested. Is there no other way then? Sir Al Almas asked. The legion needs results not more problems to fix with. He exclaimed. With his nerves stricken profusely with a disabling morning migraine soured the beginning of his day. He dismissed the two men as he took refuge by his personal retinue, readying his daily morning ration to start his day right anew once again. As he bit down the bread from his mouth, the elderly knight took one moment to breathe the calm morning aura radiating the land, the chirping of the soft song birds, the rush of the little Greeks and the brushing winds. But as his nerves realigned itself with rationality and tranquility, his meditation was violently disturbed by the sudden screeching noise. What was that noise? The night captain shuddered. He alongside his men and the lumberjacks quivered with cold sweat of what kind of creature could be the source of the noise. The guards accelerated to high alert as they scoured their surroundings for any possible signs of intrusions. Was it a monster? A force of nature, or maybe even the first wave of the demonic invasion? Look over there, one of the guards exclaimed. Above them, to their horror the Slae agents saw a host of metal dragons that loom over the horizon of the Cambervale Valley Mountains from their south, beyond Tyrian. From out of their bottoms, the metal dragons excreted strange but slowly descending puffs of clouds that carried with them carriage-like objects and humanoid-shaped men that controlled their descent so their feet landed safely to the imperial lands that they made their hellish entrance with. Another set of metal dragons meanwhile began to breathe fire down onto the forest below, unleashing a hellish fire straight from the nightmarish of stories, cindering the forest of all of its content whilst stripping the land bare with its incinerating kiss. The invasion has begun. The night captain shouted. A panic amongst the lumberjacks upon his declaration immediately consumed the scene as soldiers scrambled into their battle formations. They will need to make their stand here and now to buy the common citizenry time to escape to the safety of their strongholds. Today the valiant Slae Aegean Legion shall make their stand against the first demonic tide of the invasion. A glorious stand for civilization against those who wished to seek its destruction like their ancestors before them. But it was all for naught. What was supposed to be a glorious battle for the fate of the Alliance of the Light as expected by Fortress Knight Captain Dalormas with the mightiest legionnaires of the continent face against the demonic horde with their pride set high and courage burned to their hearts, ready to spill the impulad and vanquish the darkness from the realm. It was supposed to be the moment for him and all the Slegion legions to write their name in the history book to be remembered as heroes whether they make it through the war or die with dignity in battle. However, reality is so cruel to him and the rest of his men. Like an apocalyptic storm, the demons came unexpectedly, 
while their fortification was still in an infantile stage, leaving their supposed strong footing that they give so much grandiose about was found wanting of the original thought. With a swarm of the other worlders metal dragons, beasts and their iron-cladded warriors wiped out more than half of the legions and incomplete defense line in mere minutes. No matter what weapon they used to strike, what battle formation they assembled unto or spell that they threw upon the other world as it simply did not suffice in laying a single ounce of damage upon them. Inversely so, the invaders struck like a tidal flood upon the Alliance soldiers, overwhelming them with their otherworldly magics consisting of explosions and infernal fires that obliterated all that tenth to attempt to spear it down like any large monster would, only to be expeditiously ran over to a bloody pulp upon its legs. Their dragons breathed fire below their shield walls that instantly disintegrate upon contact despite their steadfast discipline in maintaining line in maintaining shield walls upon pressure of overwhelming force. Much worse yet was their warriors, who move in blinding speeds as they vaulted over the corpses of the fallen imperial defenders with impunity. The greatest insult was their lack of honor, contenting themselves to only fight from a distance like viperous bandits with their black staves that gave a thunderous crack that instantly curses whatever unfortunate soul to a death curse. Their blood suddenly flowing out of their bodies, it was slowly becoming apparent that their current position will quickly be overwhelmed by the demonic tide. Their onslaught beginning to root and pursue them in a terrifying display of speed as many were cut down as soon as their backs were turned tail towards the open forest of halved trees. Those who hid behind the now mangled defensive walls or through the still uncut forest fared slightly better. Retreat. Retreat to the auxiliary lines. Sir Alulmas rallied. He knows that the situation as it stands is a hopeless affair, he needed to preserve the lives of his men against this wholesale slaughter, but as he shouted orders, waving his sword mightily as a valiant leader braving any great battle as one should, a piercing cut wounded him. A hidden viper, struck him down from afar with his alien magics from his black stave. As Sir Dal almost fell down to the ground and embraced Tivna. He prayed that the rest of his men would safely retreat to Little Hill where they could a chance against the demonic invaders. He hoped that the rest of their defensive preparations, especially from the battle mages from the College of Magi and the Dwarven Sting Eyes could succeed where he had failed. Dash. It was a terrifying sight to behold. Above the verdant mountains of the Cambervales rode a great wind of hundreds upon hundreds of metal dragons. Each bearing within their bellies lay legions of men, their war machines and their frightening weapons of mass destruction. Their intentions were clear as all of them had known after weeks of planning, preparations and practice. The oracular invasion into the Slaeagen heartlands, just as the Empire had feared. The ultimatum had not been met, broken by the Empire's non-response to the other worlders' message. Prince Klovich's letter of ultimatum sent discreetly through the Ufif's Uafs to the Imperial doorsteps was expectedly ignored and even ridiculed when the intended spat through Klovich coercive and doomsaying threatening along with the pictures of Uf's extraordinary technologies to convince the Emperor and his courts to stand down or face total annihilation as they originally declared during Operation Bakumatsu. The other worlders launched their assault. First came an earth shattering barrage of fiery power from the Federation's artillery, rockets, gunship, auto cannon, and SPG alike. Their hammering assault leveling the initial stretch of defenses, mix of completed barricades and work in progress palisades along the Cambervale Forest. Forward observers, who had infiltrated the enemy lines days before, pinpointed the optimal location the metal dragons could make their landing. A relatively flat stretch of terrain that was deforested due to the earlier lumber harvests the nearby town of Vercourt had cut down weeks before, code-named Landing Zone Timber, the area had to be clandestinely adjusted to allow the scale the other worlders deemed fit to move their armies across to the Imperial territories via a mix of nighttime engineering work and a coldly efficient napalm bombardment of the forest floor scorching and blanching the ground like a hellish uprising like demons from the old legends. Thankfully the youth had fire extinguishers on hand to not complete destroy the forest. Carlyle Silverdane sat inside the metal dragon. 
thankfully not being digested but instead held inside a wide containment chamber where she stood by the side of the shareholder herself, Captain Samantha Rose, her squad and a few dozen of other soldiers. Their faces were a banquet of visages as some men were grimaced stoically, others smiling with optimism while others show an aspect of shuddering turbulence as the dragon made its flight. Their black staves, idly holstered for now, yet their terrifying power ready to be called upon by the slightest touch of their triggers. From the avian position she finds herself in, Carlyle caught an unequivocal glimpse, through a magical mirror of sorts within the metal dragon that displayed the Federation's full warlike might. Seeing the forests and hills of the southeastern province of the Empire be reduced to and burned to ashes sweeping away even the most stalwart of defenses froze the very marrows of her bones. She can only imagine what sort of damage these powers can do in an imperial city or even one of their fortresses. Power. That she is now partly albeit unwittingly bringing over to rain down an unsuspecting empire, for the newly defected college mage herself, she was. Conflicted. To simplify her current train of thoughts, upon her arrival to the other world as stronghold or tactfully speaking colony. Carlyle was now fully confronted with the cold hard truth about new war that is now being transpired on her homeland's soil. The other world as known formally as the United Federation of Earth, were initially peaceful colonists looking for land to call their new home. Coincidentally the time on their arrival was at the same juncture of time that Jeltagar's comet passed over Gleesia. Consequently, the colonists of New Albany thought Gleesia was an empty land when they landed on Tyrian. Thanks in no part to the college's mass illusion spell to hide the signs of harvestable life in Gleesia from the perceived demonic scout which was simply just a gillum-like scout with no malicious intent whatsoever. This led to the Federation almost violently jumping headfirst into danger when they encountered the many myriad dangers that plagued the eastern frontier of the Empire. They called to arms the aid of their homeland to grant them security which explains the massive built-up of soldiers that littered New Albany and had strong-armed Prince Clovich Rian of Tyrian to be seduced by their strength. From a political perspective, her country would have done the same, in similar vein to the southern frontier colonies that the Empire had recently established beyond the throes of Tyrian. Yet she still couldn't fully abide with the fact she is now fighting against the Empire rather than to protect it. If it were not for her extraordinary circumstances, this bit of her throwing her lot to the other worlders in a matter of her own honorable principles to work alongside the invaders and at least by a limited proxy, Prince Clovich Rian himself. She had only hoped that the young prince would wisely be able to rule over the broken pieces of the realms when this war that should never had happened in the first place is all over. When it came to her newly made assessments of the other world as proper. At first, Carlyle thought of the United Federation's many marvels were a result of an advanced or new form of magics. Oh, what a callow little lamb was she. The Federation had no magics of any kind whatsoever too. Nothing was built by the gods, given through nature nor of any eldritch powers that being but pure unadulterated craftsmanship and sheer ingenuity alone. The more she learns about the nature of their technology and the foundation of their circle of thought, Carlyle growled loathingly and enviously as she now fully sees what the other world is truly are capable of. The youth with pure craftsmanship or in layman's terms, technology and science alone without a single ounce of arcane elements being used was able to achieve them godlike statuses of advancement for their civilization, enabling them to do feats that can be considered as utterly impossible even by even the wisest of sages, the elves or any ancient kingdom beforehand such as the ability to travel great distances within seconds, the might to shatter mountains, the ability to turn wastelands into livable lands and the extra planar ability to move to new worlds with their giant flying boats. Such achievements would greatly increase the lives of many of her fellow Slaegians tenfold. Yet if it weren't for them, it became not meant to be.
The upsetting truth about the youth's technology and sciences as their means of advancement for their technologically superior civilization as compared to the arcane-centric society of Gleesia is not even worse enough for Carlia to stomach but another truth struck her the same time she learned the previous revelation during her time in New Albany. She finally met the third and final chosen one, Astisigal, the scholar one David Malona. At first, she thought the scholar was either a sagely-looking man who would lock himself into his scrolls and books for hours on end every day, but instead a significantly rotund yet very brilliant man whose hands are locked into a blue cup of strawberry ice shakes that he addictively drinks more compared to holding any articles related to his job when it comes to his branding. The sacred crystal heart would be quite pleased to choose David. His wisdom and advanced knowledge are far beyond any mages back in the college or even the elves as he demonstrated to her an intuitive understanding of magic with the concept of a science known as physics. Along with Sam, he shows her that technology, science and magic can advance side by side effectively with the evidence of the Hecate suit a special piece of armor designed for the full benefit for mages to efficiently use the knifeless peak of their powers, the first if not the only one of its kind that she has heard of in all of Gleesia. The suit surpasses any arcane craftsmanship in merging two opposite elements Actocolite and Gyronite together and enables an approximate 90% siphoning of energies from mana crystals. Integrating their already extraterrestrial understanding of these arcane geodes was application of the principles of physics when it comes to utilizing mana to perform a variety of new and or enhanced magics that not even the greatest of mages from the college would concoct or tried. It was no wonder Samantha was able to defeat Faithlen with such ease. Carlia tearfully cursed Grandmaster Owen and Mogul Dolman's name from the bottom of her soul. If not for their arrogance, power hoarding, and utter short-sighted ignorance, the people of the Xenograd, perhaps the whole of Gleesia could have been so much more than what they are now. An emboldening new light as proud as Laysol's sunrise. A Gleesia that can finally learn of peace, prosperity and healthful lives, yet for better or worse, this war that the Grand Master had provoked into coming must happen and no matter how many people wish they could, Gleesia will never be the same anymore. The youth's arrival perhaps does indeed bring about a destruction, a destruction of the old order to make way for the new, like the dying dragon giving birth to the great forest from its hearth-fire body. If things were different, like a second thought, learning the truth sooner or whatever, the weave of fate would have threaded to a less violent consequence, but the gods, the heart or whom whatever is weaving this story have spoken that the future shall be set forth by the strength of the warriors of two factions, the hegemonic alliance of the light consisting of the human Slaygen Empire, the elves of Alphalnora and remnant dwarves of the Astlrox in its numerously united selves shall fight for the future of Gleesia with the technologically advanced United Federation of Earth and their Tyranni, Beastmen and Greenskinned collaborators. This is Hammer 5-1. The landing zone is secured. All hostiles have been eliminated. Second wave is cleared to land on LZ Timber. Over. A radio broadcast from the first wave informed everyone on the Metal Dragon. The western incursion into the Empire was split into four waves, the first were a contrasting mix heavily armored war machines that were tasked to smash any obstacle that could still remain by the nearby landing zone along with the first wave of an airborne regiment. Those light infantrymen were tasked in disrupting any immediate responses from the Slay agent to the invasion's landings. The second and third waves is where the bulk of the infantry and of war machines would follow in that which Kalaya is part of the former. They are tasked with the general push of the invasion. Blitzing through and occupying the territory they will pass along the way. Lastly the fourth wave is when they deployed their artillery pieces and the supple lead trucks fueling the invasion's advance. Seeing first hand of the easy destruction of the imperial defensive lines, Carlyle whispered a prayer to the death goddess Tivna to all the brave but ignorant souls being sent to their undignified death to what is essentially a butcher shop that is the Federation. At the same time, she reluctantly came to the terms that the Slay Aegean Empire, at least in its current incarnation, 
Time has come to an end but optimistically hope that the Federation and Prince Klovich could bring Enigad and the Hogli easier into the next and better era. Therefore, as she swore to herself now, and as a promise to her late student Olera, she will do everything in her power to save us to ensure a better tomorrow for her homeland, even if it means collaborating with the invading other worlders. Landing, the dragon rider known as Carplian said, steady as she goes. Any brave words before we do this captain? Edward Clay asked Samantha, but Rose swallowed herself silently, still hesitant and nervous of her and her entire squad's promotion. She was given charge of a company of 130 soldiers under her wing which was already a huge leap in responsibilities under her wing compared to simply just commanding Strider Group. Captain Clay pressed her. Just. Call me Lieutenant for now, I need to get used to it. Samantha replied to her radioman. A. Crocker? She turns to her second in command. But Crocker shook his head, out of overruling respect of the traditional chain of command, yet still shared his restraints on the growing pressure the newly promoted Captain Samantha Rose has for her first large commanding post. Troopers, the newly promoted Staff Sergeant Crocker yelled to the top of his lungs, rousing the spirits of the Ufif soldiers under their presence, Welcome to Glee Easier ladies and gentlemen, we are here and for one thing only. The common state party, our nation and the people we serve to protect has given us the task to cross over beyond the Camber Vale and to bring down the Iron Hammer to these savages who dared try to attack our colony. It is only right we come and do the same to them. We come here, as a team, a company, an army and we are gonna take some. Show them how we do it on Earth. We are gonna conquer and chew shit and we are all too clean to actually chew shit. But most of all, we are gonna bring the fight to him lot. Understood? Crocker spoke. Yes, sir. The troopers spoke in unison. You got that right. The staff sergeant cheered. Where do we go troopers? Poro Terra. The soldiers shouted. The metal dragon landed steadily on the ash-sooted ground of a once resplendent dale as the people inside the dragon stood up from their seats and faced the its tail. A ramp fell down before them from the dragon's rump allowing the disembarking of the soldiers. I can't wait to bring a piece of my mind to those pompous castellas Iris raised her Astra Magnum pistol, a hand cannon personally gifted for her own self-defense by a Paro corporation that she now openly carries on her specially made pistol holster that is enchanted by her to be able to be concealed like a hidden viper's lethal strike, a popular weapon on a Paro Arsenal's product catalogue by homeowners, and criminals alike who wished to have an affordable weapon with a premium grade of stopping power. You said it. Crocker nodded approvingly at the vampire witch's enthusiasm. Let's climb Mount Deanley lads. The newly promoted staff sergeant Crocker roused the soldiers. The soldiers grabbed their gears and fondled their black staves of war called guns giving an ominous clicking noise as they did, before bravely stepping out of the beast and onto the landing zone. Let's finish this on schedule everyone. Push on, the newly dubbed Captain Samantha Rose ordered. We should easily mop up the rest of what first wave cut up a while ago. She optimistically smiled, knowing full well the defenders, even with all of their valorous might would easily crumble before the advance of the Ufif. Thousands of youth riflemen, airborne troops and Apara mercenaries swarmed in formation together down the hills of the Cambervale Valley, not finding much resistance as they kept up with the cataphract tanks and Fjord IFVs. Before long, they could see Vercourt and Little Hill over the horizon, like a great tidal wave of human bodies readying to descend upon an unwary settlement. Shield Father Landing Zone Timberries Samantha was about to relay to Colonel Polonsky the good news of the uncontested advance. A great fireball imploded ten feet away from her as Samantha twitched, reflexively covering her head with her arms. Not clear. Not clear, Samantha shouted. She and her squad giddishly scrambled for cover but among the decapitated trees of the Cambervale forests, there was little to no respite from the suppressing barrage of magical spellfire that rained down on them. Magics such as fireballs, lightning bolts and even oversized conjurations of bladed weapons along with arrows, bolts and explosive ozegoth bolts bombarded the Ufif advance, 
injuring and even killing dozens of men from the surprise counterattack. To make matters worse, some summoned Gillum's made of the flesh of tree barks, stone and flames to jostle against the Yafif's armored spearhead. For the young officer, Samantha's first time where she and her squad were placed in a significant disadvantage. She was always used to being able to get the drop on her adversaries, but Faith decided that she remained idle in the lofty position for too long. To truly test her, the powers that her roles shall be reversed. Now that the enemy had expected her, exposed, bombarded by enemy fire in all directions and men dying everywhere. The tumultuous scene corroded her initial optimism as her fight and flight instinct and her officer's academy military calculi fought amongst their psychic selves for control of her brain, as each mental skill shifted themselves into high gear, racing through the course of her brain to win the prize of allowing to dictate the next course of action Samantha must make and quickly. She must, for her cover too is equally corroding at the same rate her volition is starting to falter. Suddenly being thrown into the deep end with the lives of her men on the line and her own too. The true test of the captain's capabilities have begun. Covering fire. Samantha ordered everyone. They were too exposed and bunched up together that they became easy pickings for the enemy magics to fully multiply their effective damage upon them firing upon the direction of the dwarven sting eye crossbow bolts. Those who could get a clear shot returned fire at the enemy to screen the advance of the troops. Suddenly three pillar of flame erupts from the ground where three super Ospreys floated upon engulfing the planes in flames causing several others behind it to pull up and back out. LZ is too hot, we can't land. One of the pilots exclaimed. Several of the dropships activated their anti-incendiary countermeasures to clear out the fire but they have to do it away from the landing zone to safely finish their procedures. But in essence, the situation has become dire for the invasion. They needed those reinforcements to complete the plans of the operations or they will come up short of what they initially want for the outcome of this war. Shield Father Shield Father we need their support at second. Samantha frantically attempts to radio command but amidst the chaos, she saw a large oversized ball of lightning, like a floating Tesla coil hurl straight towards a group of some Ufif soldiers. Dropping the radio call, Samantha dashed towards her men, conjuring her hands a ward spell to shield them from the enemy's magics, but in her rush of her selfless act, she underestimated the degree of battle magics being of an exponential degree of power compared to her singular ward. Upon collision with her shield, a huge explosion of electric sparks snapped forcefully in a great area of effect sending the captain flying while severely injured the troops she tried to protect. Her senses slowed and her ears rang violently as Samantha struggled to realign her senses. Thankfully, Staff Sergeant Crooker, as ever intrepid as he was reliable, grabbed Samantha's body and quickly dragged her away to the safety of a makeshift foxhole. Produced unintentionally by the earlier first wave's air-to-ground missiles, Aliathra quickly tended to Samantha's wounds and swiftly healed her. The elf's new bionic arms worked their restoration magics unbinded thanks to the help of artificial arcane meridians that were the frameworks for Samantha's Hecate suit. Where are they coming from? Ken gnashed his teeth. Our airstrikes should have gotten most of them by now. There must be some battle mages nearby. Carlyle answered. Over there by that forest. Croc appointed. Opening fire. He shouted as he fired his rapid firing LMG towards the tree line. Jesus Christ how the hell those shits survived our airstrike? Abidaya asked. The whole lot of them must have used the combination of illusion magics to hide their force and earth shelter spell to hide underground briefly. It's a common tactic to combat dragons. Carlyle explained. That's fucking great. Diaz rolled his eyes in annoyance. Captain, we need fire support on that forest. Crocker yelled to Samantha. Samantha frantically breathed heavy and activated the Hecate suit's visor system for tactical and environmental analysis. Her panicked thoughts slightly fudging UI interfacing as the bombardment erupted the ground around her. This recent upgrade from Dr. Malona had given Samantha the ability to conduct more comprehensive readings of mana energies, the triangulation of sources rich with it, 
and how the magics were being manipulated in her immediate surroundings. Based on her computer's calculations, the Imperials had rallied with their mages and are using, quite above their normal efficiency rate of casting high-leveled spells that threaten to cut down the advance no further than a click or less away. She cannot tell easily the range if it weren't for her oppressive conditions. She finds herself in. It was a, currently at the moment, one of a kind, the bleeding edge of youth technology. She notes to herself, Dr. Malona really needs to use his new funding to build more mana sensors. But just as Samantha was about to say a word to her squad, suddenly a dozen or less, she couldn't tell do the repressive conditions of their pinned down state, huddled down next to her on their makeshift cover. Captain. I lost my CO. One soldier screamed. The fuck are we going to do? Were those enemy guns silenced or we're fucked? Another soldier shouted. Quiet, quiet. Samantha yelled back. She was hyperventilating. Her ears still ringing from the near death she had just experienced from the earlier lightning bolt. The chaos was now slowly degrading her composure. Captain Crocker crawled to his CO and shook her back to reality. We need to call in a strike. He yells at her. I. Sam hesitated but quickly returned to her senses. Yes. Kane. We make every drone paint that forest. Roger that. Kane nodded as he deployed his UAV drone. Meanwhile, Samantha synced the UAV and multiple other combat UIs among the Afif soldiers in the area. Calling all Afif ground forces. We have heavy magical activity threatening to halt our advance. Lays this forest to stop the Imperials bombardment, she explained on the radio. We need to pop smokes too. Some of us have to expose ourselves to lays the target properly. Crocker advised. Oh yeah. That too. Samantha nodded. She was still slow to the pacing of the battle to realize that she forgot that when ordering a heavy missile barrage followed by a large infantry advance, Ufif doctrine states that smoke grenades must be popped to mask the headway. Sorry, she lowered her head. It's okay, Rose. Crocker emphatically gave him his clemency. Just don't stop. Say again, Strider. We are taking fire over here. Literally, one such response from Clay's radio said, Samantha swallowed her courage once again and pressed call on her radio, this is Strider lead, pop smokes on your position, to cover the, advance, Samantha as she ordered the rest of the soldiers, if you have a laser designator, paint the forest I have marked on your minimap, a couple hundred meters or more dot front, she added forcing herself to push along the way. Grabbing her portable laser designator from her pocket, Samantha peeked over from the foxhole and activated the device. In conjunction with her Hecate suit's visors detecting the expedient amounts of mana energy permeating the forest in front of her, Samantha lays the approximate positions of the enemy ambushes, relaying the coordinates to the Fnac Tenacity and her escort of missile frigates under the ship prefix of FNMF. We got heavy hostile magics firing at the landing zone. Get me lasers on that forest. I need strike packages and tank fire at my marker, she shouted. Bloody hell. Remind Dr. Malona to get more of those mana detectors soon. Crocker cursed. Clay began radioing in her orders to the rest of the invasion forces as the bewildered Ufif rallied to the captain's call. This is Grey Dog. Following your command, another company captain gave his affirmation. Express 11B. Smokes out. A Fjord IFV commander rallied as he fired his vehicle's smoke screen countermeasures up into the sky. The rest of his platoon and several more followed suit and popped their smoke canisters, masking the battlefield in obscuring dust. Red wire here. Lazing the target. One of the assault engineering platoons added. This is the captain of the FNMF Indian Sea. Missile battery has your coordinates. Firing for effect. The Navy ship confirmed the coordinates. Using its advanced coordination computations, the Taigo missile battery outfitted to all Federation Navy missile frigates fires a barrage of hypersonic kinetic missiles. From across her visor, multiple hitboxes from dozens of squads painted the forest where the ambushes stood in bright orange. Like a great altar, like lambs awaiting slaughter that the unknowing natives could not fathom that they are now marked for death. Knowing that the blast will be dangerously close to her position, the captain grabbed her radio once again. All soldiers, 
Kinetic missile strike is danger close, takes shelter in the APCs and IFVs from the blast. Crocker warned on the radio, this is Gurkha team, not all of us can fit Strider. One such leader, from an airborne regiment of four mentioned on the radio. Tell those men of yours to come to us. We can shield them from the blast. Aliathra charitably offered, got it. Crocker nodded. Gurkha. Take your team to my current position ASAP. Crocker hurried the airborne leader along. The airborne troopers double-timed their sprint as the young captain and her fellow mages began to channel their collective energies to conjure a resilient sphere, a shimmering force field like globe encapsulated Strider and their accompanying men, but they hesitated completing the concentration heavy spell to allow the airborne soldiers to enter the sphere safely for nothing not physical objects, energy, or other spell effects, can pass through the barrier, in or out, though a creature in the sphere can breathe within it, the spell requires the intensified concentration of one or more mages to maintain the barrier, hurry, Crocker shouted at the airborne troopers as the four women finished sealing the resilient sphere, the airborne troopers made it all inside, all six of them before the sphere fully sealed itself from the perils outside of its warding grace. 3.2.1 Impact The captain of the FNMF Indian Sea declared as the supersonic kinetic missile struck the designated position, dead between the bullseye. A great mushroom cloud shook the earth, its shock waves unleashing a torrential gust of energy in its wake. The forest erupted brilliantly as clouds of dust, dirt and even a few bits of wood imploded from its impact zone. Only those who find themselves within a vehicle or inside Samantha's resilient sphere weathered through the missile's impact unharmed. When the dust cleared, the whole forest before them was annihilated, wiped from the face of the earth. Kinetic strike good effect on target. The captain of the FNMF Indian Sea congratulated himself. Indeed. Nothing could have survived that. All units give me a sit rep over. Colonel Polonsky radioed. We took casualties and the Ospreys are attempting to catch up on schedule with the landings sir. But I fear that's not going to be the last of them for now. Samantha answered. I see stride lead. Continue the advance once the third wave has disembarked. Shield further out. Polonsky ended his broadcast. Samantha took a sigh of relief as she rested herself by an idle fjord IFV. She caught her breath as the young captain looked over the battlefield before her. The woman stared in dismayed detestation on the grisly sight before her. Bodies of men, you fenced like a are like fallen together like flattened cards. Their bodies charred, squashed and cleaved in two. Those of the Federation's casualties were shipped off in Super Osprey Medivacs who ferried the wounded and deceased away from this hellish ground. The Capitaine also saw to her deepest regrets that several of the youth casualties were of her own men, their death masks frozen forever when they were struck down grisly by the Imperial's magics. How many of my company had fallen? Samantha whispered. Twelfth Rifle Company has taken 43 casualties out of 150 soldiers. Isaac informed her. The captain depressed her body, sinking her head despondently as she absorbed the grave news. That was less than a third of her men under her command. It was her first day being the captain of her own military company and already she had reached an unacceptable account of men that perished under her wing. Captain Rose Crocker approached her slowly, his LMG nestled by his side. What's our next move? He asked her. Sadge. Am I not good enough? She returned his words with another question. What are you saying? The staff sergeant twitched his brow. You saw me a while ago Crocker. I froze while many of our men died. Samantha confessed her weakness. You? You were in the service longer than everyone else. How do you sleep at night knowing so many of your fellow soldiers die every day? I will not mince words Captain. Crocker sternly responded. In all of my years, I know one thing that I as your advisor, friend and second in command shall say that in war we never signed up to have things easy. Casualties, death and injury are all inevitable in our line of work. I know that. You know that. The whole squad knows that and even your father. What matters is that we do our job no matter the costs. We swore an oath. His answer resonated Samantha. You always seem to know what do for everything.
the way you ordered everyone what to do. I feel so not good enough whenever I am around you. Samantha shared her feelings of inadequacy. Don't say that Captain. Don't say that you are not good enough. Crocker gently patted his hand over Samantha's right shoulder. Our men died trying to accomplish something more than themselves. Do not spit on their graves by failing them now. We cannot control everything that happens around us. All we can do is be ready to fight back. The rest of us still needs you. Your leadership and magic powers, he said. But how can I learn to lead? Samantha asked. You got your whole life ahead of you. If you know how to play it smart Sammy. Me? When this shit is all over, I am going to retire. But by then. I hope I rub off as much as I can of myself on you if you get me. Crocker offered his other hand. Come, let's get shit done. Shall we? He asked of her. You're right. I still have a long way to go. Samantha softly smiled back to her sanguine self. Carlyle looked on to the shareholder with admired awe as the captain stood back up from her damaged state to bring herself back together after the harrowing adventure they had earlier. The college defector had to admit. She too was quite shaken by the sheer violence of the Federation's assault on the Imperial Legionnaires and their dwarven allies, but through the strength of their arms and their tenacity in the face of adversity they had triumphed over this first obstacle in the road of this war. But there was one more thing that Dewey Silverdane remarked about Samantha, that she has one key intrinsic feature that made the shareholder's character stronger than the Bane's, humility. The humility to learn and keep moving forward even after being brought down to the decrepit state of failure. After her little moment of silence to collect her thoughts, Samantha pulled out from her pocket her holographic projector and deploys it to the ground. It displays out, a satellite image brilliantly showcasing a live overview shot of their current surroundings within a 50 mile radius. It detailed current troop positions, landmarks and a smartly highlighted view of the Imperials' battle lines. Okay, so we are here and we can consider this first couple dozen or so meters good as cleared. Samantha pointed out on the map crossing out the immediate 500 meter radius around landing zone timber. Vercourt and Little Hill, situated here and here will need to be taken down if we want to clear road into New Argonia. We will use our superior speed and arms to encircle these enemy strong points. She explained, any questions? Little Hill would seem to be the most troublesome since it's an actual military fort. Vercourt only has a basic wooden and stone wall. Plus, that place is carved within a mountain. Ken raised. You are right Priva. I mean Corporal Mudwin. Little Hill should be the most well defended of the two. But the plant still stands. We have to encircle those two areas, shut down any attempt for a breakout and then it's smooth sailing to New Argonia we go. Anything else? The captain answered. We should be wary of more traps and ambushes. In my experience we ain't seen the last of them just yet. Crocker suggested intuitively. Us sappers can easily remove most of them with enough time. Red wire leader nods. Very well then. Let's move out. Samantha raised her fist into the air. Poro terra, poro terra. The soldiers cheered. With the landing zone now secured, the rest of the Ufif reinforcements could now be deployed into Tifrate. The joint mechanized and airborne thrust of the Eastern Army group pushed forward. Its war machine blitzing past the primitive and magical defenses of the native Gleasons. Most of the Alliance of the Light were barely able to reach their second line of defense against the otherworldly tide as most could not outrun a stampede of the Fjord IFVs and Arabian APCs, who were cut down by their mounted machine guns no matter what kind of valiant act of defiance they attempt to stop them. But it was not a total steamroll into the Imperial countryside. Several of the Stla agents' defensive traps ranging from pitfalls, spike pits, wheat flour, Fusiganides and magical runes slowed down the advance causing many untold amounts of hindrance, injury, and death for the invaders as the native defenders. Despite their technological disadvantage made sure that every inch of land will cost the other worlders profoundly. The sappers from the 20th Engineering Regiment alongside Captain Rose and her mage allies however made quick work of disabling said traps but at a stalemate pace to the growing rates of setbacks brought by the devious ambuscades by the natives. 
It took them about until nightfall before the battered East Army group reached a visual distance from Vercourt. There was only a marginal garrison 200 or so guardsmen, 1,200 regrouped slaves and legionnaires and a simple wooden stone wall protecting the town as word had only began to reach the inhabitants of the invasions happening, not expecting the invaders to push the steep into imperial territory so soon. The Ufif troops quickly went to work surrounding the lumber town with mechanized, motorized elements encircling the settlement in their embrace whilst combat engineers set up a containment perimeter around the gaps to prevent any attempt for a breakout to guarantee a perfect blockade to cut off Vercourt and its valuable supply of lumber from the Imperial's strategic field. Captain Rose ordered the circumvallation of the settlement to box in the defenders and prevent any chances of an attempt to break out both from within or from the outside world. This calculated action was a Roman tactic used by the great general and future Emperor Julius Caesar when he besieged the Gallic fortified town of Alasia. Machine gun emplacements, electrical fences and trenches began to be installed into the night as the Ufif completed their encirclement of Vercourt. When citizenry and defenders of the town realized what is now slowly happening right in front of their eyes, they began to panickingly throw whatever means of last-minute communication to the rest of the imperial defenders of the Dragon Wall of this most grave news, that they were being besieged and require immediate relief and prayed to their gods that as many souls hear their desperate call for aid. There they go. The message spells Aliathra pointed to the pyrotechnic display of Azuravian shaped spells being casted out of Vercourt, a town she had only grievous memories of. We should dispel as much of them as we can, Iris suggested. No, Samantha shot down the vampire witch's proposition, let them come. She knew the sheer strategic value of Vercourt means to the Imperial war effort. Their lumber supply that is the basis of their primitive military industry were to be cut off from its riches source of wood would severely hamper their plans for arming the populace into the Alliance's cause. They will likely emerge from their defensive fortifications and guerrilla hideouts to attempt to relief, a maneuver that the Federation can capitalize on. The more the Imperials exhaust their energies emerging from their fortifications rather than inside will be far more advantageous. For Yafif can sever the strands of their enemy's total cohesion with a prepared counter-attack within a 360-degree angle of the vital lumber depot of Vercourt. Once a good number of Alliance foolishly expose themselves to the Yafif's guns the easier it shall be to push forward when the time again it is to continue the push into the Slaeage and Heartlands. This same principle is also being enacted for the fortress of Little Hill with their in-must concentration of legionnaires and aerial cavalry stationed within its venerable walls, citizens and defenders of Vercourt. This is the armed forces of the United Federation of Earth. Your dragon wall has shattered and have surrounded your entire home. Your legionnaires, now lay broken by the march of our soldiers, surrender and let us inside the town and nobody will be hurt. An IFV commander blared his demands from a UAV drone with a megaphone attached to it, for the lumber town's inhabitants. The news that the invaders gave about how easily they had impregnated their defences, their claim of slaying multitudes of the Empire's finest and their brazen display of besieging their homes utterly shocked them. Got some activity Rose. Abidai whispered as he looked on with his sniper rifle onto the inhabitants of Vercourt. Thanks to his slightly elevated position and concealed visibility he was able to get an uncensored view of the active movements of the trapped denizens of Vercourt. They are all shaking. It looks like they might fold. Wait. Abidai updated but as he continued to observe the defenders, he spotted one particularly well-topped slayage and legionnaire. A sort of officer due to his distinct aura he resonated from himself to the disconcerted Imperials. He's waving his sword around like he owns the place. The other soldiers and people to are raising theirs too. He's rallying them. Abidaya grimly informed the captain. Looks like they are going to do this the hard way. Keep an eye on, Samantha sighed but then Abidaya interrupted her. Wait, they are on the move. To the gates. Abidaya alarmed them. Vercourt's two massive iron buck gates opened forth slowly as the audacious denizens of Vercourt readied themselves to sally forth and confront the demons. 
impassioned into their hearts was from one valiant legionary lieutenant who inspired them to defend their homes and loved ones citing the ages-old Idolans of past heroes, specifically the Empire's founder, Caldell who fought against all odds against the first demonic invasion alongside the horror stories of what atrocious acts the demons had done in the past to rouse them from the pits of their apprehension to a sage of gallantry as legionnaires and brave peasant folks alike marched forth with the legionary lieutenant taking point, his sword drawn forward, and his head evaporating into a crimson mist as a loud bang broke the silence of the night. A shot had immediately gone off. Samantha turned around to see that the source of the discharge was from none other from Abidio himself. The marksman, rapidly pulling the straight bolt of his sniper rifle and zoning in just as fast as he unloads his .308 rounds to several more of the Salid Slay agents. He wasn't hesitating for a second to shoot them down one by one as soon as they entered within range. There was a primal boil that the young captain could see on Abidio's eyes tears slowly dropping towards Leah as he loaded and unloaded every shot of his rifle. The sallied out Imperials, after seeing their upstarting leader die so dishonorably from beyond their sight, instead of running back to the safety of their walls in fear of their lives, roared with a renewed vigor as they charged blindingly towards the dark outskirts of their city. With no other choice left, knowing that there were several irregularly armed civilians wielding pitchforks, lumberjack axes and cooking knives, the captain gave out with a squeamish pause one chilling order, open fire, the mounted machine guns illuminated the night's blanket as they smite down on the foolhardy imperials who sallied forth from their settlement's walls, they gunned down several hundreds of men and women who died bravely yet effectively upon the blood-wetted mud soil of their homelands like martyrs eagerly willing to shed their blood to the cause of the defense of their homes. It had left a sick mark many of those of the Ufif who willingly pulled the trigger alongside those who bore witness to the event happening. Sam recoiled away from the grisly sight as she combated within herself what she had just done. Attempting to rationalize what had just happened, she saw them all die by her orders, every last one of them. The young captain looked at her blood-stained hands, that jittered away from the radio's mic as she reels from what she had just bore witness to. Despite taught clearly and training that armed and hostile civilians are no different from enemy combatants, Samantha was still disturbingly shaken of the order she just gave out as she could feel within the depths of her bones. The vengeful ghosts of the recently killed Imperials curse her name forever for their demise. Not even Crocker's reassurance that her penitent head mentally blocked off could alleviate the guilt in her heart. Lightning ball, screamed one new thief soldier as Samantha was snapped back to reality to see that a glowing azure, ball-shaped lightning vortex had suddenly emerged from within their lines and began to wildly float around their circumvallation. Thankfully the soldiers were quick on their feet to retreat a distance away or flee inside the transport vehicles where the smiting lightning bolts harmlessly crawled past them. What the hell, more mages? Clay exclaimed. It must be the altar of Tulin at work, Samantha exclaimed. During the erudite interrogations that Agent the Sergeant Capitaine Rose conducted with Carlyle Silverdane shortly after her arrival to New Albany. They had learned a great many things about of the more arcane elements of the Dragon Wall's defenses. For one, the Empire will be relying on their diverse pool of talented mages and enchanted artifacts to give them delivery in the upcoming war. Mages with a supreme aptitude for battle applicable spells would be promoted to battle mages, a group of powerful men and women who can channel the ether winds to cast wide area affecting spells to buff or debuff as what they seem fit from destructive vortexes and gusts of magical energies casted from the elements of destruction to far more supportive spells like mass enchanting soldiers with thicker armor, weapon imbuement and healing. Complementing their abilities were several carriages born magical artifacts known as altars of Talin, named after the god of magics. 
They amplify the spell casting of any mages that channels their powers into the device for greater potency, area of effect and range. Using the altars alongside a sky to aim the altars firing mechanisms at the intended target essentially turns this magical artifact into a nice stealthy artillery piece that can fire a variety of spells at a large radius without leaving a visible trace of a smoke trail for triangulation and counter barraging. However, it is visually distinct due to its religious decor and one can detect an altar of Talin via scrying for mana sources that which Samantha can artificially do with her suit's mana detector. They were marked as a priority target for elimination by the Afif's high command although they are encouraged to recover an intact altar for Dr. Malona's research if retrieval is possible. The Afif soldiers, remained in heightened alert their cohesion on the edge as they thoroughly re-examined their surroundings for any more surprises these natives have concocted. They knew that mages have ways to bypass several of their technological advancements yet they were also briefed of how to circumvent their enemies' advantages. Samantha turned on her mana detector from her Hecate suit and began to triangulate the origin of the lightning vortex. So, Crocker asked her, where's this fucking fireworks coming from? It's coming from Little Hill. Samantha answered, That's miles away from us. Ken bewilderingly commented. He was quite flabbergasted by the magical projection range the altar had. Not only that but Little Hill right is where the best defenders of the Dragon Wall are stationed right? It's stopping us from fully accessing the Cambervale Valley Pass as a corridor for our troops to move into. Ken added, I hope the men there will be able to shut it down for us. He prayed, Strider Group, Strider Group, the radio echoed to life. This is Lou.cat.strider lead. Reporting, Samantha answered, This is Shield Father. You and your squad have been given immediate transfer orders. Colonel Polonsky replied, Transfer orders? Where? Samantha asked, Little Hill. The assault engineers were trying to sap the castle's defenses and they have requested that you have them solve a problem that requires your expertise Colonel Polonsky said a sergeant Buchanan from the 9th artillery company will brief you on the situation get there a sap shield further out the colonel ended the call I spoke too soon Ken grumbled looks like we still got more work cut out for us strider Samantha turns her squad well most of the men will breathe easier if we can silence that altar inside little hill we can't have some enemy guns harassing our rear ends. Crocker crossed his arms. You're all ready to move out lads? I am starting to grow weary today from all of this running. Aliathra yawned. May I have a moment of respite? And I am hungry. A bead I raised. You can do that on the way to Little Hill. Samantha informs them. Hey, this is Strider lead. I got orders from the colonel to transfer to Little Hill immediately. Anyone got a cab to spare? The captain called out from her company. One IFV commander volunteered to take the prestigious Cape Batane and her squad to her destination. Under the cover of the night, they took these few moments of peace to rest and recuperate themselves. Before long, the Fjord IFV escorted Strider Group to their destination. The rear echelons of the elements of the East Army group assigned to taking the legendary Imperial Fortress of Brian Bark, no commonly as Little Hill. Or at least, what's left of the fort. The scene before them was utter devastation. Boulders, dust, corpses and broken flags littered the once proud Imperial Fortress. The southern door to the Imperial Heartlands lay demolished into crumbled ruins as they arrived. No one else of Strider's three native auxiliaries were more shocked by just how swiftly this bastion of imperial power had fallen than Carlia Silverdane. The Stlaeagen Fortress of Brian Bark, Little Hill, the Sky Fortress, carved atop of the two peaks of twin mountains by the Cambervale Valley Pass. The fortress that once stood against the tide of barbarians, rebels, monsters and the undead alike, boasted to be that the fortress that no army in Gleesia could ever break lay in rubble and scorched rock, its valiant defenders of the empire's finest knights, legionnaires and battle mages lay upon a mountain of corpses, tossed aside by sanitary-minded rear echelons who tossed their bodies aside in mass like common street trash. All of these great insults to the Stlaeagen Empire happened while the youth's begirdling white flower flowing proudly above little hills corpse.
Upon reaching the highest point of the once proud fortress, Strider was greeted to the banners of the 9th and 4th Artillery Company, the 2nd Regiment of the Gleesian Colonial Militia, the 88th Mountain Brigade, Steel Breakers Cavalry for Hire, and Ravens Company PMC, Captain Rose. Sergeant Buchanan of the 9th Artillery Company saluted Samantha as she arrived within the top of the fortress's ruins. Good evening Sergeant, give me a sit rep over. Samantha promptly saluted back. I would want to say you should have been here an hour ago when I called in my art a barrage on the fort. At first they created some form of magic dome to shield the whole place but those poor bastards didn't realize that they ain't no match for my good old friends SPNG and Demel Ares. The dome shattered in by the fifth barrage and we hammered those dirty savages for another five more. After about an hour, well, you can see it right here already the 90Hs work here. Buchanan clapped his hands, the college mage, Carlias Silverdane, began to shrank tumultuously upon hearing the otherworlders boastful albeit gravely true accounts. Brian Bark only lasted an hour against the otherworlders' might. Normally a siege often lasts months to even years to topple a fortress that size of little hill but the otherworlders could begin and end a siege in their favor within a span of an hour. Not even the Dark Lord Allbone could accomplish such speed. Only the might of a dragon or several archmages in full power can match such force. So much power and to witness the after effects with her own two hands. And yet this destruction was only the aperitif of what the Federation can truly accomplish when their wrath has been evoked. You truly wield the power of gods. Carlyle expands her thoughts. Ah, shucks. I am a good Jesus boy through and through. But hey. Thanks I guess. Buchanan embarrassingly accepted the blasphemous compliment from the vampire witch. For one thing that both Iris, Carlyle and Aliathra gained from this revelation that emerged from the ashes of this destruction as they she. Forgive the native auxiliary Sarge, continue. Samantha, urged the artillery leader. Hokey. Well after we decimated the whole place, the boys began to sweep away any enemy survivors and clear some debris to build and fob for the valley pass corridor as ordered. For some time later, one of the patrols radioed me. According to them. Several of my boys chased several enemy mages carrying some sort of fancy telescope on a carriage thing into this door before sealing it off, Buchanan said. He guided the captain towards a dark hole the rear echelon shed floodlights and sentinel vigils upon. Initial examinations say that this was an entrance to some kind of tunnel network that leads underground the mountain. Telescope? You mean an altar of Tulin right? Samantha's eyes widened upon her question. They moved their altars down there? We have been getting reports of reoccurring magical attacks coming from here. And my scanner says they are still doing it. Well it's just a carriage. I don't know if there was more or we blew the other except that. Catching stuff for live and not exploded ain't my shtick captain. Buchanan apologized. The battle mages and the survivors must have moved their remaining altars inside the tunnels to continue harass the soldiers. Carlyle states, Guerrilla artillery strike from within the tunnel eh? Fuck me these guys are not as dumb as they look. Crocker faced and agreed, my men would be with you too. My company is down by half because of them. Buchanan gestured to his injured men who lay at makeshift medical bay where their injuries were being treated intensely by combat lifesavers and first aid drones. An underground system? For the fort. That's bad news sans the altars. They can theoretically hold out against us for a long time. Samantha commented. We'll be way behind schedule if we try to rat them out the old fashioned way. Crocker added. Tunnel rat them. Some of my boys who returned from the tunnels say that you should be aware there's gonna be lots of traps and really angry upfers waiting to jump at you as soon as you show your face. Buchanan warned Strider. They were able to give you a pretty basic map of the whole place. Uploading it to your visors now. Receiving the data from her visors UI, the young captain and her sergeant began to study the layout carefully. There were highlights of dangerous zones, unknown layouts and even the farthest point the sappers pushed through before they had to retreat. Lots of traps, right? Magical in nature? She asked. The correct term was runes but they were traps all the same. Yep. 
It's unlike anything my sappers had experienced before. That's why I called you in for your help. Buchanan affirmed Samantha's intuition. Enemy magics. One soldier cried as a combination of magical attacks began to rain down on the rear echelon troops, forcing to the Yafif to scramble for safety and carry of their heavy yet precious gear haphazardly. Take cover damn it, Buchanan cursed. If those mages are the people firing those battle magics then they can continue to cast their spells from the safety of the tunnels with impunity. Carlyle informs them. Gah. We ain't having more. Green Jack die to stormy weathers with a chance of fireballs. We need to knock out that magic hearty tonight. Croc oppressed. All right, get me a team and let's gear up and venture in again. Samantha nodded. You can go on without me Cap. I need some. Time to sleep. A bee die yawned. And I am pretty useless inside that place anyways. Clay added. All right. You can go rest and grab some grub. You two deserved it after all that happened today. Samantha nodded. As Strider Group retrofitted their gear for close quarters and reviewed the available pool of volunteers brave enough to venture into Little Hill's depths, Carlyle observed the ruins for a much more extensive examination. Getting over her initial trepidation of the desolation of the once legendary fortress, Carlia casted Detect Magic to see about how the remnants of the garrison were able to still hold on stubbornly in spite of the Federation's superior advantages. It seems that even after you devastated the fortress, the remnants are still holding out below. Carlia tells Samantha, Fortunately, I know how these tunnels work. The college mage added. You do? Samantha asked. I had inspected the entrance that your soldiers entered into and found that the door was enchanted with the alarm spell. A simple cast, but a very useful one. Carlyle explained. Like some sort of motion activated alarm? Buchanan questioned. Indeed, one that only the spell caster can be alerted without the intruder knowing the wiser. They will always know to expect you whenever one of your men no matter how many moves pass that hole. Thankfully I dispelled but even then, the enchantment can be hard to find unless you know where to look. Carlyle explained. Recalling her teachings, Samantha knows that the alarm spell one would abjure warded zone around a door, window or an area of no larger than a 20-foot cube with magic that when any creature, whether tiny or large would alarm the user either through a mental alert or an audible alert. For this case, it was a mental alarm, essentially a magical equivalent of a silent alarm. By that logic Carlia, even if we get rid of that alarm the enemy will still expect us to enter through there. Samantha reasoned. They know we are all on top of them and they will fight tooth and nail for every inch of ground left. I know, but fortunately, I know a bypass. Carlia pedantically rectified. This is... Was the inner keep of the fortress is it not? She asked. Sergeant Buchanan silently nodded. Then this vestibule. Here is no ordinary threshold. Carlyle walked towards the burrow's entrance and caressed the metallic casting of its 15-foot cubic meter outline. There should be a secondary entrance somewhere around here. Another entrance? Crocker asked. Indeed. Imperial fortresses, at least the old ones have extensive networks of tunnels and entrances below their inner keeps, not just for defensive purposes but also to ease the flow of walking around. The college mage began to conjure a sprite of magical light with a flick of her hands and began to whisper a small incantation, programmed to find similarly built doors round the fortress. The animated sphere zoomed slowly past the Afif soldiers whom they followed it until they reached a particular set of rubble. To Aliathra's religious recognition, several broken pieces of the rubble were in fact once resplendent holy symbolisms inherent in the elven human pantheon. The entrance should be right here. Or below here. Carlyle informs them. Boys, get to work. Buchanan ordered. The rear echelon soldiers began to prime their exosuits, pickaxes and shovels as they began to tear apart the ruined temple of the Gleesian gods. They did give some courtesy to Aliathra who insists she preserves several of the still intact religious relics that littered the broken ground to Samantha's respect. Before long. The rubble was cleared away with only the foundation of the temple in its rustic marble floor remained of the one's holy building, quickly chanted both the spells of detect and dispel magics, 
Carlyle revealed before them, in a brilliant hue light in which the floor starts to deform and creates a doorway to a dark and spooky tunnel, similarly built like the first one before. All right we got another tunnel inside, Buchanan cheered, throwing a scanner. Kane called out as he tossed a sonar scanner into the dark tunnel below, uploading map. The engineer informed the team. All right we will clear out as many rooms on our way down but priority is taking down that altar of Dillon. Capture it if possible. Samantha ordered. Let me come with you. I know how to navigate these tunnels. Carlyle volunteered. How do you know all of this? Crocker asked. The college were involved in designing these underground pathways around the fortresses. I so happened to know where most of them would lay about. She answered. Damn tunnel ratting. Samantha murmured nervously bit her lip. It was a very tense and unpleasant affair that requires the utmost environmental awareness and split-second reflexes, compared to her peers both from West Point and within her squad. She was found lacking in comparison to her more cybernetically enhanced and more experienced of her teammates. She always had a lurking fear of darkened and dilapidated undergrounds. It was like being slowly being buried alive if it not were her companions and the aid of a simple flashlight to allow her mind respite. Especially when they entered Martin's old tomb, though at least the scary monster who lived there was actually a very friendly one. But that was beside the point. Yet still, she cannot allow these enemy mages to torment more Federation soldiers. The choice was simply to conquer her old fear at that moment once again, not just for her own sake but for the men under her wings. You ready Cap? Ken asked her. Why yeah. Let's clock, lock and load up everyone. Let's silence that altar. We will need to trace the mana signal in order to reach it. Samantha nods, obscuring her hesitancy. Be ready to fight in close quarters everyone. We should be looking for a room called the Arcanium. That's where they will most likely shelter the altar since they also store the mana crystals there too. Carlyle added, turning on their tactical flashlights and night vision sights, Samantha leads the Ufif clearing forces down the Imperial Fortress underground. Little Hills tunnelways were a contrasting mix between rugged and decayed stone wooden construction decorated with patriotic heraldry of the Slay Aegean Empires as urine gilded dragon that carries in each of its two paws a sword and a bountiful cornucopia. There was some dust, cracks and leaked water that brings a fetid atmosphere that only grows more loathsome the further deeper they go. Not helping matters was that the ground they walk seemed to creak at the slightest of steps. Halt! Aliathra raised as she whispered the incantation of from her new cybernetic hands. Her magics encapsulating them in a prismatic bubble that some even commented saying it tickles upon its caress. Try stepping on the floor now. Aliathra informs the youth soldiers. The youth thief promptly followed the elf and began to slightly pat their feet to the ground. It was muffled and silent. Perfect for stealthy approaches. All right. Everyone teams we are about how many? Samantha asks for the order of battle. We are about a 30-man team. We should clear as much ground as we can so that the diggers can do some SSE. Crocker suggested. Roger. Everyone split into teams of at least seven and bring a mage with you. Your objective is to clear this floor and the next one below of all traps and tangos. One team go right. The other left. Another as a rear guard and I will go after the altar, Samantha ordered. Yes ma'am. The Ufif soldiers nodded. Aliathra, Iris, Carlyle began to split off with their respective teams as ordered. Walking stealthily, swimming through each room and corridor with methodical efficiency. Whenever they encounter a magical trap, a mage would promptly dispel it although the more mundane of traps can still be easily diffused or set off safely thanks to the sapper's help. I don't like this. There must be tons of hidden traps around here waiting to ensnare us a youth soldier fearfully states. Actually, one trap is in front of you right now. Aliathra points out. The rifleman heart skipped coldly as he lay still. His leg refusing to move another inch. For the keen-sighted elven ranger, she threw a pebble forward about two meters away from the soldier's position and the floor soon combusted into flames. Watch your step fire in this gay door is dangerous. The elf whispered as she knelt down and began to dispel the magical runes that plague their path forward. Watch out for people too. 
There's still remnants of the old garrison walking around here. Diaz radioed. In fact, put your hands in the air. A brief moment paused on the radio before three shots could be heard discharged from Diaz's channel. Three tangos downed. Moving up. Diaz returned to his radio. When it come to encountering any of the surviving garrison, the Imperials were only given one brief second to place their hands in the air otherwise they would be swiftly gunned down. Those who move any muscle outside of their shoulders being raised up or attempt to shout was swiftly gunned down. However even with the Ufif's efficiency, there were cracks that the sly defenders of Little Hill managed to slip through thanks to their tenacity and relative home field advantage. In being inside the tunnel, several Ufif were injured and worse killed by the conniving ambushes and traps that littered the underground. Those casualty were being quickly siphoned out of the underground thanks to the assisting rear echelons of the 9th Artillery Company where they were given immediate medical attention with healing prayers from Aliathra to boot. Even though Samantha knew the procedure must be as slow and risk-averse as possible, she knew that the longer they dally the more opportunities the Battlemages can use their magics with their altar of Talin. They are flanking us. Hurry! A low voice echoed the dreary corridors. It slowly became apparent that the survivors holed up inside these first two floors of the underground were slowly realizing that their defenses were slowly being unthreaded. But Samantha and her brave team did not care, they will purge this fortress of all of its power one way or the other. As the captain progressed through the dungeon, Samantha slowly began to push herself fast impetuously clearing the rooms as she goes catching even the tempo intense crocker out of breath too. She weaved through the imperial defenses with terrifying speeds, eliminating whatever came her way with rifle and sorcery her power blending the Federation's bleeding-edge technology harmonizing with Gleesian magics truly exemplifying the share word on her chosen one's namesake title. Clearing everything now. Status report? Samantha radioed. We are entering into dot R. Iris responded to the call but mid-sentence she screamed. Iris? Samantha cried. Samantha. See Captain. We are in some kind of paralysis. Hold person. Iris alarmingly updated. Let go of me. Let go of him. If you can hear me Ranupata through this magic stick, if you want to save your Soch Phil Master and your demonic minions, come here and yield to us. An Imperial Mage provokes. Samantha's pulse rocketed upon hearing the Vampire Witch and her team being ensnared. Iris' additional cries set off an impetuous cocktail of adrenaline into the captain's buoyant head. She could not bear to see more of her men die, get injured or worse today. Not while she can help it. Slow down Captain. Crocker shouted, trying to reach out for her. They're going to try to capture you again. I can't just leave them there. They will kill Iris, Ken and the others if I don't. She protested as she continued to dash towards Iris' last known position. Samantha, don't come closer you gallant twat. I, I can. Iris tried to speak but her mouth was muffled by her imperial captors. Shut up vampire. When I am done killing your shadow familiar, I will personally burn you alive with my holy magics. He laughed tauntingly as he aimed his magical wand threateningly to Ken. Iris gnashed her fangs together as she forced her will off of the spell's enslaving effects, managing to regain minimal articulation of her right hand. It wasn't the first time she was caught in such a dire predicament and she will be damned if her powers would fail her now. Iris, Samantha yelled out into the distance as Samantha, now gaining visual of her captive men, charged headlong with her FBR H-20 rifle on hand. Don't come any closer. Iris warned her, there is, but the headstrong redhead did not listen. Unknown to her, a few moments ago, Iris Kane and an additional amount of five men were busy attempting to defuse a rather complicated framework of a set of booby traps around this chamber of Little Hill's dungeon. Iris was busy at work attempting to defuse the traps when Samantha's radio call unintentionally broke her focus, setting off a magical rune that cursed Iris and her youth companions with a higher powered hold person spell that ensnared them in its confining embrace and that was not accounting the other magical runes of still indiscernible payload albeit their trigger was pressure point based. When Samantha's foot unknowingly stepped on the runes hidden triggering inscription, 
A great burst of flames burst forth below the feet of the five other Yafif soldiers, immolating them and with a hold person spell trapping them in place they became like skewers of meat that stood there as the inferno engulfed their bodies killing them. All Samantha could do, was revile in horror as the fire burned her men leaving her vulnerable for one of the awaiting imperial mages to restrain her with a casted hold person spell. We have you now shareholder. Fear not, we shall free you from this harlot's bewitching spell. A very rugged imperial mage emerged from the shadows announced himself, his hands luminously powering up to prepare his magical spell altogether. We must combine our magics to free her mind from their grasps. Another mage emerged followed by about ten more of them and an escort of equally grizzled imperial legionnaires and dwarven warriors. Relona Maxima, they shouted in unison, their magics encompassing Samantha in radiant silvery light. The only good thing about her status, in regards to the dangers of fighting against the Imperials and the rest of the Alliance soldiers is that they will go out of their way, if they could to capture her alive and revert her back to the side of good, much to the Federation's humor and annoyance. Yet try as they might pouring their magics onto Captain Rose, the native mages simply could not break the tough enthrallment that was placed upon the shareholder. Let me go, I will never join you. Samantha growled. By the gods, our disenchanting rituals on her is not enough to break. We need to bring her back to Herring Point so that the Grand Master Owen and the rest of the college might find a way to save the shareholder from the hold of the demon invaders. One mage cursed. Maybe we just need to go after the source itself. Another proposed. Dispose of the vampire and her shadow familiar. He pointed to Aris and Cain. I won't let you shitheads take me or get your claws on them. Samantha continues to growl at them as she struggles to break free from the whole person spell. I am sorry chosen one but for your own sake. We have to dispose these despicable monsters that enthralling you. You cannot see for what they really are but they are monsters. You have to believe us and you will when we are done here. Any last words before I pass righteous judgment on these creatures? A dwarf never beard brandishes his actocolite axe, its blade gleaming sharply from the faintest of torchlight. I always dreamed of wiping that smug looks vampires have. The dwarf grinned. If Samantha could move, she would actually whimper disconsolately dejected by the crisis before her. Two of her squad mates, her friends, her teachers and peers will be ritualistically executed before her olive-shaded eyes. Well keep dreaming stunty. Iris roared, the vampire witch's hands regain full articulation, allowing her to swiftly dispel the rest of her body from the paralyzing hold person spell. She quickly drew her Astra Magnum pistol and discharged the head of the closest imperial mage, striking him dead in a gory explosion of viscera. The dwarf raised his axe in attempt to slay her quickly, but Aris' superior reflexes initiated the first and only contact she needed, her wolverine-like claws slashing through the Everbeard's exposed face, his head falling off of his body in multiple thick slices. Before even one of the Imperials could even shriek, call or say even a word, Iris, as if possessed fully by her bloodlust began to tour through. Nay, eviscerated the Alliance soldiers with blinding speeds. Before even half of a half of a minute had passed, the room lay quiet, blood splattered charitably into the ground with only Cain, Samantha and a finger-licking Iris being the only living people left inside the chamber. Cain, Iris exclaimed, her breath soothing in relief as she hurried to the Nigerian and quickly dispelled both his and the captain's instant airs. The vampire witch and strider combat engineer shared a brief momentary embrace that both of them were still alive, their amorous contact, likened to the moon resting upon the dark blanket that was night. Samantha however, stares in distraught over the five dead Jufif soldiers whose charred bodies lay on the ground. Five dead more, killed under her watch this time through her own indirect actions. Her own hubris. Captain, we have time to mourn later. We need to shut off that altar now. Cain shook her out of it. Right. Come on. Follow me. Let's end this once and for all. She snapped back to reality. The next room they will enter shall be the last one, and that, no more of her or any other men would be at risk of dying. At least for today. Sergeant Buchanan, we have five men down.
bring body bags. Samantha radioed, torturously grabbing the five men's dog tags from their corpses, their metal surfaces still burning in heat by the trap's previous flames. Iris, Ken and the captain soon regrouped with Crocker and the rest of the tunnel ratting teams as they prepared to breach the last room on the floor, the Arcanium. Guarding the entrance was runic symbolisms that glowed a faint blue light that Samantha intrinsically salivated at the thought of seeing those strange engravings. The door is sealed with magics. Carlia, Aliathra dispel it and flash him. Crocker ordered. How many are we looking at? Samantha asked. Snake Cam says we got just six people inside, four mages operating the altar and two imperial foots. They are about to fire the altar again. Crocker answered hurryingly. The magics has been dispelled. Aliathro informs the sergeant. Count of three. Samantha rallies everyone on her mark, preparing her flashbang grenade on her hands. One dot two dot three. The captain shouts. Crocker opened the creek the door open allowing Samantha and the Yafif to toss flashbangs into the room. Once they detonated a second later, the Yafif soldiers stormed the room, quickly dispatching the two foot soldiers before turning to the Imperial mages manning the altar. The magical artifact was quite opulently designed. It had several telescopic lenses, a chamber to hold a mana crystal on the bottom of it in a receptacle where one mage is using its powers within a heavy stone-like object to cast his spells whilst the telescopic lens enhanced the range and maintains the power of said spellcasting. Meanwhile another mage by the caster's side uses a crystalline mirror ball that allows her to scry through divinely above her surroundings in order to operate the aiming mechanisms of the altar. Meanwhile two other mages assisted them in moving the altar of Dolin, that rested upon a circular gyra mechanism and also loading fresh new mana crystals when the time is needed to reload it. This was, as Samantha can discern from her own experience. Very much like your artillery piece with the person manning the trigger, another aiming the sights, and another more loading the cannon with its ammunition. All of this wrapped appropriately with a the glowing white symbol of Talin the god of magic, an a trade star with a halo encompassing around its arms. The Ufif soldiers wasted no time gunning down these last four mages whose bodies fell upon the invisible smites of their rimless and bottlenecked cartridges. Clear, Samantha declared as the men were set at ease. We did it. We got ourselves an altar of Dillon. Crocker cracked a proud smile at his face as he marveled over the arcane object. Indeed, your magus. Or, Dr. Malona will be pleased to have this in his study. Carlyle nodded. This is CCA Captain Rose. Arcanium is secured. Repeat the altar of Talin has been neutralized. Commence SSE. Samantha radioed. Roger that Samantha. You saved a lot of lives today. Sergeant Buchanan replied gratefully back. Captain Rose sighed, exhaling in relief at finally being able to rest herself easy after a long day of offensive pushes deep into the heart the Empire's lands. She cannot wait to have a good six to eight hours of sleep and a warm MRE meal of spaghetti bolognese to recuperate her weary self. Today had been a long haul. Strider Group and their 9th Artillery Company companions returned to the surface of Little Hill where several of the rear echelon and assault engineer briefly congratulated them on a job well done while paying a moment of respectful silence for those who paid the ultimate price of eliminating the altar of Tulin that Crocker, Diaz and Ken hauled over to the surface. Samantha looked away from the body bags in shame whilst she tried to hide her guilty visage with a stoic facade. Before long, the rear echelons of the 9th Artillery Company returned to work, reassured of their safety now they no longer have to scramble away from any spontaneously appearing conjurations of destructive magics to harass them. Sergeant Buchanan was kind enough to offer a night rest on 9th Artillery's hastily erected tents used as a barracks for Strider Group to rest themselves for some very much needed R&R. There were just a few loose ends and a few casual words left to speak of before the squad retired for a warm thermal blanket. Samantha. A word? Iris approached her, fists clenched. Those five men. I could have easily dispelled their enchantments if you didn't trigger that fire rune. She reprimanded her. I know. I it was. My fault. Samantha covered her face in shame not daring to look at Iris over her mistake. 
her five men tragedy of impulsiveness, whose ghosts will now haunt her memories forever. Of course, it was your fault Sam. Why by the gods would you charge in like that? I could have easily fended those imperials off. Iris shouted. I, I just didn't. I just didn't want to see. I couldn't bear to see any of you guys getting hurt. I wanted to protect all of you. Shield you with myself and my powers. Samantha confessed. Oh Samantha, do you not trust me? I trusted you and the Federation with my life being here and helping you and Strider out. Iris sulked. The least you could do is return that same trust back to me. Iris is right Captain. Clay backed her up. You have been pushing yourself too hard as of late. You need to learn to trust us all. You're only one woman and there's like seven of us. We won't be here if we needed to be babysat all the time. But I don't want to lose any of you. Especially you Iris. You are all my friends here. Those Imperials earlier could have easily killed you and Cain. I can't bear it losing you. Samantha cried out. The vampire which dashed towards Samantha and gave her a swift slap on her cheek, causing the captain to recoil from the sharp pain that the feisty sorceress inflicted upon her. Can your doll cop of a head of yours listen to me again Sam? Do not be so selfish like that again. You think you are the only one who experienced the pain of losing someone close. Do not forget you are my friend and friends trust each other. Iris exclaimed. It is painful for me and the rest of the Strider to nearly lose you to the enemy too. So stop being a selfish Olafu. Iris that's enough. Ken intervened, his muscular arm defining a clear border between Iris and Samantha. The captain, shedded a singular tear before turning back to the vampire witch. Smiling, T thank you Iris. Thank you for showing me that I was indeed being a selfish Olafu. I promise you and the squad that this won't happen again. I will trust you guys more. Samantha nodded. You better be captain. Iris assault on a superior commander aside. Remind me to write that off is right. That kind of behavior of yours can get you killed. Trust me you're not the first person I met who acted like you. And yes. Of course he's dead. Crocker shared his peace. Tomorrow is a new day alright everyone. Let's just rest up in these tents and get read for the next day. There's still a long road ahead of us. Ken requested. Yeah. You're right. Samantha yawned, stretching her arms out. Sometimes, we just need a good night's sleep. I got a pee first. Diaz raised his hand. You wait for me in the tent later sweetie you got that? The corpo turned to Aliathro who was just beginning to loosen her garments, readying to let the night's cooling air to relax her weary body. The elf smiled softly as she faded to into slumber. Captain, I got a call from the colonel. Clay passed his radio to Samantha. Grabbing the mic piece, Samantha readied herself to absorb the next bit of strong words from her superior. Captain Rose, sit rep from Vercourt. They just took the town hall and our flag is waving atop of the center. Our side of Operation Haymaker is proceeding. Quite frankly ahead of schedule. Polonsky enthusiastically reported. That's gr Affirmative I mean sir. Sorry I am just tired. It's such a late call right now. Samantha apologized. I knew you could eliminate those magic attacks within the day and also capture that altar of Talin. Dr. Malona would be happy to get his hands on it when we ship them out. Ashamed really we lost some good men in that adventure. But alas there is no such things as a casualty less war. Polonsky's tone lowered. But those aside, with Little Hill and Vercourt now ours, the entire Imperial Legion and their Alliance of the Light are left in disarray within the region. Our reconnaissance aircraft says that it is virtually a clear road between us and Newgonia, Polonsky said. That is great. Anything else I need to know? Samantha asked. You will have to report back to your company tomorrow and you will be called in on occasion to get rid of any magical traps that could threaten our advances but intelligence suggests we just broke through the worst of them. Have your team get some good night's rest and good meal because tomorrow noon the advancement will continue. To Newgonia. Shield further out. Polonsky gave his farewell as the radio feed was cut off. Looks like this war will be as soon as it began. Samantha looks on to Clay. Yeah. I hope so Captain. I hope so. Clay nodded back. Good night Captain Rose. 
he said before retiring to bed. Good night to Clay. Sergeant Clay. Samantha gave her due, stating Edward's new title. Dash. Raven's coup. Poop. Diaz called out his secret challenge phrase. His initial excuse of needing to excrete his liquid wastes was just a deception. The corpo finds himself behind the back lines of the rear echelons hidden in a secretive meeting point near where one of Apara Corporation's PMC camps established themselves in, away from prying eyes and curious ears. The raven does not say cuckoo, a voice responded, it was the correct response to the challenge phrase. Raven Company Private military contractors reporting, how may we be of service again to a Paro Corp? A PMC emerged from the shadows holding a briefcase on his right hand. He represents one of the numerous private interests of the pacification campaign. By proxy, a Paro Corporation in Gleesia. Have you dealt with the bodies of the magic users? Diaz asked. Yep bagged and stowed away as ordered. I assure you my men will make sure nobody will miss them when they're gone. But, dear Anna, Dr. Sforzo explicitly demanded live specimens, the PMC said. Tell the good doctor that I am still working on it. She will need to suffice with corpses for now. For her. Study. Diaz weaseled his words. Outside of Don Aparo de Runa. Dr. Sforzu is the second person we should not be disappointing with, the PMC reminded him. I know, I know, I just need more time. Diaz sighed. Just tell her this, when Herring Point is captured I will make sure that this time, Dr. Sforza gets her specimens. Diaz promised. And let the silverbacks get all the glory? The PMC crossed his arms frustratingly at him. Me and Bobby will pull some strings so I can get you lads inside Herring Point when we hit the fireworks yeah? Just keep pushing those materials out on your research exports and you'll get your bonuses on your upcoming checks you got that? Diaz reminded the PMC of his extrajudicial job in Gleesia. Of course, now. Do you have the samples? The PMC asked. The corpo reached out into his pockets and gave him three plastic vials of a crimson substance to the mercenary. They were labeled Aliathra, Iris, and Samantha. I barely managed to get these out of the lab. Now be sure to tell Dr. Sforza this is the only samples I can nabs for her from those government nerds. For I cannot do that again. Diaz sternly bared his teeth. Now. The new item. For one smuggle to another. The PMC smiled as he opened the briefcase. Pulling out from its soft cushions, a curved shaped sword, sheathed with a trigger shaped hilt. It was something that he wanted to get his hands on from Bobby the very moment the blade was ready for delivery when the new shipment of Actocolite compounds arrived on Aparo Core New Metal Works, the first of its level of industrial prowess and refinement in Gleesia. As fast. No. Faster than any eyes can see, Bobby said that, the PMC bowed, beautiful. Diaz smiled as he unsheathed his new high-frequency actor titanium alloy katana. He can feel the whir of the violently shaking alloys thirsting for it to be used as the Mayari moon glinted on its cerule. Chapter 50, Climb Mount Dinley Part 2, Major Benjamin Holyfield Codenamed, Spearhead obsessively downed his fifth round of Arabica as the clock struck 6 a.m. He had foregone sleep the night before, instead meticulously reviewing every bit of detail of his area of responsibility of Operation Haymaker with concordance with the elements consisting of West Army Group for this military offensive. He had familiarized himself deeply with the capabilities of his Marines, his armored units, his assault carrier's aerial wing his engineers and the infantry in addition to the help of the native auxiliaries and so-called partisans under his command. They reciprocally know what the Major, in all of his many years of battlefield wisdom would tell them to do, breakthrough in all of the Ufif's roaring might. For the prize beyond Mania's bluff or more geographically correct saying Mania's isthmus, as his recce would debate, is a direct road leading straight into the capital of the Empire. Herring Point herself in all of her imperial majesties, the terrain as his scouts and intel would suggest would be rough with swampy sands. 
jagged rocks and many places of significant elevation the empire would use to their advantage to repeat the same fate the Battle of Marnia's bluff of old fell upon Albon and his heavily armored vanguard studying what little history he could of his predecessor's mistakes. From what Holyfield had gathered, the previous battle was a case of overconfidence getting the better of the old demon lord as his previous victories were won through sheer superior strength in open scraps rather than through cunning acumen. Still, he did have the same rational why he would walk through the trouble passing over the isthmus in the first place and that was the shortcut to Herring Point. He did not expect his men to be bogged down so easily by the swampy and rough terrain the area was known for. Call Dust La A. E. Jack. The Empire's founder used it to his much lighter footed war bands, longbowmen, and the mages to wash out the bogged down demon army into dust, defeating Allbone and gaining total victory for the First Alliance of the Light. Reading back the details, Major Holyfield now knows what to do, in order to turn his disadvantage around. For a start, the task of getting his men and their mechanized elements that they need to break through the hunkered down defenses in Marnia's bluff will need to have the terrain's slowing effects be as mitigated as far as possible. Armored vehicle launched bridges, constructor drones, chopped wood, some alteration magics from the goblin shaman Hodden and sheer ingenuity should suffice. But there is some terrain where infantry would be forced to get their feet to up to their thighs wet thick with swamp and sand water. This will leave them vulnerable to enemy ambushes and traps but even then, Holyfield has calculated his answer to those. He had deployed several reconnaissance teams hidden out of or within enemy sight that records all possible ambush points the Empire's troops were planning or constructing to create with their info. Holyfield and his marines would know where to avoid passing over the isthmus or if they must pass over, send in an airstrike or a sapper squad to neutralize the enemy defenses. His advisors suggested that they eliminate the traps as soon as they know it's there but Holyfield argued that if they do that, the Empire will just make a new trap somewhere else or find a means to adapt to their countermeasures in which they will have to restart their planning efforts all over again. The Major simply could not afford to of his enemies learn he and his men methods by observing his actions, preferring to decapitate them before they realize what had happened. He had given all of his men strict orders to retain the masquerade of the Ufif's impending assault for Operation Haymaker by not engaging the enemy forces unless they scout out too far ahead over the northern hills of Suville. The Major himself was quite flabbergasted to say the least of how Prince Clovich who he still retains his scrupulous stipulations about having him and a three regiments worth of Tyriani modernized Riffelwies of the newly formed Lanier army, managed to secure Suville, formally speaking under the wing of the Federation and Clovich's Tyriani amelioration. Technically speaking, the Ufif and the TRA were militarily trespassing over what is still considered imperial lands. If it were not for the huge amounts of subterfuge and seduction by both the Uf and the Apara Corporation this unique avenue to vector an angle into the heart of the Imperial Heartlands would have been a fool's errand. Yet somehow someway, the strange miracles of espionage works in equally mysterious ways. Even Clovich is recording that he is listening to when he allowed his cousin Duke the Bald was a curiosity of artful diplomatic work over the past month's spare into fruition. Dash. About an hour earlier, the Ducal Palace, in all of its palatial and fairy tale magnificence, had barely recovered from the wear and tear that was last month's Corsiad festivities. The refuse of the parties was being removed to make room for a return to normalcy for the daily lives of the locals. To its mercantile and laid back self, the harbours were reopened importing and exporting the goods of the empire and beyond whilst the vineyards and farmlands reinvigorate their fields for the next harvest, Prince Clovich, and his newly dressed entourage of his newly reformed Lanier arrived at the duchy moments before sunrise, taking care not to alert their presence to the inhabitants as visitation is a delicate affair. Still, the palace staff were more than ecstatic to see the prince return to his ancestral homeland, especially when they heard of the news he just came back from a special journey. Cousin, I had just read your letter the other day. Forgive me, 
I was drained from the festivities I hosted weeks ago. Thibault approached his dear fraternal relative with familial glee. His arms stretched wide with welcoming gesture. I am glad that I see your eyes again dear cousin. Clovich returned the bout's amiableness while he carried several bags of souvenirs he had acquired in reserved for his cousin from his travels from Earth. I bring you many great gifts from my travels. The prince gently dropped down his lavish bags before fraternally embracing his cousin. Thomas sight, Clovich's liaison with the awaiting new fief soldiers stand by as he allowed the two their familial moment together. After letting go, Clovich began to present the his many earthly gifts to Duke Thibault and his newly awoken entourage whom some are still in their nightwear and have yet to eat breakfast, perfectly speaking. There was a few snacks within the pile of presents that Clovich brought home. Japanese melons, sake rice, wine and jimin iberigo to name a few. These are extraordinary gifts cousin. The ball beamed splendidly. The wine. The so-called sake and whiskey tastes as fine as the wines of Souville. He marveled as his tongue greeted the alcohol's sweet yet earthly flavors. And the melon tastes as close as I can get to heaven. A noble woman swooned. That is not all but I also bring these two. For each and every one of you. Clovich smiled. He began to pass along the non-edible of gifts, one per person, to Thibault and his entourage. Golden watches, jewelry and bonsai trees all made by some of the finest artisans of their respective crafts. Even the guard captain was not exempted when he received a katana from the prince too. It moves. My new bracelet is moving. A nobleman squealed delightfully at his newly acquired watch. We thank you greatly again cousin. Your generosity knows no bounds. The bald bowed. I hope you and the rest of your courts love what I brought from earth. The prince smiled, but it faded as he transitioned his visage to a weighty portrait. But alas, I am not here for more of your parties for we both have important business to attend to. Everyone. You do all know why I am here do you not? Clovich cautiously asks them. Of course, cousin. My hundred and most sincerest of apologies to disappoint you but I am fear as my honor as the Duke of Souville. I cannot submit Souville to your newfound patrons. The Balt professed his stance. I know all of the terrible circumstance that had happened in your realm by those adventurer vermins and the Cephide Liad crows much like when they tried to overthrow me for Jodent. However, even if the Empire had done such underhanded dealings, I think we shouldn't directly. The Bolt states his protests of Clovich's plans as stated from a letter he received from him about a week ago of what many happenings had occurred during the residuum of allowing the youth to appear as a particularly quirky group of guests during Souville's course he ad. Retaliate? Fight back? Demand justice? Is that what you will you say? You know me, that I know you well cousin. I know you would say that, Clovich shouted frighteningly at the Suvelli, disbalancing their normally decadent demeanors. This cannot stand. There is a better way, a better world out there and you and I cannot just sit idly by our thrones whilst a newer and better path is open for us, he pleaded. Prince Clovich, what you are implied to impose to us is both madness and treachery. You ought to know that the Slay Agents are the largest and the most powerful empire in the whole Xenograd. Their unending legions, as vast as the sands of the Dragatoi Eyes coast. Not to mention they control the College of Magi, the Navy and the Adventurers Guild. Opposing them is equivalent to death. A noble stated the most obvious of opposition that he and Duke the Bolt will face when they fall through under the rhythm of what is in their eyes. Open rebellion against the Empire. If you say so, do you remember what we did to those vermin that tried to overthrow the duke? Those land sharks and not to mention our warriors against those elven elites who tried to ruin the games? Thomas Sight intervened. By the gods, you must be the other world known as Sir Sight are you not? Duke the Bolt recoiled at Thomas' cybernetic appearance. Even his entourage too were equally revulsed by him. If he wasn't disarmed, his hands raised upwards unthreateningly and his rather humble clothing of a simple black red suit, the duke would have ordered his guards to kick him out. Please a allow me to e explain what I, I will have to go through if I am to follow my dear cat cousin's orders word.
for word. The board swallowed his fears as he stuttered to explain his predicament. I know that you people have powerful magic to kill a legion's worth of adventurers in a blink of an eye or kill whole packs of bullets, but we are talking about a the whole entirety of the Empire's legions, hundreds of thousands strong of the finest of knights, footmen, war beasts and mages in all of Zanigrad. And what of you? You will only have less than about 7,000 or troops, us included against them. Even if you have both the shareholder and the scholar at your side, how will you and we be able to stand against the Empire's wrath? A noble inquired. So, are you saying you do not believe of our superior power based on the letter the prince had dispatched to you? Thomas pressed on the noble's inquiry. If I can confess Sir Sight, me and my court find it ridiculous to believe that you have the ability to crush the Imperial Army and their allies within a week and your people wielding the power to wipe out the whole of Glyse in a massive firestorm in a blink of an eye as so you claimed. The Federation are just as only humans. From another world after all. There is just simply no sensible way any human could wield the power to match only of the gods. The ball defended his entourage's opinion. Even with your eccentricities, he added, cringing on Thomas' uncanny appearance. Failing to mention, the guard captain interjected, the Empire had faced off against similar to far worse threats in the past ranging from necromancers, dragons, vampires, barbarians, and beastmen. Even the Black Elves find great difficulty in taking down the Empire. The Slaeagens are just too powerful to fall so easily against your new patrons Prince Clovich. Is that a challenge? Clovich twitched his brow, implanting his hands firmly on his hips. His cousin was as naive as it could get, but then again, despite his decadent heart he always tries as much as he could to appease and protect those whom he considered his friends or those under his responsibility of care. Indeed, it is, it seems you require, additional persuasion to help you see things our way. Thomas Sight nodded at the Duke. He smirked as he knows, confidently that now comes the more hard line of approaches in order to exact the Federation's will towards these natives. Coincidentally, there is an angle the bureaucrat could use to exploit the Suvelli's self-indulgent priorities. Perhaps I can convince you that it is wiser for us to be partners rather than enemies, Thomas whispered. How so? The ball tasked. Fortress Brian Bark, Little Hill you call it? My men can bring it down within the day, he proposed. You people gonna topple Little Hill by today. Even a child can make up a better lie, a noble man scoffs. This is outrageous. Cousin, I think you should get rid of these people. They are going to get you pointlessly killed without honor. The Balt implored Clovich. Dear cousin of mine, everyone. I know it is hard to believe and I admit that even I cannot fathom what Sir Sight said if your eyes were mine. But I have seen how overwhelming the destructive powers these other worlders possessed during my trip to Earth. Yet, I have also seen what wonders they can bring to the realm. They cured my sister, fed my people and brought order to where there was chaos. I would be a fool to not tap into this new power, not for my own sake but for the subjects of Tyrion themselves too. It is too late now for me to withdraw my patronage, but it is not too late for you to see the writing on the wall cousin, one way or the other. This war is inevitable that the Empire foolishly brought upon themselves, I have a people to protect. So. I will not withdraw my patronage with the Federation. But I give you my word that if you accede Suviel peacefully to me, I will do everything I can to protect you and your people as if you are my own. I have a duty to protect to not only defend the Empire from enemies from without but also from within. Don't you see? My new amelioration and upcoming reforms are our only defense against the coming tide ahead. I will not stop until all of the Empire. Anagrad and Olvgli easier comes through the new age, Clovich states forcefully if I have to, he added, however, I have a single request, Suviel will submit temporarily to the Federation so the Ufami West can pass through and set Operation Base peacefully until we can show the destruction of Little Hill. Clovich asks, what would happen if they lose the war? The Emperor will have our heads stuck on pikes from here all the way to Herring Point and back. The Balt protests. Despite his naivete, the Balt remained stubborn. 
His self-indulgent partying was fueled by the prosperous and stable economy the Souville is famous for attracting. From its galleon trade, winemaking and textiles all tariffed and or taxed by his hands. Separating from the current status quo is a huge leap forward that Clovich honestly thought. The intimidating might and their attempts of seduction by the Federation would be enough to steer his cousin to his side. But alas, it has seemed the Duke is standing on his ground. Now was the time, albeit regrettably as he had discussed over the plan with Major Holyfield and Thomas Sight over the possibility of enacting the backup plan in case the military access of Souville were to be put into jeopardy. It was time for to enact the foreboding plan B. Then I will have to make you allow my soldiers to march into Souville Duke Thibault. Under duress, Clovici pulls out from his pocket his 9mm pistol. A personal purchase from his trip to the Tahoe Reno industrial complex, he aimed the firearm at his cousin with a grim but determined discipline. He was always taught that as a ruler, he will have to make many difficult decisions. This being one such crossroad. Cousin of mine, have you gone mad? Have the other world as corrupted you as they say? There is only you and Thomas and I have my guards surrounding the two of you. Your brash display will be surely punished if you move a step closer to me. Thibault fearfully threatened Clovich. He knew what the metal wand he held on his small hand is capable of as demonstrated during the course he had. It was surely a more frightening affair when the device that seems to be powered by killing magics be aimed at his direction. Dutifully, the Duke's guards rushed into formation protecting the duke and his noble entourage with their bodies as they aimed their swords towards the rebel prince and his alien companion. Yet Clovich and Mr. Sight remained calm, knowing this is the exact reaction they predicted will happen when Plan B was being executed. I don't think so. Thomas smirked. With a snap of his fingers, a squad of youth Navy SEALs suddenly decloaked from their invisibility suits emerged from the refraction of their specially designed armor pointing their black staves threateningly back at all of the guards in the room. The rifled barrels of their guns, aimed leeringly over each of the Duke's men, ready to curse them off of this mortal coil by the squeeze of the trigger. Took you all long enough team Knight Gaunt Thomas crossed his arms at the SEALs team. The sea, air, land and space special operations team had infiltrated the deepest pockets of the Ducal Palace to shadow Prince Clovich and Thomas Sight when they had their fateful meeting with Duke Thibault, easily weaving through the primitive security measures thanks to their oceanic infiltration experience and the cloaking abilities of their Hanjin Shibuzawa shade suits. The prince had ordered them prior that if they must engage with the palace's staff and tenants, they must do so non-lethally and under no circumstances they are to lay a deadly finger on any of their persons knowing the intense political sensitivity this clandestine operation would bear on the Federation's grand political aspects in the Gleesian pacification campaign. By the gods, one noble man cowered. Ghosts. Impossible. Ghosts appear during the night. Not when Malinari still gazes upon the land. One of the Ducal guards shivered. Th for this is I insanity. This is Mama Madness. The bald stuttered. I cannot let these rogues march over my lands. You know what you are asking me is treason. He reminded him. Then you can just say to the Emperor if we are to somehow miraculously fail as you feared that you were under duress when I made you allow my soldiers to march through Souville, for one way or the other. They will march through Souville. Clovich gritted his teeth. The bolt froze silently, tearfully crying for his cousin to see the folly of his overbearing request. But Clovich remained determined to see his dream push through. Perhaps you need more convincing. Clovich told the bolt. Look over to your gardens arbor. He pointed to the outdoor gazebo that overlooked Souville high atop of the palace's lofty knoll where one can see the harbor and easily discern each ship that comes and goes from the Duchy's port. Remember your prized galleon cousin, the one I hated going to have feasts with because of how easily my stomach would churn against me? Clovich asked as Thomas discreetly radioed from his phone to execution of the next phase of their plan B. The fertile Nerid? Why? Duke the Bald confusedly inquired. It will be ashes at an estimated five seconds. 
Thomas stoically informs the Duke, Impossible. My personal galleon is one of the largest and most durable ship in all of the Dragatoy Eyes coast. It is made from the finest iron bark in the entirety of Zanagrad rivaling only by the Slay Aegean's pride of the ocean. Only a dragon can even dare fight against it. Surely you are only fainting doing such a repulsive deed. The balds cried. I am not jesting cousin. Clovich firmly rebutted with a concise beckon. Sledgehammer you're clear to engage the target. Unload strike package bravo. Thomas ordered. A Jericho missile is then fired from a L missile battery from the Aurora carrier. It cruised towards the land of the Dragatoy Eyes coast, locked onto the fertile Nerid as it sped through the kilometer-long distance between the Aurora and the Galleon in about three seconds. Upon the missile making contact, the Galleon exploded in a large detonation of smoke, wood, and fire, the ship instantaneously disintegrating into driftwood before his eyes. My ship. Duke the bald wailed. He, his entourage and his guards were left utterly speechless by the sheer destruction that his cousin had just demonstrated so brazenly to him. You see now with your own eyes cousin. If they can sink a galleon in seconds, just imagine what it can do to Herring Point. Tyrian, Suvil if we invoke their wrath, what chance do we have if we are their enemies or simply get in their way? Clovich pressed the bolt. All they ask is peaceful co between our banners and their five-ringed azure flower. Nothing more and nothing less. But. How can. But. But. The bolt quivered. My cousin, Clovich carefully held hovered his empty left hand over the bolt. My new empire. My amelioration is the only defense we have against the total destruction of the empire. If we learn their ways, we can come out of this terrible cycle of adversity with our heads held high. So let me tell you once more. The faster I end this pointless war brought forth by our thought to be noble emperor, the sooner peace can return to the realm. You have my word that your people will be protected as if they were my people. He reassured him. I, I, the bald quavered as he sees the smoking remains of his once resplendent galleon. He now sees clearly the writing on the proverbial wall. It was either flow with the new current of the river or be washed aside to oblivion such as the sad fate of the fertile Nerid. I, yield. You will have your troops march in Suviel cousin. Thibault's rotund frame sulked. Thank you, cousin. I assure you that you have made the right choice. By my honor, these troops will only march through your lands and nothing more. Clovich smiled as he rests assured his cousin. Duke the Bolt immediately, grabbed his seal, his quill pen and a parchment of paper, and through the guidance of Sir Thomas Sight, wrote a decree that allowed every unit of the Western Army Group to beg given military passage through Suviel that the Duke dispatched to all of his heralds. News of the grant of military access spread fast across the duchy as Clovich personally saw to the disembarkation of the Afif soldiers from the Aurora who marched through the streets of Suville to an astonished citizenry as they made their way north from the harbour under the northern hills of the duchy's territory where Marnia's bluff lay between them and the grand prize of Herring Point, all without firing a single shot from the Federation troops' rifle nor sliding emission of a sword being drawn from its scabbard from the local guards. True to Clovich's words, the Ufif soldiers did not harass nor levy any of the shocked natives whom they passed by during their march, never stopping as they were given peering looks of weary suspicion as they marched northward. After about thirty minutes of drive past the rolling hills of Suville, the main force of the Ufif's Western Army Group for Operation Haymaker arrived at Mania's Bluff where their preparations, just as scheduled await them for the grueling cross ahead. With all of his cards in play, Major Holyfield took one final deep breath when his subordinates on the ground radioed him that they are ready. With one final meditation, the Major grabbed his radio and in one phrase, forwarded his commands, dash. Climb Mount Deanley. Major Holyfield's voice echoed on the 7th Marine Corps radio. Alrighty ladies, let's get some. A Marine sergeant psyched his brawny, armor-cladded self up, his mouth frothing barbarically for a fight. Lady? Kimaru abashedly furrowed. Are you all women? Get what? She asked around, 
the Western Army group scrambled off their feet and wheels around the center war maiden as Ufif and their native collaborators worked in tandem to get ready for the big crossing through Mania's bluff. At first, upon hearing of what the grand design the other worlders schemed crossing the marshy isthmus, the Oshadini Udi Dosn and the goblins thought that they were insane, repeating the same mistake the Dark Lord Allbone had done centuries before. Yet Major Holyfield was a studious man. He had done his research unfortunately, and terrifyingly, he has the tools and foresight to rectify his predecessor's mistakes. Using great mechanical gillums and another eldritch power the natives were as town to see. The otherworlders war carriages called amphibious fire support vehicles swam through the swampy terrain of Mania's bluff. It wasn't as slow as the natives initially doubted the carriages' abilities but it was still surprising that those horseless carriages did not catch themselves trapped under the Isthmus despondent sloughs. Yet another great mystery these other worlders pridefully demonstrated. Speed, deception and volume of fire was the plan from the crossing as Holyfield wisely reserved the heavier elements of his army, the cataphract main battle tanks mechanized troops and his BWPs in reserve until the more lightly armed IFVs, motorized infantry, assault engineers, marines and native auxiliaries can secure a beachhead to properly deploy them from the air of his giant flying galleon floating above them now quite serenely named the Aurora. More of their alien language be asked folk. You will get used to it. King Martin, the lich casually brushed off the centaur's confusion. Come now. Sir Mendoza and Hodna are ready to move up. He incited her. The two galloped towards the goblin and the Ufif captain who were currently busy making stable footgrounds for the invasion troops to walk over safely the more treacherous areas of Mania's bluff. The centaur, slightly off footing her balance thanks in no part to her additional carriage of equipment and supplies attached to her back. Her fellow Yoshe Dainiadi were given the rather lowbrow task of carriers for the invasion forces various equipment ranging from spare ammunition for their black stave crossbows, their rations and first aid not alongside her archery bow and her handy hand aches. She was normally not comfortable carrying such a heavy burden personally speaking despite her people being more than physically capable of carrying such additional load onto their Herculean backbones as centaur warriors were known to favor heavy armor when they march or rather gallop to war. She much preferred to fight almost in the nude, using her mobility and ferocity rather than endurance to win her battles as the invading forces she and her former slaves find themselves in were given the order to advance. Using wood from the nearby forests supplemented by Hodden's shamanic alteration magics to adjust the size and width of the logs, several footpaths were created to allow the West Army group to be able to cross over the quagmire areas of the isthmus safely. His was supplemented by the cooperative work between the youth combat engineers and several reanimated skeletons the Lich King Martin provided to create this road network nicknamed the Mania Express over the swampy marshes. All of these paths nearly stretched over half of the 6.3 km long isthmus of about a several hundred meters shy of the Imperial defensive lines and were worked on clandestinely under Empire's noses during the nights before the assault. However, Due to the rough terrain, the troops will be forced to have to waddle through some isolated pockets of unstable ground in order to reach the next footpath. Either way, unfortunately, the infantry who are either single filed to cross the footpaths and those squads who have to shuffle through the unabridged areas of the isthmus will equally be vulnerable to enemy ambushes. Come on, go! Mendoza shouted as he pulled the end of the logs with rope over a rock to stabilize the wooden footpath before them. Scores of soldiers, queued up the makeshift bridges as they dashed through the logs with expeditious speed. Cameras and Hodden's sensitive ears tinkled feverishly as they heard the legions of footsteps the other worlders emitted from their rubber shoes as they step footed the marshy isthmus of Mania's bluff. Terrifying roars bellow with the rhythm of their procession from their war machines echoing ambiently around them as they marched under their escort. Meanwhile at the skies, the great flying galleons the other worlders brought from their skyward worlds and yes worlds with plural released their armada of metal dragons who soared through the clouds at Gallic agility as they made their approach to the Dragatoi's coasts. 
smell the wilderness boys this is cowboy country and it's populated by a soon to be dead dragon beast, or knights, or griffins, or whatever I come across first, a fjord ifv commander bombastically declared not if I kill one first yeah, I want to kill me something while soviet march is on full blast on my player, a raging gunship pilot challenged back to the ifv commander. It was the typical jar-headed banter the Marine Corps of the Ufif's Navy were, infamous for. You listen to that commie crap? Don't you know the lyrics are shit when translated? The IFV gunner protested. Ride of the Valkyries is so last year. The gunship pilot scoffed dismissively, but soon his eyes caught something curious on his aircraft's HUD. In guard, thermals on my camera, 50 meters on your fronts. Bring in the heat. The raging gunship pilot cheered as he yawed his heavily armed of Clara craft forward the moment his ship's thermal camera highlighted the signatures of approaching tangos inching closer towards the first waves of West Army Group's infantry. Oh, it's game on flyboy. Buckle up driver, take us forward, the Fjord IFV command ordered. The IFV let out its war cry as exhaustive smoke belched out of its mirage producing heat sinks before suddenly collapsing below underground, its orthogonal body sinking six feet to the ground. What happened? Mendoza raised his voice. A pitfall trap? Shit. Jimmy a second going to push this baby out of here. The IFV commander informed him. Let me help you with that. King Martin proposed as he ordered his skeletons to grab a shovel and begin to dig out the war carriage out of its earthly bastille. The undead creature increasing the size of the hole greatly to be able to allow the Fjord IFV to ramp itself out of the hole. Despite this singular setback, the Ufif advanced continued forward albeit with several soldiers less trickling down the isthmus gauntlet. Camera the Centaur War Maiden, couldn't help but feel slightly unease by just how well this advanced into an otherwise hostile terrain was going, she stared ominously with her naturally acute eyes into the distance over the horizon looking towards the isthmus natural shrubbery as the western sea breeze brushed the verdant leaves eastward. Ambush, Kimura yelled, but not before an arrow struck one of the Ufif marines on his chest. His armor plating however saving him albeit he was forced to recoil his body back from the attack. Gwefru. Another war cry was heard amongst the bushes. Kimra and Hodden steeled their hearts as their ears heard that one worded shout. It was the battle cry typically used by the Imperial Legion to signify the start of their attack. Defend yourselves. The Lich Martain called forth his undead servants souls from generations and centuries from when he was still alive who dedicated their bodies upon death to the former indigenous king of ancient Senhil kingdom of old Tyrian as both his foot soldiers and as manual laborers. Thanks to their inexistent need of rest and clothing, albeit Holyfield forced him much to his bother of having each of his skeletal servants be subjected to a deodorant bath in which as he is more bothered by his undead nature preventing him from smelling said deodorant rather than the three hour long hindrance of soaking himself and his skeletons in the refreshing sense for sanitation purposes when interacting with the rest of the western army group. The skeletons were quick-footed enough to confront their centuries old nemesis albeit at a much more fragile state. They were essentially screening troops, but neither Holyfield, King Martin and even the said previous owners of those bodies cared if their job was to be hammered, slashed, fall or be shot in place of their more precious allies. Then it is an exploit that they will expend to the fullest as it can be. There in the trees, Kimura cried as she fired her bow and arrow towards the tree lines where their attackers emerged from. 12 -0. Suppressing fire, Mendoza flung his orders as tried to remain calm, take cover, a Ufif soldier gritted his teeth, several Slaeijin legionnaires, assisted by irregular adventurers and dwarven warriors whom had camouflaged themselves within the marshy bogs of Marnia's bluff emerged from their hiding spots, a small pit sizable enough to fit five to seven people sealed with a deceitful canopy of brushed together foliage and mud to give them a rudimentary yet surprisingly effective ambuscade to counter most of the Federation's advanced technologies and when it comes to concealing specially picked warriors who have experienced fighting in the rough terrain all over the isthmus, 
similar traps were sprung as the valiant natives unsheathed their weapons as soon as the invaders were busy crossing Mania's bluff and being hampered by the marshy terrain, revealing themselves when the invaders were mere meters away from their hiding spots. The Alliance of the Light invoked the spirits of their ancestors who a long time of mythic pasts, defended the marsh against Allbone the Dark Lord. Meanwhile, Similarly hidden skirmishers emerged from the anonymity of the swamp's blanketing mask thanks to the aid of the Imperial's battle mages providing invisibility enchantments to the range fighters of the Alliance. Fight them back! Hodden bestirred them as all around him the men of the United Federation and their native allies fought in close quarters and under a barrage of heavy arrow fire from the fantastical defenders of Gleesia, using his shamanistic magics to conjure spirit wolf familiar to his aid. These summons, Faeric in nature, were spiritually manifested through the goblin shaman's will that he unleashed to the aid of the Ufif soldiers. Their semi-ethereal nature allowed them to pass through the marshes easily albeit they can never stray too far away from its conjurer as their corporeality is inversely proportional to the distance from their summoner plus their poise. But even with his talents, the Impairal battle mages were just equally skilled in negating his edge with a few banishment spells. They could with moderate amounts of concentration hold still a summoned creature and dispel the magical enchantments from the mental construct to render them inert. We need fire support, Mendoza crawled to cover as radioed for help, roll in an airstrike at my mark he shouted as he threw his IR flare towards the tree line where the enemy skirmishers were firing from, it was absolute chaos. Fighting was so tightly packed that some resorted to melee combat, using their rifles, e2 law whatever a Yafif soldier can get his hands on to defend themselves from the ambush. Die monster an imperial halberdier thrusted mightily his bill-shaped spear onto the slowly drowning fjord IFV, but as the instant his blade made contact with the IFV's composite carapace, the war machine suddenly erupted itself from its despondent trap instantly shattering the spear and running over the pikeman under its titanic threads. It would take more than a simple pitfall with wooden spikes hidden underneath to best what is the latest in the line of decades of military industrial research and savoir faire. But the effort was commendable in reasonably slowing down the otherworldly tide. Shoot them all down. The IFV commander seethed as he grasped his radio intensively as his Verdon chain gun returned a torrent of 7.62 MMX 51 bullets at his attackers. It was a rough ambush that had its initial shock from the sheer surprise but like fire, it quickly burnt out. The ambushers now either retreated deeper into the swamp's forest or lay dead before them but not before taking down several of the invasion forces men with them of mostly of Prince Klovich's new Lanier soldiers known as the Maziad fight team consisting of six freshly trained Tyriani crossbowmen converted into riflemen or rifles and two Ufif soldiers attached to the team, one being the squad leader and the other the squad's radio officer. This is Angel Squadron, Strike Package Bravo making its attack run. An A-25 Dragoon pilot calmly acknowledged Captain Mendoza's IR flare as he lined his aircraft and readied his explosive payloads and 30mm Gatling gun. B B B B B B B B B B B R R R R R R R R R R T T T T T T T T T T T T T T T B B B B B B Unleashed from its breath, clusters of bomblets deluged towards the Imperial forces, evaporating what remained of their defenses. If some of the Slay Agent generals, warband leaders, and mages had foreseen the impending the invasion of the other world as through Mania's bluff. All were shocked by the sheer violence of the Federation's assault when it was unleashed on that early late autumn morning. Like a heavy knockout punch, the Federation's artillery, aircrafts, gun drones and rockets devastate the Imperial first and second defensive lines over the isthmus. Worst was the horror stories the survivors would tell of the metal dragons that flew as fast as hawks yet screamed like bloodthirsted banshees who swoop into their lines to spread their deathly worded curses from its terrifying screech, yet for those who still have shreds of courage left in their hearts, they adamantly chose to weld themselves to the original plan of using the terrain to its advantage, but even then, for the defenders, 
their lines very quickly overwhelmed by the unending and unyielding march of the other world as advance. All that remains were the chalk cliffs and the salt mine that hang over the Slae Aegean side of the isthmus where the alliance can funnel the invaders' advancement much more tightly than they could within the isthmus marshes. The Imperials knew that if the other worlders managed to break through the salt mine that they established their field headquarters on, a direct route to Herring Point would open easily like a street crump its legs for the invaders to ravage on for their conquest. They must stand their ground for the nation, their homes and their families for they must, they shall not pass as of their recording of the time lapsed on their defence. They had only managed to delay a still downpouring wave of invaders for an abysmal eight hours, not even a day had passed at the least as the sun began to set down as their defences were slowly grumbling before their eyes, they could not give any quarter. Yet their relentless assault twirl passes before Malinri's retired across the horizon for the night came, to make matters worse from a practical perspective. Tonight was a new moon as Calariel refused to strip herself nude of her radiance that night making the soldiers rely on their torches more for visibility. They locked the place tight, Mendoza cursed, the chalk cliffs, their white faces illuminated upon the shine of the Imperials' torches separated the invasion force from the other side of the isthmus was sealed heavily corked by wooden barricades enchanted by magics that prevented the entry of the armoured spearheads of the Ufif mechanised vehicle over, through and under them. These enchantments either require exorbitant amounts of damage short of rigging each individual barricade with half a dozen kilos worth of C4 to reliable breakthrough or be disenchanted with the same logic in mind turning the climb up the slope into a painful slog. The cliffs themselves were navigable via a series of three slopes that in peacetime were the northern pathways through the isthmus when approaching from Herring Point and vice versa. The ramps were only wide enough to allow at a time one of the Ufif's vehicles plus half a dozen or so infantry at a time. A perfect choke point, defending atop of them were more enemy skirmishers who are being protected with shields from the Imperial battle mages from the Federation's airstrikes with mixed success, able to injure several of the invaders with their bows. In response, the Ufif's unleashed their UAV combat drones upon those enemy firing positions controlled by Isaac. The drones assaulted in waves of swarms against the secondary lines of the Imperials spraying down light machine gun fire from their drones to harry them like locusts. The mages reacted by casting magic missiles upon the enemy drones, being able to swat many dozens of times as the same reciprocation as the drones shot them down. But unlike the mages despite all of their talents, they lacked Isaac's quantum deep learning capabilities and his transcendence from human limitations such as self-preservation and stress. The AI felt no tears whenever the mages valiantly brought down one of the metal fairies for another can easily take its place. Through layers of attacks, Isaac records the behavioral patterns of the battle mages and transmits them back to the AI for collective analysis to transmit new adaptive orders to the next swarm. In essence, in a white room scenario, battle mages must quickly outsmart them each time as the AI quickly learns how to predict their moves and defenses. Keep the advance going everyone. Holyfield urged the soldiers. We have them on the run. Don't stop now. We need more time major. Get these enchantments off of these. Mendoza radioed. Hodden. Get rid of these. He ordered the goblin shaman. I cannot. I must. Retire. Hodden sighed as he collapsed from mana exhaustion. All the hard work he had done with the bridges and summoning those spirit wolves finally taken his toll on him. The Ufif soldiers near him, realizing that there's nothing more he can do at his current state hurried him away from the fighting to safety so he can recuperate leaving Martin and Gimra with Mendoza. All falls to me then. Fear not. The lich declared as he sailed his bony frame across the white sands of the beach head towards the enchanted barricades, passing by the heavily suppressed IFV, the lich began to concentrate his magics to disenchant the arcane energies within the wooden drop shaped barricades they impeded his allies' progress, he was vengeful, wishing to see the empire be humbled by his necromantic legend to show them what it felt like when someone intruded upon his lands and to destroy all that he had built and scatter his children. 
the Imperials knew of the once powerful necromancy king of the old Senhil kingdom and now soon they shall see the legend with their own eyes of how Martain all feared the name of the Lich King Senhil once more, but even with his vengeance in his unbeaten heart, the advancements in arcane enchantments were still a significant challenge for him. Five hundred years being stuck inside his tomb did not do much in acquiring new knowledges from the outside, only regarding the basic or obsolete inscriptions of his library of ancient texts of those where the advancements of enchantment magics were based upon then expanded from. The lich frustratingly jiggled the locks of these enchantments as he attempted to diffuse them, losing his peripheral awareness of the battle burgeoning around him. Hurry up! The IFV commander told him. I don't know how much longer she can take. Ah, shit. The commander cussed as his fjord IFV was blanketed with boiling pots of oil that were instantly ignited by an archer's careful fire arrow igniting the IFV in flames. Thankfully the flames only managed to cause cosmetic and temporary sensory disablement of the vehicle as the crew were left temporarily blinded by the Alliance's innovative attempt to halt their advance. The fire is screwing with my cameras. I can't see shit. Got a button up? The commander shouted as several engineers frantically put out the fire on his IFV. Someone paints those legs up there. A youth soldier shouted. Martin. We'll cover you. Get that barricade down now. Mendoza urged the lich. A lich. It's the Lich King of Senhil is here, cried one of the Imperial footmen. Yes indeed. I have risen from the grave and all shall fear my name again. Ha ha. Martin playfully teased, indulging them on his old legend to shatter the resolve of those peoples who destroyed his kingdom and scattered his children. Holy spells. Now. A sergeant ordered a battle mage. They knew that with such a powerful adversary would overwhelm them the longer the likes of Martin can roam freely to cast his spells with impunity. Lyches, those of Born of Unlife and otherworldly demons were most especially vulnerable to the radiant effects of the holy spells that many devoted clerics and several of battle mages have learned to cast when confronting with such monstrosities. The battle mages whispered to themselves a silent prayer to their patron gods as they rushed towards the barricades, preparing their exorcisms to cast off the lich and his undead minions back from whence they came. Watch out! Kimura cried as she used her wooden shield to protect Martin from the holy spells cast by Imperials that would have otherwise incapacitate him gravely. Curse you Imperials for trying to smite me! Martin roared. Get that fucking barricade open! The Fjord IFV commander blindly yelled as his vehicle was still being continuously harassed by the Imperial skirmishers. Gah! I cannot concentrate with these mages trying to banish me. The Lich closed his fist. Martin stepped away from the enchanted barricade and hovered over the Imperial mages nightmarishly. His worn-out robes and skeletal form a terrifying sight to behold to them. It was as if they evoked the wrath of an ancient entity that was never meant to be wronged. Your bones will be the foundation of a monument to your defeat. Martin forwarded his dreadful finger tauntingly at the Imperials. We are not afraid of you Lich King. Your reign of terror will end here. A cleric answered back. You will die in terror then, and your bodies to be thralls to my will. Allow me to show you. He theatrically laughed. His reputation as a tyrant back in his days were more or less exaggerated or mere fabrications from his rivals. He had an honor code when it comes to raising the dead to his services such as only using the bodies of those who had consented upon their death to give their corporeal remains to him to act as his on-demand labor force to be buried in specially made tombs where their bodies are to be kept in sanitated conditions to prevent disease when he or his successors were to call on them for construction projects or to march for war. He normally doesn't use the bodies of his former enemies unless faced with no other choice as he finds commanding large swathes of skeletal minions to be taxing on his necromantic capacities, but still, the reputation of the Lich King using the bodies of those who perished to slay him to be bounded to his will and be set loose to attack his enemies was a decent albeit double-sided deterrent against territorial rivals. Conjuring his magics, the lich formed a dreadful amethyst ball around his two hands, 
Those of his enemies surrounding him suddenly felt their bodies run cold as pores from their skin began to leak out. First their sweat, then the water in their veins before suddenly the very veins themselves burst forth from their skins to be magnetically siphoned to Martin's energy sphere. It was an exotic spell that the Lich had learned and adapted from a hydromancer from the eastern suzerainties, called Abbas Jaffaf Swilting. Originally intentioned to siphon water from desert fauna, the Lich during his research in his quest to grant magical powers to his children at will found a much more macabre purpose for the spell. Using his controversial sang romancy that he pioneered when he still had mortal form, he can hurriedly ebb out bodily fluids, vitals and even liquid mana onto a ball that he can use as capacitor for more devastating feats of arcane magics or just straight up make entire groups of people collapse dead whatever his priorities were at the time. The Imperials could not physically resist spells, necrotic effects on their bodies, not being able to move a muscle more as their life forces evaporated from their bodies famishing their forms to malnourished automatons in a parody of both their once healthy selves and the skeletons under Martin's beck and call. When all of his attackers collapsed before him, Martin gave another theatrically gleeful laugh as he used the siphon on the Wilting's energy sphere to power through the arcane enchantments of the barriers, instantaneously causing them break, and also creating a vile explosion of blood, body fluids and scum water to burst forth. The path is clear, Martin triumphantly announced. We achieved breakthrough. Mendoza nodded. Yellow cab eight go push forward fifty meters up and then hold yourself back until your optics are fixed. Roger that. Carefully now. A. Eh? Thanks Lich. I never thought I would actually thank a goddamn mummy. The Fjord IFV commander gave his gratitude. Oh and... Don't ask about the stuff that's all around your vehicle when you clean it later by the way, Mendoza added. Why? The IFV commander asked. Aye, it is best. You never know, Mendoza asserted. The invasion's advance continued onwards, capitalizing with all expense on the second breakthrough as the last vestiges of the second line of defenses of Marnia's bluff crumbled from the combined might of not only Martin's necromancer powers but also the youth's naval bombardment and carrier-based airstrikes. Slowly trickling down or rather upwards, the vanguard of the Western Army group fully crossed the isthmus and now into more stable and open countryside where their speed can be fully utilized. Point Normandy has been secured spearhead, Mendoza reported. Understood, time to unleash our heavy assets now. ETA 10 minutes. Holyfield acknowledged, with the cliffs secured he can now commit the creme de la creme of his forces his armored tanks and mechanized born troops into the battle just as deep battle doctrine teaches him to exploit the breakthrough his men have produced with heavy thrusts from his more tactically valuable assets which are his mechanized troops, his BWPs and his cataphract tanks in addition to some much needed supply drops for his now weary troops who had expended tooth, nail, arms and legs to cross the Marnia's isthmus, push up and secure the salt mine. Let's get our cavalry going Mendoza and ushered the soldiers forward, they are starting to get desperate. Proceed with caution, Holyfield advised. In his experience the those who straggled behind and those cornered were the ones who are the most dangerous of adversaries. Yuak high, Kimra cheered. The thrill of battle to see her enemies run before her exhilarated primal instincts deep beneath her kind psychological beings. Dawson were infamous for their ability to go frenzied berserk when in battle, amplifying their physical prowess tenfold compared to humans, dwarves, and even elves. It was no wonder the Imperials feared her people the Dawson as their stubborn resistances and raids against the northern territories of the Empire brought excessive amounts of trouble to the Imperial Legion stationed there. Yet a huge drawback to her manic stat was the withdrawal period that occurs after their murderous trances. Their stamina will be burned out, muscles bones ache, and in some of the worst possible cases, death. It was a high risk but very high reward action for a beastman to allow themselves to descend into temporary savagery yet the warrior culture of the Dawson tribes exemplifies such warriors who can slay the most enemies to prove their strengths. The centaur war maiden no different. 
She brandished her axe and began to buck wildly like a sporadic mass of furred muscle as she charged headlong to the retreating Imperial soldiers, moving just as fast and striding just as agilely as she alongside her fellow centaurs and the mechanized Ufif vehicles led the vanguard into one great stampede. Every kill, every savage blow that eviscerates whatever hapless soul came across her further demoralized the Imperial soldiers. The sea salt mine and its concentration ponds was requisitioned by the Empire as a base of their operations and its strategic advantage overseeing the Imperial side of the Isthmus was the last obstacle that needed to be taken if the Isthmus crossing was to succeed. The retreating defenders stumbled over each other as they attempted to flee whilst the Imperial generals attempted to salvage the route and rally the Alliance soldiers back into the battle either through stubborn resolve or desperate fear of what the consequences were if the Dragon War were to be breached, yet they can all agree that the situation has grown dire. In their hubristic confidence, they thought they could repeat the glorious and legendary victory and success of the legendary Founder King called Dell against the demons during the first demonic invasion. Yet as the present time has harshly revealed that it was very clear that their adversary never intended to repeat their mistakes for the second time now that they had shown to see that they do learn from their mistakes, capable of more advanced thought than just marching forward and heel stomping whatever poor soul dared to stand against them. For all of their meticulous plans from ambushes, magically enhanced defensive structures and their past experience fighting overwhelmingly large hordes of enemies from their past history was simply not enough to stem the otherworldly tide. Worst still was that their ancient adversaries had found themselves new allies in the form of the other barbarians that they had fought against years after all bones time from the savage Dawson Beastmen, the savage Greenskins and the undeathly Lich King of Ancient Senhill. Is if they had turned everyone that ever held a grudge against the Empire against them all at once. It was truly a deluge of apocalyptic magnitudes the likes of scribes, historians and bards write tragedies on their annals, call the cavalry, one imperial bannerman roared desperately, bring out the fire cart, a dwarf shouted, a horn blared over the salted bonds of the salt miners the thunder of hooves of the imperial mounted knights, armed with their imposing lances charged forth. The speed of their hooves and superior height made them ideal for harrying the still trickling down infantry still attempting to climb up from the chalk cliffs rampway. Meanwhile behind them, several dwarven engineers pulled over a handcart that contained a mobile wooden launch pad on the top containing 100 cylindrical holes outfitted each with Usegoth tipped bolts. Kill the demons for the glory of the Empire and the gods, cried a valiant knight as he charged his barded steed riding alongside hundreds of his brothers towards the landfalling invaders. A barrage of Uzegoth bolts fired from the fire cart as they arched over the incoming heavy cavalry charge towards the still remotely unbalanced Ufif. Missile artillery. Get down, get down. A Ufif grunt shouted. The rocket-aided crossbow bolts peppered the invaders, severely maiming those injured and heavily pinning down those who managed to get to cover quickly. A perfect opportunity for the heavy cavalry to turn the tide of this battle around as he and his fellow knights charged, lances aimed forward towards an enervated Lich King Martain and Captain Mendoza. But just as their lances were about to taste the blood of the invaders, Gumra with her centaur brothers and sisters hurled themselves between their new allies. By our brave hearts you will move no further, Kimura roared, Yuakhai. She brandished her axe forward swinging it wildly in a counter charge. Years of fighting amongst each other and the advantage that they are one in spirit and body with their forms made centaurs the ideal interceptors against enemy cavalry, able to nimbly maneuver themselves against other similar mounted units and to come out of themselves on top in many cases of fights through their blood-stained histories combating against each other. Their lack of cavalry tactics and mishmash variety or disregard altogether of armor and more idyllic weapons suited for mounted units however be being a Yoshe Dainiadi's only drawback. The centaurs savagely hacked, slashed and even bucked the Slaegean cavalry that by the time the Afif reacted to the Empire's last ditch attempt to stop their advance, there was very little left the attack drones and the infantry had left to handle as the centaur-led hail of steel fell the mighty juggernauts of Imperial might. 
their resplendent armors and sacred banners buried beneath the slurried salt bonds, staining the white powder red with their blood as they were trampled by the thunder of the centaur's hooves. The dwarven artillery pieces, chopped to driftwood as their artisanal frames were casted off to the crashing ocean currents below by the jeers of blood-sated centaur warriors, who danced their cloven hooves with the weapon crew's corpses triumphantly as they slew them down. How can we fight an enemy like this? A battle mage wailed. Retreat. The gods have abandoned us. An imperial footman despaired. Abandoning their weapons, their stations and camp the Slay Aegeans rooted themselves away from Marnia's bluff. It has finally been done. The enemy were in full retreat and the crossing had succeeded as the Federation's titanic cataphract tanks rolled out of their carriers into the battlefield carrying the seven-ringed flower of the Federation on its back thus solidifying this auspicious conquest. We did it boys, Mendoza congratulated, the enemy is in full retreat and the crossing has been secured. Who are Semper Fidelis bitches, a Ufif Marine hollered, indeed we all have. Holyfield smiled as he oversaw the advance at the command deck of the Aurora. I got reports from Colonel Polonsky that our counterparts with the East have just broke through themselves. Vercourt and Little Hill should not last much longer once we encircle them, the Major informed. The Dragon Wall from the perspective of the Empire was a complete and utter failure to the highest degrees. The invaders broke through the supposedly impregnable defences with ease and such speeds that some of the rooted men lament to themselves to wake up as they believe that this tragedy, this massacre, this embarrassment was not real but a premonition of their dreams manifested from their fears of fighting the other worlders, but their pleas fell into the deaf earth as they were encircled and cut down by the vengeance-filled barbarians that they had wronged. All they can pray now is that the Chosen One can rally the rest of the decimated empire to fight back against the demonic tide before all of Zanagra drowned in the darkness of their overwhelming might. Inversely saying for the native auxiliaries of those said barbarians fighting on the side of the Earthworlders, they all collectively could not believe it. They had actually succeeded where each of them failed. Cause the much avaricious empire in all of its expansive arrogance to fall into retreat, the image of imperial invincibility, obliterating before their very eyes, for the Terriani Laniyu and even the Lich King Martain, although their first taste of vengeance was indeed cathartic for the heinous crimes, they had done to their homelands of their once thought distinguished liege. They also foresaw what ripple effects this has brought before them as they participated in this battle against them. News of the devastating aftermath of this battle will spread across all over of Zanagrad and all the Gleesia's eyes will fall upon them. Despite taking a majority of the negligible casualties during the assault, the Tyriani would not have defeated the Empire at all if it were not for their new weapons. These guns. These strange crossbows held unimaginable power that made centuries of imperial chivalry and military doctrine obsolete, what they now become the vanguard for as stated by their prince, a new age for Gleesia and as day passed, there is no longer turning back to the old ways, all must move forward to the uncertain future that Prince Clovich brought forth for Gleesia. For the Lich Martain, the Centaur Kimra and the Goblin Shaman Harden, this victory was perhaps the greatest blow to imperial arrogance that they could have ever inflicted upon their oppressors throughout their tumultuous history against them. They danced, sang and even eloped themselves with their otherworldly allies, as if sent by their gods or their ancestral spirits to aid them in freeing them from the yoke of the Empire's iron fist against their peoples. They just didn't imagine that the form amalgamated by this newfound vengeance brought them together with strange and even stranger of friends and discoveries. So, what now Major? Full steam ahead to the capital? A Marine Corps captain asked. Belay that order. We will overextend too much and our men are tired and worn out from the fighting. Once East Army Group secured New Argonia on schedule we shall trap any retreating Imperials falling back north from our position then link up with them. I want to save our best assets for the final push into Herring Point. Holyfield answered. Understood sir. The rest of 7th Marine and 333rd Assault are awaiting your call as always. The Marine Captain said. M. Excuse me, 
a new voice emerged from the radio channel. Holyfield recognized that voice. Prince Clovich, what's your status report? Holyfield asked. My cousin is with me right now and we had just received the news of your victory against the Empire is it not? The prince asked. Of course, we just gotten through the isthmus on schedule. It was a tough fight but we managed, Holyfield answered. And my men, my new Lanier. How were they? Clovit shifted the subject to his new army. They fought bravely, but they took some casualties. The Mosiad attaches told me they are. Quiet to say the least. Which is surprising, since nearly everyone else is well. Happy they won, the Major answered. I believe you need to meet them. It looks like they could use your leadership right now, he suggested. Indeed, that is most wise. I will ride for Mania's bluff do you haste with my cousin too, he must also see this. Clovich nodded. Good, because you will have to be with your men from this point onwards until we reach the capital. You have to be the one to be marching into the city when he tear down the walls. He reminded him of their legitimacy accumulating efforts for the prince to gain the emperorship of the entirety of the Slaagian nation. I, will. Clovich huffed, with a steady determination growing in his heart. There was no going back for him and his people at this point. It was all in or he loses everything. I will meet you there in New Argonia once both you and Polonsky's men linked up. He tells him. Prince, the vanguard of the amelioration will march on an iron horse through Herring Point and lead the new age he aspired to see. Sainagrad become or die fighting for what he believed is right as he swore himself on the day. He began his patronage with the other worlders. I have some personal business with my cousin and his interesting friends to deal with. Clovich gave his farewells as he ended the radio call. Dropping the radio from Thomas Seitz's hands the prince approached his cousin Duke the Bald and his hastily transported court as they stood before the Duchy of Tefreit, specifically at the site of what was once the legendary fortress of Brian Bark or Little Hill. It took a long hard moment, suspended in disbelief trying to dispel themselves in case this was all an elaborate illusion but it was not, it was real in every sense of the word that was. Even for Clovich, the scene before them was utterly devastating. Yet he tried to keep his composure in front of his cousin and his courtiers as they silently observed the grim scene before them. The entire Camber Valley forest is now filled with stacks upon stacks of the corpses of fifteen imperial legions and the duchy's local militia and knightly retinues, some of the finest of armies no less in all of Sainigrad lay dead before the gauging coughs of the bald and his courtiers thanks in no part to the sickening ashes that the unceremonious cremation the Afif's engineering court undignifiedly sent them all of on. However, the most shocking facts are that the mighty fortress of Little Hill is now nothing than a pile of powdered rubble before their feet. The Suvelians, violence averse were at a loss of words as they remained catatonic to the tragic fate that befell upon the Empire's forces. They could only eat their own words doubting Clovich and his otherworldly patrons. Do you continue to doubt me and the Federation now dear cousin of mine? You see before you what we can do? What our fate is if the Empire continues to pursue this war and have you and your people be sent to the slaughterhouse for this pointless war Emperor Alden provoked on me. Yes yes cousin. And Sir Sight. I am deeply sorry for doubting ever doubting you too. The Empire shall be ruined if they do continue and if you say is true, then you are perhaps the only one who can stop this from happening to all of Zanigrad. Maybe even the whole of Gleesia. Do not forget they had wronged me too with Jodent and the elven Sephiliad. He acknowledged be but, what would happen to Suvil? Thibaut asked, his voice shaking in dread as his courtiers cowered behind him. Don't fret Duke Thibault, Thomas announced. Your people will be safe under our protection, as long as you allow free trade and military access to come in and out of your cities. In return we can grant you access to our trade networks which will make you and your people prosper tenfold to whatever you had earned when you were with the Slaagian Empire. He spoke in his honeyed voice as he reassured the Duke of the Federation's pragmatic proposition into securing his fealty. You will also have to swear fealty to me and my new empire too since I will be your new leech from this point forward cousin. All you really have to do is to just make sure Suvil is still 
Well, Suvil and it will be like nothing ever happened. Klovich added. I accept. The Balt nodded. You have not only shown not only overwhelming power but you have proven yourself to be able to look out for the interests of those whom you wish to welcome hospitably into your mighty wings. The fealty of Suvil is yours. The Balt bowed as he handed over his scepter to his cousin. Thank you, cousin. I promise you will not regret your choice. Klovich smiled as he ushered the bout upwards from his knelt stance as he embraced his cousin for having faith in him and his new vision of a better and brighter Zanigrad. Please forgive my roughness all of you. I needed to act quickly and use Suvelis to say without malice. Well you tend to take life at your own pace. You all lack well. Urgency sometimes all of you. Especially you cousin. Klovich casually chided to the Suveli noblemen and women, ignoring the previous periods of him hardlining his approach to them earlier. Life is too short to rush for us you know, but then again, aren't we all fated to die one day? Why bother with so many trivial squabbles when you can live life bringing happiness to as many as you can? Thibaut lectured ecstatically. Let's have something to eat, shall we cousin? I have so many things to tell you about my time on earth that you would all think I am lying. Klovich laughed followed by the rest of the newly secured allies the Federation managed to reel into their sphere of influence, with Suveli now firmly secured by proxy under the Federation's watchful eye. They have seaborne starting point that the Ufif can expand further from thanks to their extensive and lucrative trade connections. With Suveli money and Tiriani soldiers, the pacification campaign is slowly gaining the critical momentum they needed to bring down the rest of the natives of Gleesia in concert to the Federations, and the party's designs. Dash. The great and most glorious Black Tree Pact Elven Expeditionary Army marched through the human lands with eager ballast. Among their numbers were the finest troops the brave men and women of the arising power of the Black Tree Pact Confederation of Eastern Alphil Noro had to offer 70,000 strong, dread steeds, sisters of the blades, the unseen, Acropolis wardens, altars of Telworth known as Glen by the humans, and black thorn riders supplemented by an assortment of monsters collected from either their native homelands or from parts unknown such as over 200 winged Erinias and a abyssal Caribides that were captured, sold nor bred from the Tavai Islands, 100 of the nimblest of Katakan were bats from the southern lands of Zanigrad. 50 of the most imposing rock elementers of the Dao subspecies from Seihun, and lastly their crown jewel, a black dragon of the highest of esteemed of draconic bloodlines of proud Alphilnora of whom this spawn was the personal steed of one Lord Vokhul Dusk Blaze. They were the first foreign forces in Sainagrad to heed the call of the Slaeijan Empire's need of aid outside of the recently migratory dwarves. For a native of the continent, such an army of exotic warriors were merely the imaginative products of bardic lyricism as Black Tree Pact warriors were heavily influenced by the armors and weaponry of conquered peoples the expansionist offshoot of the elves of Alphil Nora demonstrated compared to their more traditional Earth Island Entente counterparts that they are so ever at odds within all aspects typical of an Iron Curtain divide on their once enchanted continent. Lord Vokhul's orders as given by his superiors were to explain Explicitly display such splendor of the Black Tree Pact's armies everywhere he marched. It had been only two weeks however since their arrival in the human's domain however when he had received word that their political rivals, the Eth Island has sent forth, as he marched an expeditionary army of their own led by the only son of the loathsome Eth Island King Aslinador. Prince Valorian, Lord Vokhul knew that he will need to skip all the pageantry and now put his army into practice. Fortunately for him, he managed to convince the Slaeijan legionary commanders to have him be deployed as close as he can get to the front line so he can at the soonest have his army be put to work against the demonic invasion whilst also doing whatever he could within him and his nation's ability to keep his Eth Island counterparts as far away from the front line as long as possible in addition to not arriving fully strengthened or as timely as they had hoped. That way. His own army can have the advantage of first initiative relative to the war effort for himself and the Midnight Camarilla's interests. 
This was in part as most imperial humans out of a sense of previous comradeship and alliances with those incessant traditionalists would rather work closely with them rather than with the Black Tree Pact when given the choice between combining the strength of whoever banners come to the human's aid. He had complete faith in his abilities and the prowess of his long-lived men of an average of 70 years of service in the Black Elven army that they can weather whatever battle these invaders can throw at them. If the Black Elves can play their cards adequately, they could win the favor of the Imperial Emperor to allow them to bend some of his affairs to the Midnight Camarilla's expansionist designs. Interesting. Lord Vokhol scratched his chin as he laid his head back when an Imperial messenger of a disheveled attire hurriedly reported to him of the grave happenings of what had transpired the first few days of invasion. He and his army were originally meant to rendezvous themselves with the transit point of New Argonia before awaiting the Empire's so-called Chosen One before being sent further south to assist in the defense of the Imperial's Dragon Wall. However, news of its multiple breaches has thrown their overall war plan stratagems into jeopardy as the word was immediately dispatched that the Otherworlders are now making headway post-haste deep into the heart of Imperial lands consisting of mere cities townships, irrigation canals, and plains of farmland unlike the rough hinterlands, fortified bastions nor the marshy Marnia's bluff that shielded the empire from her external threats. The message as given by the acting superior of the legionary remnants has given the Black Elves the confronting task of rushing to the defense of New Argonia and aid the evacuation of the retreating Imperial defenders so that Emperor Alden and his circle of commanders can salvage a new defensive line. A perfect opportunity to demonstrate the Black Tree Pact's superiority to the bewildered defenders as so the Camarillas wished to demonstrate to both the Slaegians and their decadent Eth Island kindred. The Black Elven General dismissed the messenger and sent him off his merry way as amiable as a haughty elf could before turning to his advisers once the human disappeared. Those pathetic humans. Three days in and already they are losing control of their footing in this war of theirs. Vokhol disdainfully scoffed, to their defense, all non-elves are weaker in magics and lack our long lives. One of his captains joked as he sipped from his enchanted sweet water from his drinking bladder, all we must do is do as the emperor has told us for now, we must hurry pace to New Argonia at the double. He advised. Lord Vokhol nodded and ushered his men to march forward. After about a quarter of a day's march for the army, Vokhol's expeditionary force could see the hilled borough of New Argonia, the crossroad township of the Empire where each of its four directions meets converged on the horizon. However, the Black Elf soon realized that there is something wrong with the scene, normally. A forwarded party of either the Legion's knights or a mounted retinue of the local duke would receive him by now yet there is none. Alarmed, Vokhol grabbed his telescope as ordered by one of his foxkin slaves to his hands. As he peered through the hilly burg of New Orgonia, to his dismay he saw before him not the imperial dragon of the Slaegian Empire but instead an azure flag fitted with five rings amalgamated together to form a flower. They had arrived too late. The township had been captured. It is seemed we were too slow general. A sister at the blade sighed as she sharpened her vorpal twin swords, sparks flying out of her blades as she attuned them. Judging by the way the town has been besieged, however, it seems they only had recently conquered New Argonia. It is likely whatever demons who happen to be there are currently either drunk with victory or weary of their earlier efforts. I prime opportunity to surprise them by the sudden arrival of our forces, a captain said. We should at least try to find any survivors of the garrison or of the humans before we move in, however, the messenger did say he had reported to several of them before he had reached us, a sorceress added. Your advice is sound. We shall rest for now and wait two days before we commence the assault. Have the sorceresses bring up our canopy of greater invisibility on our camp. Have the dread steeds scout out the train, and bring any of what remains of the Imperial Legions to us. I will personally see to our monsters that they are ready for battle. Vokhol smiled confidently. He stood up from his lofty chair as he walked towards the monster pens where he keeps the more monstrous collection of his army at bay. Please spare me. I promised I won't disobey again. 
N.N. No, cried a ragged fox can slave who was caught recently for disobeying one of the advances of a mentally frustrated Acropolis warden, but she was quickly grabbed from her body, by the jaws of a great serpentine beast before being quickly swallowed whole as her body corroded underneath its amethyst scales. Dracer, soon your belly will grow fat with the blood of our enemies, my precious little black dragon. He smiled sadistically as he ordered his servants to feed more of the flesh and blood of dissident slaves to rouse the appetites of not only his personal black dragon but also the rest of the monsters in their pens. Feast well for now, for soon you will feast more when you are set loose to battle. Show me all of your primal wrath on the day of battle O feral children of Neneth. He perversely cackled, those slaves terrified cries from Dawson, Tavai, Foxkin. The like were vividly recorded however from a singular drone, whose visage was of a simple native dragonfly-like insect of glee easier for the unadulterated sight of one muffin-eating intelligence agent. And I thought I had issues. Agent Gary Dasart cringed as he ate another bite of his husband's blueberry banana muffins. Hearing, seeing those poor slaves die under his powerless view made his blood boil. As a loyal agent to the Bureau of Intelligence, it is people like Lord Vokhol is why he joined the call in the first place both as a date to analyst and as an extractor. It would be very much good for purging the unhealthy amount of stress that is causing his dapper brown hair to grey if he could reach out and give that black elf what it feels like to be afraid. In his very bloodied hands. This information must be relayed to Polonsky's men at once. He can feel in his bones that this campaign has not yet reached its most apocalyptic peak. Chapter 51 a hostile spear in the new frontier. Ever since the Afi forces achieved breakthroughs from the Dragon Wall, the lay of the land shifted considerably. No longer did the otherworldly soldiers sat behind the wilderness of forests or the slows of marshes, but now they sat atop of the Empire's imperial heartlands, from the uneven hills that would reverberate their motorized vehicles upon its rough march to idyllic plains with calm pathways no different like the paved roads back from their celestial homelands. The vast expanse of Gleesia has now lay bared for those intrepid enough to explore through its adventurous depths. The army was now free to do their reconnaissance, maneuver, and resupply with virtual impunity. To most of the soldiers who spent their lives either in cold grey rocks, within the barges of their ships, or stationed around the ho-hum biomes of the youth's colonies, it was as if they opened a book to the awaiting arms of what can only be a pre-industrialized paradise that is Gleesia's natural and beautiful self. Chromatic fields of a palette's worth of many different floor with the occasional flowing creek encountered and frolicking docile wildlife brought the soldiers a brief moment of calm in an otherwise dot race to drive the knife deeper into the Empire's core. There were several traces of leftover volcanic ashes that choke the air and made some cover their orifices in masks of those left from the Estl rock volcano in which the Stla agents serfs who weren't hastily conscripted to the imperial militias they encountered it as much as they could sweep off the ashes away from their essential farming lands. Watering holes that weren't sealed however were corrupted albeit the fishing nets meant to catch freshwater fish and the help of hydromancing mages made improvised filtration systems to purify in their beliefs is Neneth's blood as said by Aliathra. Those sparse men were considered the most fortunate ones of the war, not comprehending the strange carriages that pass by their villages to be the aforementioned demonic invaders. Colonel Polonsky explicitly discouraged the Eastern Army group interaction with the locals by the time being. Operation Haymaker's demanding timings gave no quarter to those who would slow down as encircling and the capturing of key points is what is the most strategically politically effectuate objective at hand and the results speak for itself. The imperial legions that remained in the Duchy of Tefreit had either capitulated under the youth's tide, deserted, or in piecemeals retreating back to the safety of the empire's many cities. Most of those who rooted had to let go of their shields, their armors, and weapons just to lighten their weights as they turned their tails but even then, it was oftentimes not enough. By about day three of the invasion, the Ufif's Eastern Army Group had just captured the strategic town of New Argonia with virtually no fight as the town's inhabitants were, 
as interrogated by the prisoners of war captured to had evacuated further inland and that the meager garrison was ordered to hold the town until the retreating remnants of the dragon wall regrouped with them. Unfortunately for them, the bulk of those forces that they had prayed to their war gods to reunite with safely were hastily intercepted and disposed of by the youth's mobile elements. The general Chow time just as babbled by the troops were of overarching confidence that the war could be over by the month's end. The same enthusiasm albeit in a different tone of that was the native auxiliaries were facing another predicament, specifically the modernly equipped and sophomoric as a formal organization. Prince Klovich is remodeled into the mirror image of his otherworldly patrons, the Terayani Laniya. Despite taking the most casualties of the ongoing invasion of about and being mostly taking whatever orders their attached UFIF officers would say due to the reservations of their new equipment and rather rushed training with them before being quickly sent into the deep end of a war, the Laniya's Rayfli's Mosiod squads began to grow confident. They held their reservations and several concerning doubts of their abilities to challenge the Empire during the introductory phases of Operation Haymaker. For the longest time, they were all under the wings of the Imperial Slaegian Sphere as their puppets but no longer, what was once only the dreams of madmen vainly attempting to defy the rules of political nature instead turned its fate around as the servants soon became the new master. Seeing the imperial armies fall beneath the storm of their marches shattered any fears of the defeat of their crusade against the empire. They managed to take action against several holdouts of imperial armies fortifications with satisfactory results from their other world or superiors with their new weapons. However, what still remains of their previous cultural background as any medieval-aged minded person would be expected was their propensity of agitation and propensity to openly loot whatever they come across. Despite the Yafif equally guilty albeit they do such confiscations behind most people's backs rather than in broad daylight, unlike their more experienced and disciplined Yafif counterparts. An interest group of the Lani Yemoziad's Ufif attaché officers formally requested that Prince Klovich, who had just arrived in New Orgonia to personally inspect his new troops to not only lift their morale but also reaffirm their vows to what they were truly fighting for. My Prince, it is with gladness to say that our military campaign has achieved so much so greatly in such a hastily amount of time, days even, a Tirayani sergeant. A former crossbow yeoman now converted to a ray fleas acclaimed confidently to Prince Klovich as he arrived at the Laniyas camp in New Orgonia. The indomitable legions of the Empire now are nothing but ashes in the winds under the feet of the Federation and our new army thanks to the firearms our godly patron has gifted to us, undeniably so. I am proud of what you, my fellow men have accomplished. Before long all of Zanagrad will know of our strength. Klovich amiably smiled. With these new weapons, no number of beasts, magics or even the elves can stand a chance against us. The Slaegians and the elves always pride themselves as masters of the Gleisi but now they are the ones who will be mastered. A knight raised his new BF-77 battle rifle into the air proudly with such gusto that not only he foregoes his trigger discipline but it was mimicked further with his fellow Rayflees, who also followed suit. Despite Klovich's chagrin seeing the obvious infractions his army was being brazenly doing as he studies of modern military sciences had taught him, he still feels an empathetic affinity for his fellow countrymen. However, by the air they are breathing through him. It seems his army are starting to lose their sense of way as he envisioned him. When it comes to fully replacing the currently decadent imperial throne with his amelioration, for he, the Federation and his Lanier do not march towards Herring Point as despoiling conquerors like the barbarians before, but as fire-branded revolutionaries seeking to dismantle the magistocratic feudalism the Empire had so decadently relied upon to maintain itself at the expense of other folks for a system that will fully rejuvenate the Empire's truest potential as the shining star of the Zanagrad continent. Indeed, it shall happen. Klovich smiled as he stepped his foot forward, his hands on his hips as he prepared to talk them down to realign them back to his true path forward. What is your name yo, I mean? Eh, Sergeant? Prince Klovich addressed the former yeoman who had greeted him earlier, Muenen name? 
The Ravely's sergeant gulped. The prince, a man of noble blood would dare endeavor himself to know the name of a commoner such as himself. A taboo breached so brazenly and right in front of his peers even. Bainon, Sergeant Tristan Benin Millard. He answered in a simple thin accent, lacking refinement typical of the more educated of Gleesian folks but making up for his sincerity. Tell me, Sergeant Binan, why do you fight in the land a year? Obedience because of me? Or is there something more than just oaths you have that you fight for my amelioration? The prince asked him. I fight so that my family will no longer fear hunger rev again. Zanu Logas system has made many of us happy. We no longer have to worry of when can we eat our next loaf of bread nor fear monsters attacks thanks to you and your patrons. Tristan bowed mentioning a recent reform of compensation and benefits that those of his land EU enjoyed during and soon after their service. It is good to hear that you and many more of you are happy of what I have accomplished for you. But even then, it is not enough. Clovich nodded. Do you remember what I had said back in our half square when I declared my amelioration? He asked the soldiers, holding Tristan's shoulder paternally as he spoke. What Tristan said here is what I know. We are fighting for, a future, free from want and fear, gone shall be the days where we fend ourselves every day against the struggles of monsters and those who seek to despoil us of our worldly gains, gone are the days people toil the fields for empty promises and meager reppings, gone will be the days people fight amongst each other just to ensure they can have a future. The Ryani amelioration will seek to break down the old and bring forth a new breath of life to our world slowly marching together towards a new paradigm of one of peace, unity and prosperity. He reaffirmed his ideals to his soldiers. The Lanier soldiers from the former yeoman to the knights veered closer to hear Clovich's every word, enraptured not by his sudden eloquence but his attested sanguinity, a vision to see his dreams of a newer and better Gleesia. We all fight for a future right? All I humbly ask of you, beneath your proud fanfare, your passionate enthusiasm and your beyond your own selfish hopes. Will you all fight to see that our new world can become the new truth? One rising above the ashes of the old empire, not as conquerors, but as builders to a new apotheosis that all men, Dawson, Elf, Dwarf, and what not can aspire to be. Clovich challenged his soldiers. You have my sword. A knight loyally bowed for a new future. Sergeant Binan followed suit. The Empire has lost its mandate, yours shall replace it. Another soldier added, the Slae agents sit in their opulent towers, bringing wars, misery, and poverty to those who see lesser than them. They promised peace and prosperity for Tyrian. No, just peace and prosperity for them. Clovich voice extended higher as passion ran out of his throat. What did Tyrian get in return from their tributes and bleeding for the Empire from monsters, famine? and barbarians for centuries for, nothing but betrayal, they selfishly hoard all the power and wealth of those they are meant to shepherd whilst quashing all of those who try to usurp them, but with the power of the federation at our backs, we will triumph, we are the new approaching light amongst the sea of darkness and today we shall rise above the horizon and bring Enigrad to a new brighter day. The prince raised his fist. For the amelioration of a new Zanigrad, Clovich shouted, for Zamelioration. The Lanier soldiers cheered. A standing ovation for the prince concluded his visitation as Prince Clovich gave his deepest gratitude to all of his men who reciprocated in kind. Before long, it was now back to work for the Tyriani auxiliary soldiers helping haul in the new equipment and supplies being shipped into New Orgonia thanks in part to the provisional airfield outside of the trading towns nearby planes that are rejuvenating the supple train of the combined amelioration and youth advance. New Orgonia has captured a day earlier thanks to the help of the Lanier First Dreyfleas Battalion and Samantha's Strider Group Squad who captured the town swiftly and establishing the linkage between the Eastern and Western Army groups and Colonel Polonsky and Major Holyfield wasted no time shipping in the rest of the invasion forces troops onto the field, however, there was still stiff resistance coming in from reserved forces of the Empire's armies being rallied by the Black Tree Pact Elves, 
a one Lord Vokhal who leads a host of everything that made the Black Elves armies so terrifying to behold that some were shrouded in myths such as the Sisters of the Blade being invincible, Acropolis Wardens being immortal and Dreadsteeds being tireless in their gallops. Fortunately, the scouts were able to spot them before the Elves could enact their concealment spells to hide their advance. It was agreed that before any advance to Herring Point can be made, these black elves must be dealt with in due haste. What goes on with the battle everyone? Clovich bade his greetings as he entered the command tent of the UV forces in New Orgonia. He can see from the people who surrounded observantly a map of the area around the crossroad city being the holographic projections of Colonel Polonsky and Major Holyfield and in the flesh were the defected elven princess Aliathra the shareholder chosen one Captain Samantha Rose, and Bureau of Intelligence Agent Gary Desardt. We were just about to begin Prince Clovich. We were waiting for you to arrive. Colonel Polonsky nodded. I hope you rest well during your trip getting here Vorter Altris because we have a lot of work to do. Seize Salords. Agent Desardt greeted with an abrasive seethe from his teeth. You said you made a horrifying discovery agent the Sardt. Samantha asked. Ooh, take a look at these photos I managed to take with my drones Prince Clovich. I caught them on approach to New Orgonia last night. The Sardt put on display at the holographic table for the prince, several reconnaissance photos that he took from his last scouting shift only hours ago. So, these are the uncountable armies of the Black Tree Pact. Impressive. I only heard stories about their conquests but never seen one with my own eyes, the prince commented, recognizing the midnight Camarilla's tree-shaped circlet insignia. He was rather impressed by the vivid transcripts he now examined before him of the Black Elves' impressive armies that could put the Empire's legions to be made humbled before. He noticed amongst the Black Elven hosts that the army consisted of intimidatingly armored warriors, frightening monsters and powerful arcane sorceries by their backs all backed up by a heavily exploited and oppressed Dithang or slave class composing of non-elves rounded up from the Black Tree's many conquests around the known world. He knew based on the aversions and quirks he learned from Earth that the Federation would very much see those elves in a self-evident negative light. Dasat's corroboration confirmed his assumptions. I managed to count at least 70,000 of them before their armies had to cloak off in some sort of invisibility spell. Sphere thing. Soldiers, scantily clad Amazons, and fucking monsters straight from my nightmares. Sat revulsed. My drones captured a horror movie when I scouted them out. They are marching to New Orgonia right now but if we can play our guards right with our artillery and guns we should be able to fight them. But if their elven magic should push us back then there is a serious possibility we may be forced to evacuate. Nonetheless, we will have to make at the very least cause those elves to take back town dearly with as much of their lives as possible, the Sut suggested. The intelligence agent held a cautious amount of optimism in his breath, as upon his observations on the battlefield is that New Argonia is known Ankarum as the town had no defensive walls outside of the central hilltops wooden battlements followed by the crossroad towns having a significantly smaller scale in terms of width compared to the dwarven hold he spent about a week defending from the insurgent natives of the Astlerock Mountains before they blew up. The second reservation he had of the battle was the fact that the elves outnumbered them in terms 10 to 1 in potential magical output versus the Federation's Mystic Three which were the nicknames of Samantha, Aliathra, and Iris as humoured around by the common grunts throughout the barracks about them. We are not retreating agent the Sardot. Holyfield cracked his fists. A thunderous thump rumbled through the table from his end of the call. This town is needed for our supplies. I will be damned if my men run on fumes once they roll into Herring Point. We managed to prepare at least two days worth of preparation around the town, but I have to support Agent the Sut on the matter. The terrain isn't suited for such a large scale and protracted defense. There's barely anywhere we can choke them out and the attackers have a lot of room to maneuver their widespread all across the area we only have at best about 6,000 men to defend the place when the Dark Elves come marching in, Polonsky raised, and another forward element of 3,000 of my own coming to link up with you, Holyfield added. 
those grunts would be finishing their encirclements of the rest of the imperial stragglers from my side of the table. ETA four hours from now, those poor slaves. Samantha empathetically saw the drained hope in the eyes of those slaves who were being abused to the fullest extent by the black elves from Desart's photographs. We have to rescue them. I may not like asking the Aparo Corpos for this but it looks like we can afford to have them flank from the back of the army from their camp so that we can encircle the Black Elves and prevent them from retreating back further inland. Or so I proposed madam, the such proposed. I will make the call if the Don's men are up for it. Holyfield waved his approval, but still, the battlefield is our 9,000 against their 70,000, Polonsky gulped. And that's not adding the fact that the Gleesian's magics are the only things seriously hampering our advance forward. If the Empire's battle mages can call in devastating indirect fire from out of nowhere behind our positions that what do you think the elves are capable of? We must not underestimate them, the colonel argued. What about air support? Dasad asked. Outside of a squadron of Kaz and spotted drones in reserve. The rest of the Tenacity's squadron according to Admiral Mers are being deployed to other areas to finish off the stragglers. But I will see if I can get any more of them to pull out for New Agonia's sake, Polonsky answered. We will have to rely on naval artillery and our own ground forces for the first half of the battle. About the same case for me, but I believe the MDNC's artillery battery and 20th engineering should be enough to take care of our elven problem until the Aurora arrives. Holyfield added, we have to delay as much as we can the Black Elven advance before rallying for a counterattack. What kind of a fight we are dealing with these elves Aliathra do you have anything to say about them? Prince Clovich turned to their elven ally. I had spoken to the rest of this council about the Dark Elves but I will repeat my lecture for you Prince Clovich. I may not be the most knowledgeable but I do know a sparse amount of facts about my dot fallen of kin. Aliathra took a deep breath. As she readied her explanation, the Black Tree Pact were elves who had seceded from the Elven Kingdom centuries ago. They had always tried again and again to upstart my family and the Eth Island by having better armies, more lands, more gold. Be superior in every way from us, beneath all of their actions, is hatred, envy, and fear of being left powerless that is why, as my mother have said. They fight like starving wolves for every scrap they can take. Give them a quarter and they shall take from you a third. Greed and envy drives and feeds my fallen of kin. I know that. But what can I expect from their armies though? Clovich asked. Of my memory of the Midnight Camarilla or at least what my brother Prince Valorian told me during his studies. The Black Elves worship the very display power and showmanship to satisfy their magnanimous egos. They would likely put their best people forward when it comes to offering aid to the Slay agents. They have a history of venturing out around Gleesia as famed explorers, treasure hunters, and poachers from the northern hinterlands of the Dawson to the jungles of Saihan. It is best to expect them to bring a diverse amount of knowledge of what they know of the entire world if it so improves the murderous prowess of their armies. Aliathra answered. Clovich nodded and urged the elf to go on as he listened intently. For their armies, of what I can remember. Aliathra paused as she recollected her memories. The Acropolis Wardens were modelled after the Ujaja on gate guards with their heavy armour and cleaving clay ives which may the former troublesome for your soldiers for I do not know if they can pierce through the thick armour they wear into battle. Their dread steeds were the product of an extensive breeding project by several equestrians of minded black elves who made a steed that never tires. Another terrifying aspect that gives the dread steeds their dread aspect is that the knights riding upon them douse themselves with a powerful miasma that causes those who challenge them to experience their deepest fears, causing the enemy to quickly lose any will to fight. And if you take a closer look at that hooded lady without much armor, she is a sister of the Blade who is a sect of warrior nuns who have a more violent interpretation of Wydal the God of Conquest. Those nuns, more of maniacal assassins have the ability to become untouchable or that's how the rumors go. For their sorcery magics, 
they tend to focus on spells that debilitate the ability of their enemies to fight back and spells that allows their troops to engage their soldiers into combat quicker or with an advantage. Aliathra divulged her limited knowledge pointing and then explaining all that she could to the congregation of the contents of the Sut's photos. I am sorry but what did you say about these sisters? Untouchable? Clovich leaned over to question. The nuns both train and magically infuse their bodies with an enchantment spell that allows them to split their bodies apart on a molecular level to avoid most attacks by them. This allows the sisters to focus fully on slaying their prey's whole foregoing any kind of defense. Aliathro explained as best as she could. End of block 6